hearing of the Senate Environment and Communications References Committee inquiry into media diversity in Australia. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to their elders past and present. On behalf of the committee, I welcome everybody here today. Today, the committee will be conducting its hearing in person and via video conference. For the benefit of all participants, I am the chair, Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, and I'm joined in the room by Senator Carr. We are also joined by Senator Fawcett, who will be via video conference. Uh, Senator Rennick and uh, Senator Green, McMahon and Faruqi will also join throughout the day. Welcome to you all. Thank you in advance for your patience with any technical issues that we might encounter along the way, seeing as we were doing this um, across platforms. This is a public hearing and a transcript of the proceedings is being made. The hearings will also be <coughs> broadcast via the Australian Parliament House website. Before the committee starts taking evidence, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence being given to a committee. And any such action may be treated by the Senate as contempt. It is also contempt to give false or misleading <coughs> evidence to a committee. The committee generally prefers evidence to be given in public, but under the Senate's resolutions, witnesses have the right to request to be heard in a private session. If a witness objects to answering a question, that the witness should state the ground upon which the objection is taken and the committee will determine whether it insists on an answer, having regard to the ground on which it is claimed. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera. Such a request, of course, may be made at any other time. I remind people in the hearing room to ensure their mobile phones are switched to silent. Those participating via video conference and teleconference are reminded to please state their name each time before they uh, speak to assist Hansard and also to mute your devices when you do not have the call. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all those who have made submissions and, have, uh, and are participating in the hearing today. I now welcome the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull AC, the 29th Prime Minister of Australia, appearing via video conference. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, Mr Turnbull, could I please get you to state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? Well, my full name is Malcolm Bly Turnbull and I'm appearing in my capacity as an Australian citizen uh, speaking about the media and the subjects of your inquiry. Wonderful. Uh, now, I invite you to give us a, a short opening statement uh, and then we're going to go to some questions. Well, thank you very much, Senator. And I just want to say I'm uh, delighted to be appearing before the committee and I want to thank you for the initiative you've shown in holding this inquiry. Look, I've been uh, involved one way or another with the media for most of my life. I was in the uh, mid-70s, I was a young political correspondent in the New South Wales Parliamentary Press Gallery. And I worked as a journalist here and in the UK. Uh, I've also, of course, been involved on the business side of the media industry as an executive with Kerry Packer, as, as a lawyer with him. I'd also been involved in a lot of very big media transactions over the years. And of course, if you're in politics, you're involved with the media, as you all know, uh, in, inherently. So I've seen over my life, I've seen a lot of changes. Now, <clears throat> the, you've had some evidence about the changes to the media because of the rise of the internet, because of social media, because of what that's done to the advertising base of traditional media outlets, particularly newspapers. So I'm very happy to discuss that, but I don't want to delay that in these opening remarks. What I want to speak to is the way in which one media organisation in Australia, the News Corp, that belonging to Rupert Murdoch and his family, has profoundly changed in the way it works on our democracy. You see, media outlets, you know, from, from time immemorial, really, always sought to achieve a broad audience. You know, when the Sydney Morning Herald was founded in around 1840, it had on its front page the lines from Alexander Pope, in moderation placing all my glory while Tories call me Whig and Whigs are Tory. Now, I don't think the old Fairfaxes were especially broad-minded politically, but they knew that they needed to get the widest 
range of opinion, uh, the widest range of readers, because that maximised their advertising. And so mainstream media, uh, a term that's often thrown around, generally sought to be in the mainstream and narrow casting was pretty limited, particularly in Australia and largely confined uh, to the magazine business, you know, where you could have obviously specialist publications. Now, what's happened is that the internet has enabled uh, people to narrow cast and build uh, very substantial uh, commercial businesses on a relatively narrow part of the audience. Uh, so this first happened in radio, uh, and then it's, of course, you saw it with cable television, subscription television, and now we have got to the point where many people can, can effectively live in a new silo, you know, an echo chamber, where their own views or prejudices more often are simply being recycled and confirmed. And this becomes a sort of an ecosystem. And, you know, there is now a market for crazy. And if you doubt the significance of this, just reflect on the damage that Murdoch's publications and outlets, particularly in the United States, have done to democracy there. I mean, the January the 6th sacking of the US Capitol was one of the most terrible events in American history. I mean, the last time there had been people with arms, you know, armed, I should say, uh, sacking the Capitol was during the War of 1812. So this is an extraordinary thing. It underlined the divisions in America that have been in large part fomented and promoted by right-wing media, narrow casting to a section of the population. And in the lead of that, of course, has been Fox News. So you have now, or you had then, a large percentage, a minority, thankfully, of Americans, but perhaps a majority of Republican voters who believed that Joe Biden had stolen the election. Now that was a lie, as we know, but it was one that was pushed and promoted and promoted by Murdoch's media. Now in Australia, a different context we also see the uh, impact of the way in which News Corp has evolved from being a traditional news organisation or journalistic organisation to one that is essentially a like a political party, but it's a party with only one member. And you see the way in which it is used in an aggressive, partisan way to drive particular agendas, whether it is fomenting antagonism and animosity towards Muslims, something I've written about in my book, whether it is obviously the uh, campaign against effective action on climate change, which has been where Murdoch is the principal amplifier and promoter of that in the English speaking world, at a huge cost to all of us and to the planet, the whole world. Michael Mann, I know, is talking to you later and he's literally written a book on this, so he's, he's much more, he can give you chapter and verse better than I can. And, you know, you see this, you see this kind of pressure that is brought to bear again and again and again. And I'm telling, you know, a room full of politicians, what do you live with? You know how intimidated politicians and governments are by the way in which that political power is wielded. I mean, only last week you will have seen the New South Wales government asked me to chair a committee, a government committee, which I agreed to do as a, you know, as a good citizen, it wasn't uh, something I was, you know, busting my neck to, to do, but I was happy to do it, to advise on net zero emissions. A ferocious campaign was launched by the Murdoch media, particularly the Daily Telegraph, and the government crumbled. They could not take the heat, and they acknowledged that. They both, the Premier and the Minister said Malcolm was the best person for the job, and, so forth, and, and we're all still friends. But the saddest thing about of it all was the way Matt Keane, the minister, a good, good man, you know, very committed to taking action, had to then go to the Daily Telegraph and be quoted in it saying, oh, News Corp had nothing to do with this decision. And this is like somebody, this is like somebody who's taken down to the police station, 
beaten over the head until they finally sign a fake confession, the last line of which says, I confirm that I did so of my own free will. You know, it is, this, this, this is the profound problem. Now, you know, this is, this is what I would like to discuss with you. I hope you, you find it interesting. I think it is, a, a, we face a real threat to our democracy. Uh, I mean, the, you know, for example, look at the way news pressured the government to then pressure Facebook and Google to hand large amounts of money to news and, of course, to other media organisations. I mean, it did look like a shakedown. And does anybody know how much those media organisations were paid? Has this committee found out? I don't think so. The reality is, when the power of the Australian Parliament is used to raise money in taxes or levies or whatever, we know about it. It's in the budget papers. It's trawled through at Senate estimates. But the power of your, of you, that you represent, your parliament, our parliament, has been used to shake down two big, uh, you know, web, you know, um, tech platforms, Google and Facebook, to give money to media companies. The leading uh, protagonist of which was News Corp, and we don't know what they were paid. That's apparently confidential. Perhaps it's it's uh, too shameful to be revealed. But so we're dealing with a very different proposition. I just summarise it like this. I grew up with newspapers that uh, some of them lent more to the left than the, to the right, or more to the right than the left, but they by and large reported the news as it happened. They had uh, opinions that were opinion writers that were, you know, across the spectrum, some leaning more one way than the other. That has all changed. News Corp now is a like a political party, but with just one member or one family of members. And that is an absolute threat to our democracy. And the Americans saw it on the 6th of January. And nobody is holding them to account. Now, Rudyard Kipling once described the power of the press barons as uh, exercising the prerogative of the harlot, power without responsibility. A bit tough on harlots, I would think. But the reality is uh, that power has to be held accountable. You know, it is th this is this is the fundamental problem that we're facing. The most powerful political actor in Australia is not the Liberal Party or the National Party or the Labor Party. It is News Corporation, and it's utterly unaccountable. It's controlled by a fa an American family, and their interests are no longer, if they ever were, coextensive with our own. Uh, thank you, Mr. Turnbull. Well, I might go to uh, Senator Fawcett first, and then um, I know there's some questions from that I have as chair and and uh, other senators. Senator Fawcett, I'm happy for you to lead off, chair. Okay, all right. Um, Mr. Turnbull, you've talked about uh, the immense influence that uh, the Murdoch press has had over uh, issues such as climate change. Uh, you. Uh, have mentioned the example only a week or so ago uh, in relation to uh, uh, the uh, Hunter uh, by-election and the Climate uh, Committee that uh, that you were asked to be on. Um, I thought some of the, the headlines um, on the front page of the Daily Telly were worth um, uh, just referencing. Mal's cold shoulder. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it was a classic hit, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Malcolm's mm. Coal War. Mm. Um, and it goes on. I, I was reading the, uh, the editorial in the Daily uh, uh, Telly on one of those days that uh, was uh, said, not the right job for a NIMBY, mm. in reference to putting uh, uh, mm. you as chair of that New South Wales committee. Um, and this... That was a week of relentless media coverage. Um, is that what you experienced as Prime Minister? Well, y yes, I, I mean, I did. Uh, not, it, you know, it wasn't, wasn't like that every day, but 
uh, I've absolutely experienced bullying and standover tactics from News Corp. And there's, look, there's no, you know, you could fill a library with examples of it. It is a, and everyone on this committee knows what I'm saying is true because you've all lived through it. Mm. And, you know, I mean, David Fawcett, my, uh, you know, old uh, colleague uh, has seen it over the years as well as you have. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it is a way to intimidate politicians and get them to do what they, what news or its, its proprietors want. And I mean, you know, I mean, I look, I don't want to go on about my sort of uh, removal as prime minister, but I think as everyone knows, as the record shows, News Corp were part of that, uh, you know, conspiracy that uh, brought, you know, was started to put the coup in action. I mean, Murdoch solicited Kerry Stokes' support for it, uh, as Kerry told me. Um, and it was, you know, you just got to read the newspapers, right? Mm -hmm. So, and indeed what Murdoch said to me directly. So, so the bottom line is they are very, very substantial players, but they have a, you know, it is, it, it's a very targeted political operation nowadays. And the partisanship of it is extraordinary, you know? And, I mean, I, I get back, we haven't had a January the 6th episode in Australia, thank heavens. But if you think about that, the damage that has done to America, I mean, I ask you this question, what does Vladimir Putin want to do with his operations in America? He wants to divide America and turn Americans against each other, and he wants to undermine faith in their democratic institutions. That's his agenda. That's that's, you know, that's absolutely established in the intelligence community. That's what he's been seeking to do. That is exactly what Murdoch has done. Divided Americans against each other and so undermined their faith in their political institutions that a mob of thousands of people, many of them armed, stormed the Capitol and, you know, thank heavens, uh, it, it didn't result in legislators being killed or hung or lynched, as some of them were proposing to do. So, so you know, we, we, we can't get away from this hmm. reality that this is enormous damage being done to our democracy. Challenge is, what do you do about it? C can I ask you then, do you believe that uh, News Corp here in Australia aims to divide the country? Well, it certainly does, yes. Uh, I mean, again, we're a different country to the United States, and there's you know, a whole lot of reasons for that probably don't have time to do. Mm. But I mean, if you look at the way uh, news, the, you know, the News Corp tabloids, for example, regularly seek to incite uh, animosity towards uh, minorities, particularly Muslims. I mean, it was a huge issue uh, while I was prime minister because everything I was doing was obviously designed to reinforce our success as a multicultural society. And what is so frustrating is that these voices on the populist right, particularly from Murdoch's organisation, are essentially doing the work of the terrorists. I mean, what a, what a terrorist says to a young Muslim is they hate you, they don't want you, you're not one of them. You can never be an Australian, right? That's that's the message. So if so, the counter argument to that, and you know, this is obvious, is to say you are one of us. You are an Australian. We're a multicultural society. We love you and respect you, you know. And and all all faiths, all races, all religions are welcome here and part of our multicultural society. So, you know, I I mean I, I'll, I'll look. Senator, ultimately, you've got to judge people's policies and programs by their consequences. And all I, I, I just am saying that it's self-evident mm. that what Murdoch, the way the Murdoch press has operated both here and in the US has been absolutely adverse to our national interest. And in the US, their agenda appears to be effectively the same, I'm not saying it's coordinated or motivated by it, effectively the same as that of America's uh, most trenchant adversaries. Can I ask you about uh, your engagement with 
uh, News Corp and, and Murdoch uh, when you were Prime Minister. Did you, did you ever receive phone calls or uh, um, uh, requests for meetings to um, discourage you from following through on a particular policy agenda? What was your engagement uh, with News Corp like as Prime Minister? Well, look, I, I mean, I had a, I probably am a slightly different situation to most uh, Australian politicians because I've known Rupert Murdoch and, and his family for a very, very long time. And I first met Rupert, you know, I think it would have been around 1976 or something like that. Uh, the, so I've known him for a very long time, you know, well over 40, 45 years plus. So the, um, Look, basically, they they have an agenda. Uh, what is their agenda, Mr? Their, well, their, their agenda is their agenda is obviously uh, they are uh, opposed to you know opposed to effective action on climate change. So you know that's a hot button for them. Uh, they are uh, you know obviously very supportive of. Uh, the kind of right-wing agenda in the United States. I mean, Trump was to some extent a creation of Rupert Murdoch. I mean, I, I look, I, I, I've hung around, you know, billionaire media proprietors for a long time. I hung around them and known them. I have never seen a politician as deferential to a media proprietor as Trump was to Murdoch, mm. ever, ever, in any country. And so that was a it, and so Murdoch's media in the US became, it had a sort of symbiotic relationship with Trump. I mean, Fox, you know, who was, was, was Fox News like state-owned media in an authoritarian country, always apologising, uh, not holding to account its favoured government, in this case Trump's, or was the media in control of Trump? I mean, I know they fell out at the very end, but it's a very, very peculiar relationship. Uh, now, in Australia, again, it's somewhat different. But you look at the way the Murdoch press do not hold the Morrison government to account in the way they've held previous governments to account. That's self-evident. And the government fe it therefore feels that it is less accountable. You know, that would question that Lee Sales asked Josh the other day, what do you have to do to get sacked as a minister in this government? And Josh struggled to find an answer. I don't think I can understand why. If I could just make one other point, though, about which is I've talked about an ecosystem before, and the Liberals and um, Nationals on this committee will understand very keenly what I'm talking about. Because of the way in which we've got into these information silos or news opinion silos, you get a situation that <clears throat> the members, the branch members, many of the branch members in the LNP and the rusted on supporters rely heavily on Sky News, 2GB if they're in New South Wales, and the Murdoch tabloids for their news, right? And so it becomes like an echo chamber and one is feeding and driving the other. And so, you know, it's a very good um, uh, line, you know, revelation from, the, uh, from Ted O'Brien, you know, a guy who's actually quite progressive was a Republican and he was chairman of the Republican movement at one point, explaining to me why as a Queensland member, he had to support Dutton's coup attempt. And he said, it's as though my branch members are having a meeting with Alan Jones and Peter Credlin every night. And so the influence of this very political media organisation is vastly greater on the coalition than it is on the community at large. And again, you see the same pattern in the United States. It's where right-wing media, particularly Murdoch's, has pulled the Republican Party to the right. I mean, John Boehner, the former speaker, has just written a book which deals with this. So, you know, again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, uh, but it has a very big impact uh, on our democracy. And the challenge is, what do you do about it? When you were Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull, did you... Uh often think about how should I do this, should I do that, should I uh, discipline this member, should I uh, push forward on this policy uh, based on what was going to be printed on the front page of the Daily Telegraph or the Australian the next day? 
Well, of course, you have to take all those things into account. You see, it's easy to say, for example, like you can, people will say, oh, you know, this New South Wales government, Matt Keane, Gladys, were very weak to give in to the bullying from the Telegraph last week. That's, that, that's a fair comment. And I privately, I don't think they'd argue with it. But on the other hand, they're dealing with reality. I mean, is a government weak, quote unquote, because it can, makes concessions to the crossbench in the Senate in order to get legislation passed? Well, of course it's not weak. If it wants to get the legislation passed, it's got to make, it's got to do a deal. We all understand that. The point is that Murdoch's media do not operate here in the way other media organisations do. They are highly political, highly partisan. So again, it's not like a newspaper. Hi, hi, highly that, political, sort of, high, highly political, and highly partisan, yet totally unelected. Correct, and that's the point. That is the point. So, if any of you, um, you know, say something or do something, you can be held to account for it. Mm. And the electorate really find what you're doing objectionable. They can tip you out at the next election. Can I ask uh, you? Murdoch is completely unaccountable. Hmm. Can I ask you before going? I just I know other people have questions. Just last one from me, Mr. Turnbull. Do you have to leave politics before you can speak out on these issues? Well, if, if you want to stay in politics, uh, well, if you certainly want to stay in politics on the coalition side, yes. I mean, you've got to be. I mean, I was of all the coalition leaders in, I'm, well, at least in you know the last 30 odd years, I was by far the least deferential to Murdoch. And I think he always resented that. Uh, but I'm not a very deferential person. Um, I hope I'm courteous, but I'm not very good at sucking up. Uh, but, you know, effectively you now have, as you had with Abbott, a sort of symbiotic relationship between News Corp and the Prime Minister and his office, right? And it is a, almost a coalition government. And, you know, these are very, very, these are really uncomfortable things to confront. But we have to recognise that, that the way news operates is very different to the way Fairfax operates or the ABC operates or The Guardian operates. It is, it is highly partisan, highly targeted, and its operations are politically very instrumental in the sense that they're designed to achieve outcomes, whether that is protecting their mates, getting rid of people they don't like, or whatever, or, you know, sort of stopping action on climate. I mean, I'll just give you one <coughs> example on climate, which is a good one. Uh, I mean, and Michael Mann will give you a lot more, but at the beginning of last year, when the bushfires were at their worst or uh, in Sydney, Matt Keane gave a speech about climate policy in which, which was, it was a conventional speech. It was a good speech, but there was nothing revolutionary or radical or anything like that. But he basically did say, well, you know, the fires demonstrate that the, you know, our climate's getting hotter with global warming and hotter and drier means more fires, right? True. He was, the attack on him in the Telegraph following that was bitter, vicious and personal. And what it was designed to do was not just to punish him, but it sends a message. And this is how it operates like a gang, like a mafia gang. It sends a message. If you step out of line, you'll cop some of this too. That's the, that's the threat. So the people, other politicians look at that and they say, oh gosh, I don't want to go there. So, you know, that's the, that is the reality. So we shouldn't criticise we, we, we can criticise politicians for giving into this, but the fact is they've got to live with it. Mm. It's a force and it, and it needs to be more called out. Thank you. Senator Carr. Thank you, um, Mr. Turnbull. Thank you very much for appearing today. Could I uh, just follow up uh, the question that the uh, Chair's just asked you, and I think a similar question was asked of Kevin Rudd. I is it the case that you only discover your courage on this issue when you actually are removed from office? Uh, well, I, d I don't think that's right, Senator. I mean, uh, Kevin had a very different, as you know, you remember the Labor Party, remember part of his governments. He had a very different relationship with News Corp 
than I did. At you know, different times, he was very close to them. Uh, I don't think that's ever that hasn't ever been the case in my case. Uh, but certainly, being as candid as I have been today um, is something that you would do at your peril if you were a prime minister or a minister or wanting to keep, you know, staying in parliament because the retribution would be uh, very intense. And even if you were prepared to take the heat, your colleagues definitely wouldn't. Yes. So the point that you make is that the, the News Limited operates as a political party, and you've said this with one family of members, yeah. and they're effectively yeah. unaccountable for the use of that power. Uh, can you sure. enlarge uh, on that proposition in terms of any evidence that you can point to? I mean, specifically, maps. You well, the relating I mean, to the Clean Energy Board case from just recent times. Would that be yeah, okay? yes. I mean, I, I, look, to be honest, that, that is, a, by news's standards, that's, that's, that's a minor, you know, that's just an example of how they operate. It's hardly the, the worst thing they've done. I mean, I think the, you know, you all, uh, un unless you're in, a, you've got to the point where you lose sight of the wood for the trees, uh, you all know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, you see it. You see the campaigns. I mean, Kevin Rudd, to his credit, has done a good job, I think, in showing the way in which uh, the news tabloids have flayed Labor state governments for their, you know, failings on the management of the pandemic, but been very gentle in its treatment of Liberal ones. Now, you know, that's that's another example, but it is there's no point look again I, I honestly I, I mean you this is an area that you you are actually living in yes so, in, in this environment I mean I, the problem I, I, is the Mr. problem is are you like are you and other politicians and I'm not directing this particularly to you senator but are politicians or are perhaps Australians generally with this uh, problem that we face with News Corp are we a bit like the frog who gets into the saucepan, the water seems nice and warm for a while, and then by then it's by the time he realises it's boiling, it's too late. I mean, has this crept up yeah. on us? Thank, thank you, Mr. Um The question arises, however, in terms of what we do about this, and uh, there's been some debate, uh, evidence presented to the committee uh, from. Uh, the Institute for Public Affairs, the Australian <coughs> Press Council type of argument that says, look, we've really got a highest uh, level of media diversity than uh, we've ever had. You know, it's, uh, it's, mm. it's suggested to us that um, rather than the argument, which I must say I personally uh, have, have presented, that we've got one of the highest levels of media concentration in the world in this country, um, that this is not really a problem in the eyes of some people, that the IPA, for instance, says that there's much greater levels of diversity now. Uh, there's a report uh, that's just been um, published um, from the Associate Professor of Communications, Bernadette Beveren, and PhD candidates Michael Ward, which has just done a recent study, has found that news has now 59% share in metro and national print media markets measured by readership and that was compared to 25% in 1984. <coughs> uh, that nine, on the other hand, uh, owners of the Fairfax papers, the old Fairfax papers, has a combined readership of some 23%. Uh, would you comment on that? And, and specifically, given the media reforms that you introduced in 2017, could you comment on whether or not the question of media diversity is something that we should have attended to over some time, given your frog analogy. Mm, it's a, look, it's a good question. Um, we, the internet uh, and associated technologies have, have made it cheaper than ever to both make and distribute news content, you know, news and information, whether it's straight news or opinion or mixture of both. So there is, at one level, there are certainly more channels uh, available than ever. However, what has happened is it's, it is, I mean, I, 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 the argument about concentration is absolutely right. Uh, particularly with newspapers, the concentration is at a level, I would think, without precedent in any other 
comparable country, uh, and particularly in Queensland. And again, you know, there are, I've read some of the excellent submissions made to your committee, and there's plenty of statistics there. I won't go over them. But <coughs> excuse me, I do think the biggest problem is the fact that that these that the News Corp outlets in particular are being used in a highly politicised way, a highly partisan way, akin to a political party. So it's, it's, it's not a case any longer of a newspaper that, you know, does a fairly straight job, you know, consistent with its format, uh, but then leans one way or another at election time. It is now full-on propaganda, complete with targeting individuals, vendettas, and you know ideological campaigns like the whole campaign against action on global warming. And of course, you know there are counterparts. You know, on the, the shot, some of the shock jocks, particularly in in Sydney, have been uh, examples of that too. So, you know, again, the thing the thing that we've got to be have our eyes open to is the end of this. Where does this end? Yeah. Well, we saw that on the 6th of January. We saw that in that we've seen this in the way effective action on climate has been frustrated again and again and again in Australia and, frankly, in the United States. Let's hope Joe Biden, you know, has a better run at it. But it is, so these are very real consequences and we can't, and this is why I think, I'm not a big fan of royal commissions, as you know, uh, but I think this is why a thoroughgoing Royal Commission, with all of its powers of investigation, it's very worthwhile. Th thank you, Mr. Simbel. I just because I, I want to come back to this issue, though, in terms of <coughs> previous attempts at media diversity. The 2000, uh, 2017 reforms that you championed uh, mm. actually were about removing the two out of three cross media control rules. Do you think, yep. in retrospect? There's any cause for regret about that, given that there has to been an increase in media concentration since that period? Well, uh, no, I don't regret it, but I mean, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not suggesting that uh, we shouldn't review all these things uh, regularly because things change. But I just say this, the biggest opponent to removing the two out of three rule was in fact Murdoch. And if you go back a few years, uh, Murdoch actually attacked me personally uh, uh, in some tweets, I'm getting some feedback. I don't know whether that's some, yeah, maybe someone not on mute. But anyway, Murdoch attacked me over that because he said this is simply to enable Turnbull's friends at nine to buy Fairfax, to merge with Fairfax, which Murdoch did not want to happen because he wanted Fairfax to wither. And I think that the merger of nine the television company and Fairfax has resulted in a stronger rival to News Corp. So, you know, again, that's the, I mean, if you want, like, you know, this is all of this is sort of his retrospective review, right? I think the single biggest mistake that was made by far was the decision in 87 by the Hawke government, principally at Paul Keating's behest, to allow Murdoch to buy the Herald and Weekly Times, because that gave him the domination of metropolitan daily newspapers, and that was just a massive mistake. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, press you on this <coughs> issue about how we actually improve the level of media diversity? There's uh, <coughs> uh, Others have argued that there needs to be a greater emphasis on philanthropic uh, assistance, mm to improve the level of investment given the changes that have occurred through the digitalisation of, of the industry. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that uh, and, is it, and could you perhaps reflect upon the proposition that's been advanced by the Public Interest Journalism Initiative that's uh, suggested that an R&D tax type of incentive arrangement be used for the taxation system. Do you think there's any merit in finding alternative means to encourage investment to in actually rebuild media diversity in the country. I, look, I think uh, I think you know philanthrop philanthropists, whether it's Judith Nielsen or others, or Graham Wood, of course, who was the you know supported the Guardian when it was starting in Australia. These are very very important contributors. I mean, as 
is American democracy enhanced by Jeff Bezos's support of the Washington Post? Clearly it is, whatever you may think of Amazon or Jeff Bezos in other contexts. Uh, yeah, I think we've I, I think we've got we've got to address you're gonna to have to think we're gonna to have to think imaginatively and laterally here because we do have a problem. I mean, I'd I'd commend to you an essay that was written in the New York Times magazine last year by Emily Bazelon uh, about this issue. And, and she makes the point there that the whole concept of you know, freedom of speech in the US, the First Amendment, is premised on the proposition that in the conflict of ideas, the truth will prevail. You know, in the battle of ideas, the truth will prevail. Regrettably, increasingly, we're seeing we are drowning in lies. And part of that is due to the the ability to narrow cast that I was talking about earlier. I mean, uh, a good example where I really learnt my lesson on that was in 2016 when the Labor Party's audaciously outrageous Medicare lie, you know, that we were going to sell Medicare, uh, which was laughed out of every television studio in the country, um, nonetheless got enormous traction and was very, very potent and damaging to us uh, in a number of electorates uh, because it was being channeled directly through social media and digital you know, text messages and so forth. So the bottom line is the idea that the truth prevails, the proper proposition that the truth prevails in the battle of ideas is really being tested at the moment. And so, you know, you, you sort of, you need, for example, I mean, some media, not the, the Fairfax, old Fairfax newspapers are a good example of this, are very reluctant to publish anything critical of News Corp. There's a sort of a KOG there. Um, the, the truth is that the media has to, they have to hold each other for account. I mean, obviously News Corp never holds back in its attacks on the ABC, which is like an obsession, but uh, we, we, we're just going to have to get stop media proprietors exercising that power without responsibility. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't have, I, I wish I had a single one line answer for you. I don't, but we cannot blind ourselves to the problem we're Fair facing. And, and the, Morat, the government's mandatory code has been given particular attention. What's your view on that? Is that a, an answer to the question of media diversity? Well, no, I think it's, I, I think it's really problematic. I mean, it looks, it, it looks and feels like a shakedown. Uh, I'm not, you know, sort of trying to defend Google and Facebook at all. Uh, I think a, it is, it's actually pretty outrageous. We would have been better off. We would have been better off having a digital services or digital advertising tax. Uh, and then, you know, which cut across the board, rebate that to organisations for who, you know, employed a lot of journalists and then have the, the balance, which would bulk of it, which would, which would come from Google and Facebook and similar platforms, uh, you know, distributed in uh, a manner to actually support journalism. I mean, we've got, we're going to have to start being prepared to make subjective decisions about quality uh, of journalism and news, as we used to, you know, under the Broadcasting Act. I mean, I'm, when I was a young broadcasting lawyer, um, we had uh, triennial license renewals and you had to be a fit and proper person. You had to demonstrate that your news services were balanced. All those, you know, people were, ac were accountable. But nowadays, that's out of fashion. And I think that was a mistake. So there's been other proposals such as that uh, by a group of ex-editors of the major Marsids who have made a submission to this inquiry and suggested that we should be direct grants allocated by a statutory body at arm's length from government to support new and smaller publishers. What, what's your view on that proposal? Well, I think that could, I mean, that, that could be very worthwhile. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think we all have a vested interest in greater diversity, uh, but, but we cannot pretend that there isn't an issue about quality, you know, and the, I mean, you know, for example, I mean, I, I'll give you an, a good example. If you take the News Corp newspapers and The Guardian, right? Now, The Guardian is one of the great newspapers in the English language, obviously, but it, it undoubtedly leans to the left. It is a 
a small L liberal, you know, left-ish newspaper, very unlikely to re recommend a vote for the, you know, the centre-right parties in any election, but they don't make stuff up, they don't run vendettas, they do check facts. You know, it is a, it, it's, it's a professional operation. That is no longer the case. Uh, with news, and I mean the decline of the Australian, which I mean, you know, so many experienced newspaper people from from news, and indeed privately within news, make the same observation. So it's this is this. What's happened is there has been a step from being publications and media outlets that tend to lean one way in terms of their philosophy to full blown propaganda, and and you know that is, you know, people like Paul Kelly have. You know, I quoted on that in my book, would blame that on social media. Well, that may have contributed to it, but we're living with the consequences. Several witnesses have put to us in terms of accountability and, and complaint mechanisms that there is very limited opportunity for individuals and for groups to be able to get a response to adverse treatment by the media. The Press Council is often cited. There's been a very strong criticism of the Press Council by a number of submitters. One, it's not resourced. It's not actually able to deal with complaints that it's actually dominated by the proprietors. Uh, I'm wondering if you give us a view on whether or not there are better remedies to provide assistance to people to give a counter view when they've been mistreated rather than uh, the woefully expensive libel uh, defamation mm. procedures, which are not available to organisations in any event. Yeah, no, it's a good, good point. Look, I, I, I used to be a defamation lawyer, um, again, I, but it's a very long time ago. So, but I've always felt that a good reform uh, would have been, would be something like this where you would say that if a person, you know, call them the plaintiff who's been, feels they've been defamed, if they bring their complaint to a publisher and the publisher within a <clears throat> reasonable time, you know, whether it's a week or two weeks, detail, uh, publishes a correction and apology, uh, then, you know, in an equally prominent position then they should not be able to get damages other than actual pecuniary damages. You know, so if their business revenues were half, they could be compensated for that. In other words, to provide an incentive for media outlets to get, get the facts straight uh, quickly. Because you see, we look at defamation often as a battle between the individual's right to his or her reputation and the publisher's right of free speech. But there's also a third interest, which is the public's interest to timely and accurate information on matters of, you know, public and other affairs. And so I think that's, um, you know, that that's that was a, uh, an approach that I, you know, canvassed many years ago to be probably for good reason. I couldn't get a lot of traction for it or support for it. But, you know, the, you're absolutely right. I mean, journalists are very... Uh, you know, very um, fond of complaining about how tough it is the defamation laws are, but the resources of an individual faced, you know, with the might of a media pro company are just so minuscule. So for the, you know, it's fine for billionaires and, you know, maybe politicians who can get the resources to sue, but for the average person, they are just completely, they're just completely outmatched. And so, uh, I think we, we do we do have to think about how people can get their reputations restored and how publishers have a real incentive to get their facts straight. Because in my experience, most defamations are the result of mistakes, mm. you know, and, and particularly in this environment where journalists are having to write copy instantly, you know, and there's no longer a, you know, a, a, a dead, you know, there's no longer a you know, hours or days of, of a deadline, you're basically having to write it instantly, it is much easier and perhaps more inevitable to make mistakes. And of course, organisations don't have even defamation <coughs> actions uh, or are not able to. A union, for instance, cannot 
get any support or you know, can, cannot take legal action and defend their reputation if they're challenged, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when they're faced with a campaign of vilification. Would you agree with that? Well, I, well, I think it's, I, again, I think that's uh, perhaps the, the right area is not defamation law, but uh, something analogous to the action that corporations can bring under Section 52, or, you know, they can effectively bring a, a claim against a publisher for, uh, you know, having published misleading, misleading or deceptive material about them and recover damages in that way. So, look, I, uh, again, I, I'm, uh, it's the, the, the days when I was uh, uh, very knowledgeable about this, I'm afraid, are decades I'll in the past. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just checking, Senator Fawcett, you're, you're okay or you... There's... Just a couple of quick questions if I can, thanks. Great. Chair, Mr Turnbull, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Um, you expressed some concerns about uh, the effects of media concentration on our democracy. And uh, one of our previous hearings, we canvassed the fact that in Queensland, where there was statistical evidence to say that the News Corp had bought a number of, of mastheads and dominated the mm. print media, that in fact the Labor Party had won the vast majority of elections. I just wonder yeah. if you'd like to comment on how that concentration of media uh, hasn't in fact affected the outcomes in the way that some people were expressing concern that it would. Yeah, well, look, it's, that's a, you know, you notice that I've not, um, I mean, this is a point that Kevin's made, Kevin Rudd has made, and I, I think it's a fair point, but I don't think it's the whole picture. Um, the the problem, the, the reality is that, and you'd understand this very well as a member of the Liberal Party, uh, the reality is that the sort of Murdoch media are much more influential within the coalition than they are in the electorate at large. Just like Fox News in the States is much more influential within Republic, among Republican voters than it is in the electorate at large. I mean, you know, Trump would have won the election if it was. That's that influential. So, so what this what Murdoch's media has done in the states and here is pull the coalition, the coalition in our case, the Republicans in the U.S. further to the right. Now, it's not the only force doing that, but it's a very big part of it. In terms of Queensland, uh, you know, the there is no question that the, um, you know, the uh, sort of inaction, if you like, on climate. Uh, that you see across the political divide uh, is connected to the influence of the Murdoch media. I mean, there's no, I mean, again, I'm not, you know, you, you don't want to be like, I mean, let's not, or don't let yourselves be like Matt Keane and have the indignity of having to say, oh, you know, Murdoch's media are completely balanced and fair and, you know, don't lean, don't bully governments or don't deny climate action. We've got to be honest about it. Uh, and recognise that we do have this challenge. And it doesn't always result in uh, Liberal governments being elected or supported at all because the, the influence of that right-wing media ecosystem is most significant in the context of the, um, of the, you know, the coalition base itself. And I mean, again, you know, you're still in the business, so but I, I'm not so long out of it that I don't remember very keenly uh, how that ecosystem operates. Sure. The other question I had, you've mentioned a couple of times the uh, concept of personal vendettas. Hmm. Um, over the last decade in Australian politics, uh, I've heard Fairfax accused of running vendettas. You've accused News Corp of running vendettas. There are people currently accusing the ABC of running vendettas uh, in the media, depending on where people come from. But in September 2015, the ABC did an analysis of some of the claims about the impact of media on our leadership stability. And they quoted Bruce Hawker, uh, who said that leaking is probably more of a concern than what Alan Jones or Alan Andrew Bolt might say in terms of the impact on 
uh, our democracy, the stability of governments and leaderships. Just wondering if you'd like to comment on uh, his observation. Well, well, look, I haven't seen the context in which he said it, uh, Senator, but um, the reality is that what, uh, you know, the Sky News uh, commentators after dark, what the Murdoch tabloids say, what, you know, the shock shocks at 2GB say, is vastly, vastly more influential on the coalition side of politics. I mean, that's, that, that's the reality. So, you know, uh, Senator Hanson Young, Senator Carr, if they get slammed every night on Sky News, it isn't going to affect their pre-selections. It's probably not going to affect whether anyone votes for them. But if there was a full tilt campaign against you, you would feel that in your pre-selection in South Australia, and you know that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Um, Mr. Turnbull. Mr. In whether either prior to being Prime Minister or during your time or since, have you had any conversations with Mr Murdoch about climate change and climate science? Uh, yes, uh, not, we're talking about Rupert Murdoch now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've also, I've, it's a long time since I've discussed anything much with Lachlan Murdoch, to be honest. Um, look, Rupert, in my experience, tends to sidestep conversations like that. I mean, I, you know, I regularly said to him before I was uh, PM, but particularly while I was PM, you know, what, why is this, why are you allowing this campaign against me and my government to continue? You know, the only winner of this is going to be our opponents, you know, the Labor Party. Um, and of course, there was this crazy agenda that Rupert acknowledged to me that was being pushed by Paul Whitaker and, you know, apparently with Lachlan support, which was that my leadership should be overthrown so that, or overthrown or damaged to an extent that one way or another we would lose the 2019 election and Tony Abbott could come back as opposition leader and then return us to glorious victory in 2022. Now, this sounds completely unhinged uh, and it may well be so, but there's no, there's no doubt that that was you know, that was being undertaken and I had a direct conversation with Rupert about it, you know, which I might say Clive Matheson was my chief of staff was the witness and took very good notes. So there's no, and I, I know what, what he said to Stokes. And of course we saw what they were doing. So, you know, this is, th th there's a lot of, there's crazy stuff here, but equally look at the United States. I mean, could you really have credited that a major cable news network would have supported the proposition that Joe Biden had stolen the election, even though it was clearly untrue and with consequences that resulted in the American Capitol, their parliament, being sacked by a mob of thousands of people who believed what they'd seen on Fox News. I mean, and if you, if you don't think that isn't a threat to American democracy, and undermining the strength and capability of our most important ally, then, you know, you are kidding yourself. Mm. One of the things that we've consistently heard from uh, other uh, witnesses and variety of submissions, and this is in the, the, the context of the influence of uh, and the concentration of the Murdoch press here in Australia, um, you know, when we had uh, Michael Miller uh, present to our hearing uh, a number of sessions ago. Um, he was very keen to downplay the media concentration, arguing that, well, um, we've got newspapers, but there's all these radio stations and television stations mm -hmm. and online media that we don't have anything to do with. Um, however, um, the evidence that we keep being presented with is that uh, what is on the front page of those newspapers every morning sets the tone and the agenda for the rest of the media for the rest of the day. So if there's a front page uh, article on the Daily Telegraph criticising you as being a NIMBY, <laughs> 
That then gets picked up by morning radio, morning television, and before you know it, the evening news uh, that day is all about whether you're going to be sacked. Hmm. And is, yeah. that, is that a fair assessment, that these yeah, newspapers I, I, look, run the agenda for everybody else? I, 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 think the, I think the papers still set the agenda, not as much as they did when I was a reporter in the 1970s, uh, but there's no doubt, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of what you say is, is largely correct. Um, I think the other thing is that the, is that they are utterly um, liberated from the truth. So the, you know, the, the, I mean, and again, you can, Trump kind of embodied this most incredibly as president, but they don't care. Uh, about lying, they don't care about making stuff up. I mean, you talk again. I don't want to talk about myself and you know this incident last week, but it's current and it's a nice little case study. In one of the, apart from representing me as a anti-coal activist NIMBY uh, for daring to object to the extension of an open cut, massive open cut coal mine, you know, uh, close to our. Um, you know, grazing property in the Hunter Valley. And of course, bear in mind what that is, that sends a message to anybody else that dares to object to the expansion of the coal industry. Uh, if you dare to do that, you too can be sort of uh, scarified on the front page of the Telegraph. And while I've got a thick hide, as I'm sure all the members of this committee do, the average person is just literally, that is just mind blowing and terrifying, that prospect. Mm -hmm. But in one of the editorials that Telegraph wrote about my shortcomings, they said that Mr. Turnbull wants to shut down the whole coal industry, which is actually quite the reverse of what I was saying. What I was saying was that, you know, we've got export demand is declining for reasons we all understand. There is more than sufficient capacity in existing mines. And the, the sort of willy nilly expansion of coal mining there in addition to all the environmental negatives, both local and global, uh, is actually putting the jobs in the existing mines at risk. So, so, but, but, you know, that's a detail. You see, the facts don't matter. They will make stuff up. And it's, that's where you get that same culture. It is propaganda. It's, it's not news anymore. It's propaganda and it has a purpose. And that is to pursue their agenda, uh, you know, political, environmental, whatever. Um, in terms of ensuring media diversity, and obviously if we've got this propaganda machine that has a mm. huge political influence, uh, and I think it's interesting and important to, to note here that we've had both yourself as a former Liberal Prime Minister, and we've had Kevin mm. Rudd as a former Labor Prime Minister, so in uh, many ways, this cuts across the traditional uh, partisan divides. Um, if there's a problem with media diversity, uh, is it that we simply have to boost the ability for the alternatives uh, to uh, participate in the daily public interest journalism? whether that's the ABC, uh, whether that's uh, encouraging uh, more other independent and, and, and smaller uh, outfits. Uh, is that the way to do it? Or does there need to be um, a, a specific um, dismantling of the power uh, of News Corp? Well, look, I think, I think probably all of the above. Uh, the ABC is more important than ever. Um, because it, it is bound by its act to be present its, you know, to present uh, accurate news and uh, balanced commentary. Can't remember the exact words, it's in section eight, but it's there. Uh, and so, you know, one of the points I used to make as whether it's comms minister or the PM to the ABC was you can't go down the same sort of opinionated, propagandistic rabbit hole as the other media, because you're not like the other media. You've got an obligation, uh, a statutory obligation they don't have. And I think the, 
you know, my criticisms of the ABC uh, were not of their of being biased, politically biased, but actually of what I thought was in some cases a decline in journalistic standards, you know, like not not checking facts. You know, I felt there could have been at times, you know, more more and better editorial leadership. Uh, and, you know, that's where I give Lenore Taylor great credit at The Guardian. You know, whatever you think of The Guardian's leanings, with, you know, if you think it's too far to the left or, you know, whatever, or not left enough, you know, Lenore is a tough, disciplined editor. And that's important. Getting the facts straight and not making stuff up is important. Um, so I think, yes, uh, alternatives should be encouraged. I do think the uh, extent of, um, you know, uh, daily newspaper ownership, particularly in Queensland, is right out of control now. Uh, and the particularly in Queensland, I think the, I mean, I'm not a Queenslander, obviously, but I think the points that Kevin makes uh, are very, are very powerful ones. And, uh, you know, more diversity would have to be a good thing. I think AAP also needs to be supported. I'm glad the government gave it five million bucks. I mean, Murdoch, of course, as you all know, was trying to put it out of business uh, and replace it with a newswire service controlled by News Corp. But I think the survival of AAP as an independent uh, newswire service is really important because what it's doing is providing the bulk of the news copy for a lot of, uh, you know, smaller publishers, whether they're broadcast or print or, or just online. Mm. Um, <clears throat> um, yes, yeah, Senator Carr, okay, yes, you can, just you, yes, 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 yes your thoughts. Mr. Mr Turnbull, a matter I raised with you before regarding the 2017 reforms, you, you said that the you thought that the proposals that you advanced were opposed by Murdoch, and it's been brought to my attention that Lachlan Murdoch, in fact, proposed, uh, had a bid in at the time for 10, and was dependent upon the changes that those uh, 2017 measures involved, that is the repeal of the two out of the three rule, mm. was actually critical for his uh, bid. And, and a point that Tim Warner from the, was then the CEO of Seven pointed out, uh, mm. and that the ACCC approval had actually been organised before the law was actually passed, uh, but the fact that Lachlan, in fact, had, had misjudged the situation because the CBS bid had come in and essentially outmanoeuvred him. But the claim was that uh, Murdoch opposed this was, in fact, not quite right in, in the light of the actual events of the time. Uh, and I, yeah. I, I do say that uh, just in the sense that um, mm. if we're looking at the the development of media regulation here, then no one comes to this with clean hands. Is that... Uh, no, no, well, yeah, Senator, I'm not... Um, you know, th these things, these issues have been around for a long time. Uh, I can assure you that um, the... For quite a while, the only media group that strongly supported or supported at all changing the two out of three rule was uh, Fairfax and Nine because there was the option of a merger. And it absolutely was opposed by Murdoch. I mean, eventually uh, everybody got on board and that's why it happened. But it was, you know, because you see effectively Murdoch had, the, he had effective control of 10 until Lachlan managed to bungle the whole insolvency. And as we know, CBS got control of it, but he had effective control of 10 and so was, would have preferred that Fairfax did not get controlled by nine or merge with nine. So you, in fact, I mean, there was a, um, I could, uh, I could find it for you uh, probably, but you'll find, I think it was, a, it was, it would have been in 2014 or 15 where I'd advocated this reform and, um, and there was quite a stinging tweet from uh, Murdoch about it, uh, having a go at me, so. Right. But, uh, so, so yes, I mean, but it is eventually everybody got on board and there are all sorts of, you know, arrangements and amendments made to try to keep everyone satisfied. I mean, media policy is diabolical and your side had the same problem because you, uh, you know, there, uh, as Sam Chisholm used to say, 
Um, these proprietors are all founder members of the We Want the World Society, and so keeping them <laughs> keeping them uh, happy is uh, is pretty hard. Can I just come back to another point you raised? You, you said you've had spoken directly to Murdoch uh, in regard to some of these issues on climate change, but there have been some sidestepping of the issues. Can I ask yeah. you, what was your, what's the nature of a conversation with the executive leadership of News Corp in Australia about the way well, in which I, I, the, the Australian outlets have actually treated the climate change issue and the what you call the uh, what it should be an issue of physics into an issue of values and identity. Mm. Yeah, well, I I can't recall any uh, um, I can't recall any um, specific conversations with local leadership about it. I mean, it was uh, you know uh, the, the the best the best uh, I'll I'll find this for you now. But the best. Uh, Exam the best discussion, the frankest discussion I've had with uh, anyone from News about this uh, was with um, with Paul Kelly, and uh, I refer to this in my book. Um, and I say I've had a chat with Paul Kelly, and we, this is in 2017. We agreed that what has happened is that the mainstream media has become disaggregated and marginalised by social media and an infinite range of additional channels on the internet. These new channels are invariably hysterical, extreme, often fact-free, and in order to maintain attention, the mainstream media has gone the same way, so that now even a broadsheet like The Australian is full of prejudiced extreme opinion because that is what drives traffic, clickbait. Fairfax and even the ABC have been equally infected. This, of course, is what Paul is saying. So the media discourse is now extreme and destructive, everywhere and we see the consequence, Trump, Le Pen, Brexit, etc. Kelly observed that at news and especially on Sky, the view is that I have to be destroyed because I'm too left wing, no better than Shorten, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Indeed, he says on Sky, they've lost all interest in Australian politics as a struggle between Labor and the coalition. Rather, their fascination is between Turnbull, the soft centrist, and Tony Abbott, the muscular conservative, who let them down again and again? Crazy times. So that's you know that's a note I made at the times in my book. Uh, the um, and uh, yeah, I mean that is there's a, you know quite a bit more of that in my book. But but the you know that's I mean who who's got a better insight into what's changed at News Corp than Paul? You know, and uh, that is the. But you know he's a captive too, right? He wouldn't be in a position to say that publicly because he'd be uh, he'd be writing um, I don't know writing for the conversation, I guess if he did that. <laughs> um, Mr. Turnbull, we've talked a bit about News Corp's uh, agenda and response in relation to climate change and their um, yeah. uh, and how they've derailed um, mm. action. I want to ask. Mm. Um, from your perspective, uh, what News Corp's treatment of women uh, has been in Australia? Uh, and obviously, you would have seen the way uh, Julia Gillard was treated as Prime Minister. Mm. Um, there's uh, plenty other examples of uh, the way um, news coverage has uh, dealt with uh, other women in public life. Um, Gillian Triggs comes to mind as somebody specifically. Mm. Uh, that's been referenced by other submitters to us. Um, how have you uh, uh, witnessed uh, their engagement of women? And do you think that perhaps uh, there is a difference between uh, your prime ministership and uh, Julia Gillard's, Gillard's prime ministership in terms of how News Corp uh, and even other media uh, covered and, uh, and responded? Well, look, the, the treatment of Gillard was was shameful. I mean, just and it was pushed uh, very strongly by the News Corp tabloids, and of course, most notoriously by Alan Jones, who, while he, you know, in his radio job, he works with uh, uh, the you know Macquarie Group. Oh, used to. Uh, he also works for Sky. Um, look, this is yeah. I mean, it, this is a. Uh, deeply, it, it's this sort of, uh, 
I don't know. It's just this deep misogyny that you see uh, in the right wing political ecosystem. I mean, again, it's again, I'm not telling any of you something you don't know, but I mean, has there ever been a male politician whose body shape has been commented on the way Gillard's was, uh, whose you know, constant criticism of the way she dressed? But I mean, this is there is a deep misogyny in uh, our political system. And, you know, I sought to address that as prime minister. In fact, I did seek to address it. I'm not saying I, I resolved it quite, the, you know, not at all. But I did seek to address it. Um, but it is, it's a real, it's a fundamental problem. And I have to say, you know, with all due respects to Scott Morrison, when he said the other day, oh, other workplaces are like this too, that is completely and utterly untrue. Now, I give him credit that he basically hasn't worked, hasn't had much experience outside of politics. So maybe he just wasn't aware. But in the modern, the standards that you, standards that you, that you put up with in the, um, in Parliament, that you're all too familiar with, uh, are, are not uh, completely at odds with modern Australia, whether it's in, you know, the public service environment or the corporate world or whatever. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, again, you could find plenty of examples of this, but the, uh, the pursuit of Gillard was, was just one of, was really one of the most shameful episodes. But to give her credit, her misogyny speech was one of the uh, most powerful counter punches I've ever seen in politics. Mm. Um, how about uh, the way the media and particularly News Corp uh, represents the opposition uh, to their uh, to those who they support. Um, and I, I guess I'm thinking um, here in particular uh, how News Corp uh, covered Bill Shorten as opposition leader, uh, or. Um, uh, other, you know, you talk about an agenda. You talk about News Corp being a, uh, effectively a, a political party in their own right now, uh, working in coalition government uh, with the Morrison government. Um, how, if it's not, if it's that they are, if it's that members on your side of government or your side of parliament would be afraid to stand up or take on by virtue of what that would mean for the base. Um, could you give some reflection of how uh, the opposition is treated? Well, I think the, uh, it's probably better for, you know, someone from the Labor side to address that. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the news, News Corp, ten, you know, supports the coalition much more than the Labor Party, although they did support Kevin Rudd years ago. Uh, and Kevin certainly had a close relationship for many years. Again, one that I didn't have, you know, uh, and nor did I seek one. Um, but I think they, you know, they've got that they've got mates who they do not hold accountable and they protect, uh, and they've got uh, and they target their friends' opponents and they bully people and in terms of running a vendetta against somebody, they're basically sending a message to everybody else, right? I mean, it's no, you know, one of the selling points that Dutton's people were making in August 2018 was we've got News Corp supporting us, you know, and they were citing discussions with senior people at News Corp. But, but I mean, it was obvious, you didn't, you didn't need to have that whispered to you in a corridor, you could see it, and and so this this is the this is the the point is they are I think the single most influential political player in Australia, but they are unelected, and they are utterly unaccountable, and that's the you know that that is what we're talking about. So, and and they do not hold themselves to journalistic. Uh, traditional journalistic standards of, you know, accuracy and balance and so forth. Now, they would say, uh, oh, look, it's a business model. You know, we, you know, we've, uh, it's, a, you know, we've got 
you know, a percentage of the population who love being told this stuff and they like the extreme political views. And so that's what we're going to do. And Fox News in the States is commercially very successful. But that's, you know, that is not, that's not a justification that, you know, we can tolerate if the consequences are so much damage to our democracy. Again, you know, you can't get around from that. Would the 6th of January have occurred? Would America be as divided and therefore weaker as it is today without the efforts of Murdoch? And he has done so much damage to the United States that people are scared to hold him to account because of the consequences, because they don't want to be the next person on the vendetta list. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr Turnbull. Thank you so much for your time uh, today. And, thank you. Um, it's been good to see you all again. Thank you. And of course, if there, um, this, this inquiry is continuing for some time, so if there's any uh, anything else that comes to mind that you think we should be uh, aware of, uh, please don't hesitate to get in contact in contact with the Secretariat. And, and ditto, uh, uh, Senator, if there's anything other matters you want to raise with me, um, you know, happy to reappear or answer questions in writing as you see fit. Can, sorry, Senator Carr has so, a question. So, uh, Mr Turnbull, I, I asked you a series of questions about what actions can be taken in regard to improving diversity. If you have any further thoughts on that, particularly around the use of the taxation system, I'd appreciate uh, any supplementary advice that you would like to tender. Uh, I'm specifically interested in uh, models that perhaps would use the existing R&D uh, tax concession uh, administered by the, the Taxation Office with setting out a particular framework, but for specific public interest journalism with the standards issue mm. addressed uh, that you yep. have referred to. Um, or, or, or other measures you can, can contemplate. Thank you. Right. Sure. No, thank you very much. I'll reflect on that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr Turnbull. And uh, we're just going to take a short suspension and we'll be back at 10.40 with Michael Mann. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, resume our hearing and I now welcome Dr Michael Mann, Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at Penn State University, appearing via video conference. Um, Mr Mann, thank you for giving us your time today. I understand it's quite late uh, where you are uh, in the evening, so thank you so much for uh, giving us your time. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full name and the capacity in which you appear before us today? Uh, yes, Michael Evan Mann. Thank you. And you're appearing in your uh, private capacity? I am, indeed. I now uh, would invite you to make a short opening statement uh, in, to this committee. You understand that we're looking at the issues of media diversity and the impact on a media concentration on uh, uh, Australia and elsewhere. Um, and then we'll go to some questions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, during the tea break, uh, I had uh, decaffeinated tea since <laughs> it is fairly late here uh, on the east coast of the US. Um, so, uh, you know, Senators, I appreciate this opportunity to address you today. I am Michael Mann. I hold the title of Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at the Pennsylvania State University. I am a climate researcher, a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, and a recipient of the Tyler Medal for Environmental Achievement. I am here today to speak to you about the destructive role that the Murdoch media have played in the public discourse over climate change here in the United States and there in Australia. I speak from personal experience. Back in 1998, I published the now iconic hockey stick curve, demonstrating the dramatic nature of human-caused planetary warming. This powerful graph 
constituted a threat to fossil fuel interests, and in the ensuing two decades, both it and I have been subject to attacks by industry-funded groups and right-wing media outlets doing the bidding of the fossil fuel industry. Foremost among them have been Murdoch News Corp media outlets, such as Fox News, The New York Post, and The Wall Street Journal here in the U.S., The Sun and The Times in the U.K., and The Australian, The Daily Telegraph, and Herald Sun in Australia. These outlets have attacked the science of climate change and the scientists themselves, yours truly included, and they've spread disinformation about climate solutions aimed at discrediting renewable energy sources such as wind and solar. I spent a sabbatical leave in Sydney last year to collaborate with Australian researchers in studying the impacts of climate change on extreme weather events in Australia. Ironically, instead of studying those impacts, I witnessed them firsthand as I documented in my recent book, The New Climate War. During my time down under, I grew fond of Australia and its people, and it was heartbreaking to watch the Black Summer play out in real time. The scenes of destruction and devastation are forever singed in my memory. They were the stark reification of the model predictions I've long studied. Dangerous climate change has now arrived for Australia, whether it's the unprecedented heat, drought, and bushfires one year, or the epic floods the next. This is the new reality Australia faces, and it will only get much worse if we, that is the US, Australia, and the rest of the world, fail to act boldly and immediately to reduce global carbon emissions. As horrifying as it has been to watch these climate change wrought disasters play out in Australia, it has been equally horrifying to watch the pernicious efforts by the Murdoch media to sow disinformation about what is happening. I'm talking specifically about efforts by Murdoch-owned papers like the Australian and the Herald Sun to promote thoroughly discredited myths, blaming the record fires last year on arson or backburning or really anything other than the inconvenient true culprit that must not be named if you're the Murdoch media. The much publicized Garneau report predicted back in 2007 that climate change fueled heat and drought would by 2020 be apparent in the form of unprecedented bushfires. We have reaped what we have sown, and the Murdoch press is substantially to blame for serving as a megaphone of climate disinformation, disinformation that has provided fodder for inactivist politicians like former U.S. President Donald Trump and the current Australian Prime Minister. The misinformation spewed by the Murdoch media during last year's bushfires was in fact so egregious that Rupert Murdoch's own son, James, publicly denounced News Corp for the disinformation it was spreading. The Murdoch media have spent decades poisoning both our political and literal atmosphere, and in so doing, they have done a grave disservice to my friends down under, the good people of Australia. Their destructive reign must come to an end. There in Australia, here in the US, and elsewhere, it is my great hope that these proceedings might constitute the beginning of that process. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Mann. Just checking, so you were here over the uh, summer bushfires uh, last year, and uh, the, the, obviously 2019, uh, 2020 um, summer. Um, That's right, yeah. And I'm, I'm interested, um, you've said that over your time as a climate scientist, that you have been subjected yourself uh, to attacks from uh, the Murdoch press. And I, the, the interesting um, phrase that you've just given us before was that the Murdoch press uh, seem intent on attacking science and the scientists themselves. That's right. Um, could you give us a little bit of an insight into what that looks like? Um, yeah. I think for to help us understand just the the extent, the disinformation, the undermining of science, science uh, I'd like to understand it from your perspective, from your experience, what that has looked like. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister um, Turnbull actually alluded to this modus operandi, um, this idea of taking somebody, whether it be a politician or a scientist, and vilifying them on the pages of the Murdoch, uh, you know, uh, media outlets, um, basically as a way of intimidating scientists, preventing us from speaking out publicly about climate change, about the impacts, about the threat that it represents. It's a form of intimidation intended to uh, serve as notice 
for other scientists. If you speak out um, about climate change, if you publish an iconic graph, as we did, the hockey stick graph back in the late 1990s, and it leads you to, to, to speak out about the profound implications of the science when it comes to public policy, the need to do something about climate change, we're gonna come after you. We're going to make an example of you for other would-be science communicators. And it's very similar to the tactic that, uh, again, former Prime Minister Turnbull described in how they intimidate uh, politicians in Australia. They've done the same thing with scientists for decades now. Um, and is this uh, putting an alternative view on your facts uh, that you're representing as a scientist? Is it um, uh, you know, going to your personal character? And are, are they are they are they um, attacking the science per se, or are they attacking the, um, uh, how, the that you even dare to to speak to the science? Yeah, it's really, you know, it's not in good faith, right? In science, in the world of science, there is good faith give and take. That's part of the great, what Carl Sagan, the great Carl Sagan described as the self-correcting machinery of science that keeps us moving forward towards scientific truth. If you're wrong, then your colleagues will point it out. Um, they'll publish comments on your articles. That's the give and take that, that is so valuable in science when it operates in good faith. Um, unfortunately, those are not the rules of engagement in the world of politics and when it comes to the Murdoch media. They're not interested in having a real debate about the science because they're not going to win that debate. There's overwhelming scientific consensus, whether you talk to the Australian Academy of Science, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, of which I'm a member, um, all the major academies around the world. There is a an extremely uh, broad consensus now among the world scientists that climate change is real, it's human caused, and it represents a threat if we don't do something about it. Those are inconvenient facts, and they are the facts. And the Murdoch media has shown no interest in engaging on the facts. Look, there's a worthy debate to be had about policy. How do we deal with this threat? Um, what sort, uh, you know, what sorts of mechanisms do we use to try to decarbonize uh, our economy? Um, what's the role of different energy sources? Um, you know, uh, there is a, a there is a worthy debate to be had about that stuff, but that doesn't seem to be the debate that the Murdoch press, the Murdoch media, is interested in having. Instead, as you allude to, since they can't win their case on the facts, they attempt to undermine uh, character, the character of the scientists. They challenge your integrity. Uh, they engage in smear campaigns, and I've been at the center of Murdoch spread uh, smear campaigns now for literally more than two decades that are aimed simply at discrediting me as an individual in an effort to discredit my science and my message. Does it shock you that uh, here in Australia it's represented in our media as if climate science is not settled? It is, and of course, there are some some great media outlets. Uh, when I was there, uh, I really enjoyed, um, you know, my opportunity to engage with a broad array of media outlets in, in Australia. Uh, none of them were Murdoch media outlets, um, but you know, the Guardian, as, as former uh, Prime Minister Turnbull uh, mentioned, the Guardian has really done a, an excellent job in its coverage of climate change, the science, the impacts, the policy dimensions of the problem. Uh, the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, th there are a lot of uh, great uh, media outlets. ABC um, uh, has, you know, done a, 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 you know, a, a number of different, um, you know, uh, major programs about climate science, about the bushfires and the role of climate change, you know, over the last year. Um, and, and so there, there is, you know, uh, there are these healthy media outlets in Australia that are that are trying to do the job of informing. Uh, the discourse, but the Australian media is so overpowered right now by the influence of uh, Murdoch's media empire. Um, controls, you know, the airwaves other than ABC News, you've got Foxtel, um, then you've got uh, the Murdoch press, um, Murdoch um, news outlets. Uh, they have a powerful megaphone in the United States in the form of Fox News and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post, but they have an even greater stranglehold here in Australia. And it is problematic because it does end up framing the science as contested when in fact 
the basic science is not contested. Climate change is real. It's a problem. We would not have seen the disastrous black uh, summer uh, of last year, um, the bushfires that spread out across the continent, if it were not for the aggravating impacts of climate change. Mm. Uh, I actually asked the uh, head of News Corp here in Australia in this committee uh, when they appeared about uh, the summer's bushfires and the uh, media company's portrayal of the reasons uh, and the impacts of climate change. Um, when I asked whether they had been, uh, whether climate change was a uh, contributor to the summer's bushfires, um, uh, Michael Miller uh, pointed me to opinion pieces that their newspaper had had written, suggesting that yes, climate change, uh, uh, you know, is part of it. Uh, yet in the news articles, as you point out, arson and other um, back burning uh, were cited as as the cause. Um, is it good enough that? the Murdoch press can print a few opinion pieces about climate change and climate science uh, and then claim that that means the rest of their reporting is, is fair and balanced. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out that even in those columns, Andrew Bolt's column that uh, it, it did have a column that addressed that, the, that, that uh, climate change was at least a factor. It was nice to see um, him concede that, but then um, dismissed um, it as, um, and it's almost incomprehensible, and I wish I had the headline in front of me, but it was something to the effect that, but they're good for us. <laughs> and this is sort of the next stage uh, in what I call the, the climate wars, as the science becomes indisputable, as people can see, they can witness with their own two eyes the impacts of climate change, and it's no longer credible to deny that climate change is here and it's having a role. Instead, we see these new tactics that are still aimed at keeping us, you know, the bottom line, addicted to fossil fuels. And whether it's because we deny that climate change is real or we buy into their framing that it's actually not bad for us and that the solution that has been proposed, renewable energy, will somehow, um, it somehow isn't viable or is problematic. And so what we see now is the emergence of these new tactics, uh, what I call the new climate war. Deflection, um, their, their effort, for example, uh, to deflect attention from the need for policies um, like the emissions trading scheme that was implemented under the, the Gillard administration and then, of course, uh, was eliminated um, uh, by, um, by uh, Tony Abbott. Um, that you know, th these, um, you know, what they, one of the tactics that they've been using now is to actually convince us that we don't need those policies, that um, the solution is individual action, um, and they use that to focus attention, for example, on, you know, uh, the mayor of Sydney, um, you know, her, uh, her office and their travel um, uh, history, uh, Clover Moore, um, they went after her in an effort to somehow present her as a glutton, as somebody with a large carbon footprint. As you all know, it actually was based on doctored documents that weren't even real, that, um, that, that smeared her. Um, and it was an effort to try to make it about individuals. And by the way, these people who are telling you we need climate friendly policies, um, look at their own profligate behavior. They don't put their money where their mouth is. It's an effort to deflect attention away from the needed solutions, um, an effort to uh, discredit key messengers um, in the climate space. And so these are all the tactics that they're using, even when they concede the science, they're doing so in a way that still challenges the notion that we have a problem and that we need to decarbonize our economy. Mm. You talked about uh, the tactics of uh, def defection, uh, division, deflection, uh, deflection yeah. division, yeah. Uh, kind of doomsday uh, kind of, uh, coverage and, 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 and politics. Um, could you expand on that? How as a scientist yeah. uh, do you uh, combat <laughs> 
uh, this suggestion that uh, it's it's all something else. Yeah. Yeah. What? Well, of course, as as scientists, we like to think that facts will prevail. Facts will win the day if we just present facts um, um, in a neutral environment. Um, policymakers will take them to heart and will enact policies um, that uh, do the, the the will of the people and the bidding of the people. But of course, that's a fantasy world that doesn't actually exist. In the real world, as we've seen in Australia. Um, the Murdoch media empire and fossil fuel interests have a stranglehold um, on the media framing of the issue and on our politics, on the politics here in Australia. Um, they uh, almost single-handedly uh, defeated the emissions trading scheme. Um, they vilified Gillard, um, as was already alluded to earlier, using misogynistic rhetoric to try to discredit her as a person in an effort to discredit her actions, her implementation of carbon pricing. And it was amazingly successful. Within the first 12 months, global carbon emissions dropped 10% uh, in Australia, and prices didn't go up as the critics had claimed they would. Um, the revenue was actually returned uh, on a progressive basis to the people. So it was working wonderfully, but then the Murdoch media came in. Uh, they first of all mischaracterized it, um, they, they wanted to insist that it was a carbon tax because that sort of language, even though it wasn't, it was uh, an, an emissions trading scheme. It wasn't actually a carbon tax, but they were very effective in framing the entire uh, public discourse so that this was now called a tax. And their focus groups, their internal polling told them that if they could describe this as a fact, a tax, if they could um, characterize it as a tax that was hurting everyday people, which it wasn't, that was an effective means of making it unpopular enough that someone like Tony Abbott could come in and get rid of it, which he did uh, mm -hmm. less than two years later. And so, yes, it's frustrating as a scientist to see that facts don't necessarily win the day when you have this uh, very concerted um, headwind in the form of a massive disinformation effort uh, promoted by the world's largest and most powerful media conglomerate, News Corp and Rupert Murdoch. Um, in that prohibitive environment, it's very difficult for the facts to get through and, and for policy to be made based on objective facts rather than political spin and Again, the sort of um, smear campaigns that the Murdoch media has been so effective in, in leveraging against climate policy and, and, and turning their sights on any politicians who would dare to advance climate policy, mm. be them uh, uh, labor or liberals alike, mm -hmm. or Greens or anybody. What's your experience from talking to other scientists uh, uh, in relation to this? Is there a fear of what you know, putting yourself forward and debating uh, this position, uh, this agenda, the representation uh, by the Murdoch press, by fear of you know, the guns being turned on 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 them, uh, you know, as scientists, is there a is there a fear amongst scientists as to to speak out on these issues? Well, I don't know. Let's ask ourselves, why is an American uh, climate scientist testifying here rather than an Australian climate scientist? I, I, I think any climate scientist in Australia would be scared to death to be engaged in the sort of commentary we are here uh, tonight um, because, of course, um, their funding, um, their jobs are at the mercy of this stranglehold that, that uh, the Murdoch media has on our entire on the entire political environment in Australia. So I, I think, you know, this alone speaks to, you know, yields the answer to the question mm -hmm. you're asking. Um, Australian scientists are cowed. Uh, we just read a story um, just the other day uh, that uh, the current administration was intimidating um, experts um, uh, who on, on this energy uh, committee uh, who had challenged uh, the notion of a, a gas-led recovery um, that was adverse to the interests of the, you know, of, of the um, of the Morrison uh, government. And uh, they, uh, Angus um, Taylor, uh, the energy secretary, basically, you know, um, 
challenge them, um, threaten them, um, uh, try to force them to change the language. That's the environment um, that, that we're mm. living in here in Australia. What do you think the answer to this is, Mr. Mann? Well, I mean, it is, you know, it is, um, again, Prime Minister uh, Turnbull alluded to, um, in the past there were um, policies. Here in the United States, we used to have um, a, uh, um, uh, 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 what was called a, um, uh, what, oh, it was, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the exact terminology, but uh, a fairness doctrine um, uh, where media um, outlets were expected to present objective uh, viewpoints and balanced viewpoints. And, and that was gotten rid of under the Reagan administration. Australia similarly has seen an erosion of policies that are aimed at creating um, a, a fair, uh, objective and, and neutral media environment. And so I think um, there needs, you know, I'm not an expert on Australian policy, but I think it's pretty clear that um, News Corp has been uh, allowed to run amok and has been allowed to throw their immense power and weight and wealth around in a way that has chilled not just the discourse, the public discourse on climate, but on everything um, that matters to Australian citizens. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear that that sort of media environment um, does not favor good public policy. It doesn't favor, um, you know, it, it doesn't do uh, the, the the will of the, the people that um, the government is supposed to be representing. So, you know, I, I, I do think that there um, need to be measures taken um, that uh, basically do provide some common sense, reasonable constraints on truthfulness, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, there have to be sanctions for media outlets that repeatedly lie to their readers. And I call it a lie because it's willful misinformation and disinformation that has been promoted by the Murdoch media around the world here in the United States. Um, in Australia, here in the United States, of course, uh, again, as uh, former Prime Minister Turnbull alluded to, um, they played an instrumental role in this insurrection, this deadly insurrection, an attempt to overthrow our, our democratic government. Um, the, I, the fact that um, the Murdoch media played a willful role in that should chill every person to their bones. Um, clearly, they need to be reined in. Um, in Australia, in the United States, and around the world. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Senator Carr. Yes, well, uh, Professor Mann, I'm, I'm wondering if we could follow through on that. You say measures need to be taken to talk about sanctions for willful lies. I'm just wondering, how do you see that operating? Well, again, it's above my pay grade. Um, I'm speaking just as a citizen, as a citizen who is very concerned about the, the impacts of misinformation and, and disinformation, and a citizen who's aware that we used to have um, yeah. uh, tougher standards that we so, applied. Professor Mann, I've, I've represented the Labor Party on science issues for the better part of a couple of decades. So uh, yeah. this issue about the war on science is uh, a longstanding public debate in this country. And a couple of things occur sure. to me. Um, what role and what responsibilities does the scientific community have for dealing with the alternative view uh, in terms of taking a political response to what is a political campaign? And secondly, do you think um, in terms of the public response on the public policy issues, why is it do you think this country is different, say for instance, from what's happening in Europe or even for the United States and, or North America and Canada? Oh, I, I, you know, I suppose that the difference um, really is just uh, a quantitative difference that the, the Murdoch media does seem to have an even greater stranglehold um, on the media environment in Australia, based on my experiences there, based on what I've witnessed, than it has in the United States. And it does have great in influence in the United States and in the UK and in other countries. But um, it's almost unique. Australia is almost unique in, in my experience um, in terms of the, the influence that the Murdoch uh, media has over um, the, the entire, uh, you know, uh, public discourse of the, of the country. And, 
it seems to me that um, they do get away um, with um, violating basic codes of um, of, uh, of journalism, right? Um, the the you know some of the most fundamental principles um, when you talk to um, you know experts in 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 the journalism field, academics um, who who study sort of the history of journalism uh, will tell you that um, accuracy above all else um, and balance are essential principles in, in um, the objective media. The News Corp media shows no evidence of either of those things. So, Professor Mann, I just I want to push you on this issue because it's an easy thing to say sanctions, measures should be taken. Um, the, uh, I can hear the response um, if that was to be the case. Um, and the real politic of such a proposition uh, would be that the it exists in some form. Show, um, show, in perhaps the UK, you could, out, could That's why I'm asking you yeah. to enlarge yeah. on that because I could yeah. hear the arguments about freedom of the press. I could hear the arguments about government uh, censorship. I could hear the arguments coming forward uh, about uh, the nature of regulation. Um, so where right. in the world yeah. is the sort of proposals, or can you point to examples internationally? Yeah. Or what actions are taken uh, in liberal democracies that would actually allow for yeah. greater diversity of ownership, control and opinion? So the UK is, of course, one of our oldest liberal democracies, um, although it's a, it has a parliamentary system. And I understand, uh, but I understand the nature, but what specific measures are taken yeah. in the United Kingdom that you would draw our attention yeah. to so they have a, to protect freedom yeah. of speech in the broader sense of that word? So there is a press complaints commission in the UK, um, and if a media um, outlet has engaged in the promotion of um, untruthful claims, um, they can be challenged by citizens or outside organizations. You can file a claim with the uh, with, with the, um, uh, the, the 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 press complaints commission. Um, the, unfortunately, it doesn't have a lot of teeth in it. It doesn't have uh, much. Um, much power to actually um, enforce its findings and decisions, but it does issue sanctions against uh, uh, media outlets that uh, promote falsehoods, that uh, that 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 oh, engage. All in right. The well, let me just deal with that. I mean, the United in but, the United yep. Kingdom, there was a fairly widespread argument about the misuse of media against. Uh, a whole range of public figures, including access to their their social media uh, uh, data. My recollection is nothing right. really happened out of that. I mean, uh, one newspaper outlet was closed down, but there was, but it was by the by Mr. Murdoch himself. There was no government response to what was seen to be fundamental breaches of the law. Isn't that the case? You no, know, you're, you're yeah, you're you're right. Um, I guess what I'm really saying is that, um, you know, there there are again, you know, the press complaints commission. These things do exist. They just don't have much um, um, enforcement authority, and that's part yes. of the problem. So, so yes. that's so, so Mr. Really Man, this is this is the, the question. I mean, yeah. I, my frustration, and as yeah. I say, I've dealt with the scientific community for a very long time, and yeah. it's it's one thing to have a, a discussion about how do we ensure. A diversity of opinion, but it's another thing to actually ensure that it actually happens. Now, and, and that's where I'm sort of trying to draw your attention yeah. to. Can you tell I, I me? I wish I had the answers yeah. for you. Okay. I'm, I'm so, just so we've got an analysis um, that says. Okay. Yeah. So we've got analysis that says things are crook. This inquiry has to provide advice to the Parliament of Australia on what we do about that. And and, yeah. and if you if you care to, you may wish to think more about your response and make a supplementary submission if you think it's appropriate and it's entirely a matter for you. But it strikes me, well, let me that there needs yeah. to be specific let measures me proposed. Yeah. So, you know, what I, I wrote a, a commentary about sort of what I see the role of the scientist to be in our public discourse when it comes to issues of uh, policy relevant science. In the New York Times about six years ago, if you see something, say something is the title of the, the op-ed. Yeah. And, and in it, I express my philosophy about this, which is that as a scientist, 
you know, uh, I see my role as trying to inform the policy discourse, to try to ensure that um, our, um, you know, the, the, the policy debate over issues like climate change is informed by an objective and an authoritative assessment of the science and the risks. And I leave it to the politicians to figure out how to actually implement the policies that deal with these problems. As long as it is premised on an acceptance of the facts, then the political process is supposed to do what you're describing, supposed to figure out how mm -hmm. we can serve the will of the people. The mm -hmm. problem here, of course, with climate change and the Murdoch media is they have worked extremely hard to actually um, to attack the facts and to undermine public faith in factual discourse. And that, that's the problem. They're not even interested in having an objective debate about policy because they're too busy trying to distort the public's understanding of the facts. Sure. And that's true in the United States and it's true in Australia so, as well, so unfortunately. I'll come back to this point again, Mr. Manny. If you've got, uh, I mean, I can well agree with your assessment about the nature of the political dialogue, but what I'm seeking from you is any advice on what specific measures parliaments such as this country could adopt to actually encourage and, and rectify a change in the actual practice. I'm perhaps, yeah, and I guess what I'm saying is I'm leaving it to all you, you all, yeah, um, yeah, okay. you know, you understand Australian law and policy yeah. and um, you're, you're ideally suited to, I think, answer those questions. I can <laughs> just try to oh, inform <laughs> conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Senator um, Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Chair, Mr. Mann. Good um, morning, I guess it is over there, or very late good night. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned the importance of science being able to ask questions and where there's debate, have debate around the science as opposed to newspapers attacking individuals. Have I quoted you correctly there or summarised your comments? Yeah, I think that's a, a reasonable summary. Yeah. Sure. Um, do the press have a role to support an alternate point of view when institutions such as universities don't seem to support their own academics to put forward an alternate point of view to the established science? So, you know, with respect to science, um, you know, it isn't individual academic institutions that really litigate that. Um, it's uh, authoritative bodies here in the United States, the US National Academy of Sciences. In Australia, you have the Australian Academy of Science, uh, the Royal Society in the UK. These bodies uh, exist um, so that um, there is a formal way of uh, sort of litigating our, our you know, understanding of issues, you know, of, of policy relevant uh, scientific issues like climate change. And in the case of climate change, all of these authoritative bodies um, around the world, uh, every scientific society in the United States, um, um, every uh, national academy um, in the world that has weighed in on the uh, science of climate change has weighed in that climate change is real. It's human caused and it already presents risks. So those are the facts and there really isn't room for alternative facts in, in, in the sense of um, a body of opinion that rejects what I just said. In the same sense that, you know, we accept that the, the, the earth is round, that gravity is real. These are accepted scientific propositions. And, you know, I suppose that somebody could complain that they're being censored. Um, some, some scientist who insists that gravity um, isn't real, that the earth is flat, um, might indeed insist that their views are being censored. But in fact, they're, they're only being censored in the sense that this has been litigated by the scientific community. And what they're claiming is at fundamental odds with the community and it violates the very premise, you know, the very notion of skepticism, right? Skepticism is a good thing in science, but the indiscriminate rejection 
of overwhelming evidence based on the flimsiest of arguments it isn't skepticism, that's contrarianism or denial, and it doesn't really have a rightful place in scientific discourse. Sure, but your, your argument would say that Copernicus and Galileo, to use your example of the flat earth, you know, they won the day, well, particularly Galileo, because he presented facts and people weren't able to uh, prove him wrong in these ensuing discussions, and so over time, you know, science has now accepted that the earth is round because the facts are there. Whereas if they had shut him down without looking to actually explore the facts, then perhaps that change in scientific view wouldn't have happened. So I guess well, my concern well, is an interesting example because, of course, he was subject to the Roman Inquisition. Um, in fact, the Catholic Church <laughs> did attempt to, in a sense, silence him because his scientific findings conflicted with a powerful vested interest. And that vested interest was the Catholic Church. Today, the vested interest we're talking about is the fossil fuel industry and those who promote its interests like the Murdoch media. Sure. But you're probably aware here in Australia, we have examples of academics, well-credentialed academics who've worked in the scientific field, and I'm referring here to Professor Ridd, formerly of the James Cook University, and whether or not you agree with his position, what you've put forward, which I think all scientists would agree with, is if somebody has a concern or a set of facts that they wish to publish that challenges the status quo, then surely the answer to that is to engage fact with fact and a balanced, open debate to prove or disprove points of view, as opposed to, in James Cook University's case, using a code of conduct to silence him. And so there's been one court case in his favour, one against him, not based on his science, but based on a code of conduct. You might be aware it's now before our High Court, so perhaps we shouldn't discuss it too much more. But yes, no, I'm not familiar with, with that example. Um, what, what I would say is that, you know, uh, again, the way science is litigated is through the peer reviewed uh, literature, is through assessments by authoritative bodies like the Australian Academy of Science or the National Academy of Sciences here in the United States. So that's how science um, is rightfully litigated. And if you have credible arguments to make, you'll be able to to publish them in the in the peer-reviewed literature. I mean, that's the way the scientific process works. Um, if you can publish your findings in the literature um, and, you know, they are not contested, then ultimately they become part of the sort of corpus of scientific understanding. And that's how science evolves and advances. Um, Indeed. My, my question, though, is goes back to the media and that we have a number of media outlets here who will um, almost exclusively publish the established view um, among many in the community around climate change. Uh, you're criticising News Corp because they support, and you can you can test in many cases, it's unqualified or unsubstantiated fact, but they've also been very supportive of Professor Ridd. Uh, and because of their- noise support, I can't hear. Sorry, there was some noise. Sure. I guess I'm coming to the fact that does the media have a view to support, or does the media have a role to support scientists who are seeking to get their facts debated as opposed to being shut down by internal processes within university? And I can't speak to the, the specific case that you're talking about with James Cook University. What I can tell you is that, you know, what, what the media should report, of course, what an objective uh, media outlet should report is the mainstream scientific understanding on climate change. If a media outlet is claiming that climate change isn't real or isn't a problem or had no role um, in, for example, the, the disastrous uh, bushfires of the Black Summer, um, if a media outlet is making those claims, they are making claims that don't just, it's not just about one study or two studies, it's about the, the consensus of the world scientists. It's about the consensus of authoritative uh, scientific bodies. And so if you're, if you continue to publish articles that the earth is flat and gap, gravity uh, doesn't exist, then you are doing a disservice to your readership. And I think um, you, uh, if there is a motive in, in doing that, um, if you're doing so to advance a political agenda, then I think it is uh, appropriate for this body to think about uh, rules that do require objectivity, that do um, 
provide sanctions for uh, media outlets that knowingly uh, present false information to the public. I think that is an appropriate matter uh, for this body to consider. Um, I don't, I can't tell you what the form of that would be. I know um, I was asked that question previously. I'm just a scientist. Um, but, um, but I do think it's, it's important to consider um, the, the role that this body might have in that regard. Thank okay, no further questions. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Uh, Senator Rennick, are you on the line? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, uh, I can. Profe Professor, uh, Senator Rennick is over the telephone, so you won't see him, but um, the floor is yours, Senator Rennick. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Mann, my question is, you talk about a scientific consensus, so my question is, what are the facts? And I just want to refer to two energy budgets I had here in front of me. One was given to me by the CSIRO that had a downwelling radiation from greenhouse gases of 333 watts per square metre and one um, from the Australian Academy of Science that had a downwelling radiation from greenhouse gases of 342 watts per square metre. So there's a difference in downwelling radiation between the two uh, scientific institutions or what they claim to be in their energy budgets of nine watts per square metre. Now, the IPPC, IPCC has claimed that the increase in radiative forcing from carbon dioxide has increased by two watts per square metre since 1750, uh, regardless of cause. So given that the two scientific bodies have a difference of nine watts per square metre, that's over 400% uh, of what... Um, the IPCC is claiming to uh, in the increase in carbon dioxide. How, why is it that we can't question facts like that? So, you know, it, what, you're citing some figures. I would have to look at them and, and put them in context and, and make sure that what you're uh, describing um, is, is correct. But uh, it's actually irrelevant because you're talking about um, t some large absolute numbers, uh, what we're dealing with um, is the difference between these numbers. And in many, in, 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 in a very real sense, it's actually easier to measure those differences. It's why we talk about temperature changes in terms of uh, temperature anomalies. We don't report the actual temperature of the earth because that depends on baselines. Different elevations are going to have different temperatures. So we, we measure differences, and we can often measure differences very accurately. So, for example, with respect to the energy budget, we can measure the heating of the oceans. That is the best integrator that there is of the imbalance between the incoming um, radiation and the outwelling radiation. And we actually reported uh, on some recent findings uh, about ocean heat content uh, just last year. Um, the oceans, uh, we have measured the, the highest heat content ever in the global oceans, two years consecutively. And the, the heat, the increase in that heat content is consistent, is entirely consistent with the estimated influence of the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations from fossil fuel burning. But wouldn't you have to accept that if we are to benchmark uh, human uh, performance in, in, in reducing carbon dioxide and the, in, and the alleged impacts of it on heating the Earth's temperature, that we need our scientific body to be able to record the downwelling radiation from greenhouse gases consistently and accurately? Oh, I mean, every, every group is, is you know, uh, that analyzes these data is doing its best job to um, estimate these numbers um, accurately and, and objectively. And I would, again, I would have to look at the context of what you're describing. I can't accept it at face value. What I can tell you is that we have data that actually does that integration for us. Um, the ocean heat content is the best data that we have to measure the heat imbalance in the global climate system. And, and, and those measurements tell us you know, they, they validate the climate model simulations. They validate our basic understanding of the impact of increased greenhouse gas concentrations from fossil fuel burning. So, you know, I don't think there are any uh, glaring inconsistencies, but it's easy to, you know, point to one paper or another and without 
putting it in proper context, it's very difficult um, to, to discuss what that may or may not mean. What I'm telling you is that we have very reliable data that we can use to measure the heat imbalance, and it's exactly as we expect it to be. So when you measure that data, that's in regard to radiative heat. Uh, in regards to a vex, uh, convection, are you saying that the second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply to heat generated from carbon dioxide? I don't know how you might have deduced that um, statement from what you said. Um, what I'm saying is that you're citing numbers that I haven't been able to vet, I haven't been able to validate, I haven't been able to put them in context. So I'm not going to comment on them because I, I'm not convinced that they're correct or meaningful. Oh. What I can tell you is that what you're interested in is the bottom line, and that's what we care about here, the warming of the planet due to fossil fuel burning. Um, then I'm telling you that we have very robust data that tell us that the planet is warming up as we expect it to. So you were saying you're not familiar with the IPCC paper AR5 that was released in 2014. You referred to two that. different reports and two different estimates, and I don't and, and know I what page reported, of what yes. report that that might be or what the what the footnotes might be or what the error bars okay. might be. So, so I have no have to, context can to I, evaluate sorry, what Senator you about. Senator Rennick, yes. if I could, uh, just as chair, we'll just bring you back to the terms of reference of this inquiry. Um, and I think the witness has said that um, uh, they would have to, uh, the professor would have to uh, uh, understand what these reports are that you're referring to. I think that's a fairly reasonable um, request. And um, okay, so, so we're not I'll, we're not here to argue. We're here to ask for expert opinions. So. Okay, and, and I am. So I'll, I won't refer to the CSIRO report or the Australian Academy of Science report. Are you saying you're not familiar with the IPCC report? that says that the amount of radiative forcing has increased by two watts per square metre since 1750. You're not prepared to I, I didn't, those numbers? No, I, I didn't say, and again, I don't have the IPCC report in front of me, so I don't know exactly what number they specify, but um, what you described, it is consistent with our basic understanding. The increase in CO2 concentrations from fossil fuel uh, burning thus far amounts to a forcing of a little more than two watts per meter squared. Um, so that number that you cited does um, comport with um, uh, you know, the, the, the basic physics of the greenhouse effect. Uh, I can't tell you what the exact number is that is reported by the most recent IPCC report and what the error bars or uncertainties are without looking at that page of the report. I wish I have committed the entire several thousand pages of the IPCC reports to memory, but my memory isn't that good, and so I do actually have to, to look those figures up. Okay. Um, uh, Senator Rennick, um, we'll uh, need to leave it there. Uh, <laughs> Professor Mann, um, uh, I'd just like a question on notice, if I could, and that would be, you've referred to the uh, 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 the disinformation, the fake news uh, that's promoted by uh, the Murdoch press in relation to climate science and uh, climate action. I'd like perhaps if you could take it on notice, um, the impact of uh, uh, how that fake news is then promoted and shared on other platforms such as Facebook. Uh, we've got Facebook coming up next. Uh, and, and I just wonder, um, I, I understand you've, you know, I've read a few articles uh, that you've written and, uh, and yeah. uh, participated in. And uh, one, you say, it's frustrating to see scientists being blamed. We've been fighting the most well-funded PR campaign in human history. Um, uh, just on reflection, perhaps uh, being asked questions uh, that continue to uh, promote that disinformation uh, uh, it just must be a, a continuation <laughs> of that frustration for you. A, a little bit, uh, I, I would have to say. Um, but um, yeah, you know, it's as, as a scientist, um, you know, I I came into science, into the field of science, because I love solving problems. I love crunching numbers. Um, I would have been perfectly happy to have been left alone in the laboratory 
doing what I love doing. Uh, but when we published the hockey stick curve and suddenly I was attacked um, and, and but there were efforts to discredit me as a person and to vilify me, that sort of pushed me into the public sphere. It wasn't really a voluntary effort on my part. Um, but ultimately I have come to embrace that opportunity to inform this very important conversation. So it's not what I signed up for. It wasn't what I thought I was doing when I double majored in applied math and physics as an undergraduate. <laughs> but I can think of no, um, you know, uh, I feel privileged to be in a position to influence this conversation and to try to make sure that it is informed by scientific facts. And yeah, I get frustrated when, you know, I'm, I find myself in a, in a situation where, um, where, where falsehoods are being promoted and sometimes for an ideological uh, reason to promote an ideological or political agenda. I, I, I can't, I won't lie to you, that is frustrating. Um, but, uh, you know, all we can do is, is to continue to push on and to hope that, you know, that we do arrive at a, you know, at a point of better faith in our public discourse um, where we can, we can honestly debate the policies because there's an honest debate to be had about policies. But let's not debate the facts, the facts as spoken to by the world scientists. I hope we can find a way to ensure that our political debates about climate policy are informed by objective information. And as a scientist, I continue to work hard to try to make that a reality. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, again, knowing it's very late over there in the, uh, in, in the US. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. I now welcome representatives of Facebook, and I'm just checking that we've got them on the line. Wonderful. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full names and the capacities in which you appear today? I'm happy to go first, Chair. Uh, my name is Mia Garlick and I'm the Director of Policy for Facebook across Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair. I'm Simon Milner. I'm Vice President for Public Policy for Facebook in the Asia Pacific region, based in Singapore. Wonderful. Uh, now I invite you, we've got your uh, submission um, uh, before us, uh, but I invite you to give us a short opening statement and then we'll go to some questions. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we do have a short opening statement prepared and, and at the outset I wanted to thank you and the committee for the opportunity to appear before you today and answer your questions. Um, I think we all recognise that media diversity and plurality are very important public policy goals and that there are a number of factors that can contribute to the diversity of um, Australia's media ecosystem. Um, I think we can all see as well that the committee has some very wide ranging terms of reference, but we note that there is um, a, a request in there to consider the impact of online global platforms on the media industry and the sharing of news in Australia. And so we do welcome the opportunity to share information with the committee about um, Facebook and our services and our relationship with Australian news publishers. But we, we do recognise that there's also a lot of other digital services uh, on which Australians share news or access news, and that includes Google, Twitter, Apple News, Microsoft and TikTok. And those are all very different services for the committee to, to consider separately. But with respect to Facebook, um, you know, we are primarily a service that Australians use to connect with friends and family, to engage in community groups that they're passionate about and to follow papers that they're interested in. News is not the primary reason people come to Facebook and news is also highly substitutable on our services. Um, when there is less news on Facebook, people engage with other content and the revenue that we generate from news is virtually zero. Uh, in addition to news only being a small part of people's experience on Facebook, all evidence indicates that Facebook does not play a significant role in the ability of Australians to access news. Um, even the assessment of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, in its 2019 digital platforms inquiry, found that we were responsible for at most 18% of news referrals 
and other independent experts have um, put that figure at closer to 10%. And I'm sure there's a lot of debate that can be had around market definition here and you know, happy to go into that um, during questions if that's helpful. But even if you accept the ACCC's highest figure of 18%, um, that's still not a dominant share. And certainly since 2019, when that conclusion was reached, there's been um, significant developments in the market, such as the rise of news aggregator sites, such as Apple News and new entrants such as TikTok. Um, even as Australians may access news across an increasingly diverse range of digital platforms and also connect directly with publishers, the broader challenges facing the Australian news industry have existed since the commercial phase of the internet began and newspaper circulation began to decline in the 1990s. And this has been documented in government reports and also in the speeches of news media executives since before Facebook and any meaningful popularity in Australia or even offered ad products. And these challenges stem from tectonic changes in technology and consumer behaviour. There's now increased choice um, for consumers in how to access news and information, which drives up competition for time and attention. Uh, at the same time, there's been decreasing ad costs and there's also been the diversion of classified revenues from newspapers to pure play sites such as Domain and realestate.com.au. So these are all broad structural trends that have combined to strain the sustainability of journalism in Australia. Despite our limited role in the news ecosystem and our limited broader role in the mega trends that have caused uh, challenges um, to journalism, we have been working to deliver value to Australian publishers and making investments in the Australian news ecosystem for many years. And we do this because we understand the importance of news in society, although we cannot do this on completely uneconomic terms that misunderstand the nature of the value exchange uh, between Facebook and publishers. And, and just to conclude the opening remarks, I might just um, talk through uh, some of those value points um, before uh, opening up to questions. Um, firstly, uh, last year, Facebook delivered approximately 5.1 billion free referral to Australian publishers worth an estimated $407 million. Last year as well, uh, publishers were able to generate Four, sorry, 5.4 million from our revenue share program, such as our in-stream video advertising. And over the last three years, we've uh, invested tens of millions of dollars in content and programs for Australian publishers. Last year as well, we also paid out uh, $1.5 million in bringing together um, 11 regional and smaller publishers with industry experts from around the globe to develop strategies um, to encourage reader subscriptions and donations. And we funded projects to support those innovations. And then to support um, uh, newsrooms that were impacted by the pandemic, uh, last year we provided um, $11 million um, to support regional uh, and community newsrooms that were financially impacted by the pandemic and worked in collaboration with the Walkley Foundation to distribute those funds. So um, that's an overview um, from our perspective. And we understand that the committee has expressed concern in previous hearings about the news media bargaining legislation and our initial response to that law and the impact on smaller publishers. Um, and I want to um, reaffirm that our current focus is on concluding deals, um, uh, commercial deals with a range of Australian publishers, and that we're also planning to launch an initiative uh, in the coming months to support smaller regional and public interest publishers. And so with that, I'll, um, I'll end and um, we look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Um, I might go first to Senator Fawcett. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, come to you. In terms of media diversity, I actually wanted to focus in on an area that um, social media writ large has has been um, fingered on, and that's around echo chambers. And clearly, whether it's Google or Facebook and the algorithms that are used to uh, target information to people in advertising or friend connections, etc., the assertion is that it's also used such that a person will be fed uh, news stories that line up with the searches they've previously done. Uh, from an industry perspective, do you think that's a valid criticism? And what can an organisation like Facebook do to try and make sure that somebody who's searching on a particular topic, uh, unlike when you try and sell them a product, actually gets a diversity of views on that topic so they realise that people of goodwill and intellect and character can hold different views on a given topic. 
I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that one first and then throw to my colleague, uh, Mr Milner, in case he has any other questions. Um, I think, uh, and this is again where um, so the services are all different, and so I do encourage you to consult with some of the other services um, to better understand how some of these concerns relate to their um, their platforms. Um, in terms of a lot of the evidence base that um, we've seen that often um, the, the nature of information sharing on Facebook um, is actually through weak ties and that people tend to stay in contact with a diverse range of friends and family um, and are therefore exposed to a diverse range of views. Um, and certainly um, to the extent that we've been concerned about um, particular um, types of content um, that might be recommended, we have taken uh, interventions to reduce um, some suggestions in relation to um, related topics. But um, Simon, I'm not sure if you have anything more you want to add on that one. Uh, hello, Senator. Yes, thank you very much, um, uh, Mia. Um, I, I think you've you've covered it well. I mean, the key thing is that people don't typically search for news on Facebook. It's not uh, it's not how people uh, come across news. It's more likely that it will come they'll come across it either because they have liked a particular news publisher's page and therefore they will see some of their posts or their friends, family. Uh, as you say, it could be somebody who's uh, kind of they're not necessarily connected with recently will share. Um, uh, some news with them and depending on the size of your friendship group on Facebook and uh, that could have a marked impact on the range of different news publishers that you will uh, hear from. Um, I'll just give you a little snippet of some of the difficulties here of trying to address this issue. Um, there was a period when we tried to see what happens if you share with people. Say people are interested in, and you just had uh, Professor Mann on, people are interested in climate change. If you shared uh, with, with people uh, an alternative perspective, would that help to uh, in better inform their views? Um, and what we found is that actually, contrary to what you might expect, if you share, if somebody say is a strong, uh, climate change activist and you share with them something which might be uh, kind of casting doubt on some of the research, uh, a, they will either not engage with it, so they simply just won't read it, uh, but also will reinforce their own views. Um, and so it's not as simple as just giving people a, a range of different types of uh, information. There are other things we need to do to address this. And it's one of the reasons why, um, particularly on the issue of misinformation, which I know is a separate issue, uh, why we work with third parties who are experts in this to try to figure out how can you best address this in a way in which people will actually engage and it might well make them better informed. Uh, it's a really tricky issue and we're always open to suggestions about how, how better to try and tackle it. Sure, so I notice your submission refers to some research done by uh, Professor Axel Bruns, I think it is, um, an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. And you know, he essentially says that the influence of echo chambers and filter bubbles has been severely overstated. Uh, and rests on a small number of studies and limited research. Uh, are you funding research to expand that evidence base to either say it's not a problem or <clears throat> given the unique features of your platform, uh, here are ways that we can seek to engage with people and make sure that they are aware of a range of views. So I can answer that at a, at a global level, and then uh, Mia may have things to add in terms of Australia. The answer is yes, we are doing, uh, you know, we, we work with uh, researchers. We, we have both a, a, a big in-house uh, research team, and for instance, one of the issues they've been looking at, um, uh, particularly with respect to the US, is polarization, and trying to really understand the phenomenon of polarization and, and how it actually kind of inter the, the polarization in America and how it plays out on, on a platform like uh, Facebook and, and how you can try and understand it and then try to address it. Um, uh, but then we also work with um, you know, a range of researchers in the academic community as well. Now it's tricky because of course what researchers really want is access to data uh, and, and you know, especially um, you know, uh, you know, because of the rise in understanding about the consequences of, uh, of uh, privacy challenges, uh, we, we, it's really quite hard uh, to enable that, but nonetheless we seek to do that and we've particularly done it in, in the area of elections. Uh, so we've set up a whole research program uh, working with external researchers around the issue and we're happy to share more information with you on notice uh, about that program after after the hearing. Do you want to add anything with respect to Australia, Mia? 
Uh, no, certainly um, we fund a, a number of research initiatives to better understand um, important issues, um, particularly around fake news and misinformation as well. And so recently funded Dr. Andrea Carson from La Trobe University uh, on a study in relation to that and have committed to do that um, uh, also as part of our um, signing up to the disinformation code. And um, we can probably also share Senator an, uh, uh, an op-ed from um, our Vice President of of um, uh, global uh, affairs uh, on the issues relating to organisation in relation to our services. Sure. So <clears throat> you've referenced a number of studies, particularly uh, Mr Milner in the US, into polarisation of views. Uh, are those studies public? Uh, are they publicly available? Because if, if governments are to have evidence-based policy, if we're to work with industry, to, as necessary, bring in levers and things to, to help for the, the broader democratic good of, of plural democracies, getting balanced views, then our policies have to be informed by evidence. So I'm interested to know if, if the studies that you're funding are being published or if they're available to governments uh, and particularly published so that the public understand why some legislative measures may come in. Uh, but more particularly, uh, you, you mentioned the fact that <clears throat> sometimes you can't publish because it's based on data. <clears throat> the reality is, as, as I understand the world of companies like Facebook, you know, the monetization, <clears throat> your ability to actually operate as a business is all about analyzing data and connections. Uh, and therefore, even if you can't release the specifics of data, surely you are able to analyze what makes money, how people respond to connections and information and feeds and shared stories and things. Therefore, you should be able to also understand how you can engage them to look at different points of view. And that surely is a public good that should be as much of a priority for a company like Facebook as the profit side. Thank you, Senator. Yes, I can confirm there are several uh, studies that have been published and we can provide information on notice to the committee about those. Some of them involving uh, Facebook and some involving other uh, you know, social media platforms. Uh, so happy to provide more information as a follow up to, to the hearing. Uh, thank you, Senator Fawcett. If, if there's time, we can come back to you, but I'll just share it around because there's a few senators uh, who have questions for this witness. Uh, Senator Carr. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Miller and uh, Ms Garlick, the Australian Government refers to the news media bargaining code as a world first, both in terms of policy and in terms of regulatory, uh, in regulatory terms. But I also understand that Facebook's decision to prevent the sharing and viewing of news in Australia earlier this year was also something of a world's first. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. We've never taken that action anywhere else before. Now, I've read your statement that you put out at the time, uh, which was um, entitled The Real Story of What Happened uh, with News. Uh, I'm just wondering what signals or undertakings did the Treasurer or Minister give Facebook to address Facebook's concerns with the proposed code? That is, that led you to lift the, uh, the uh, news block. I think it best if uh, Ms. Garlick takes that question just to explain the changes that were made in, in the law uh, yeah. that uh, reassured us that we're able to do that. Uh, certainly, Senator. So um, I, we were able to, I mean, I think the, you know, the law is passed with resounding bipartisan support uh, through the parliament. Um, uh, it was th through the House and um, and then there were some changes that were made uh, in the Senate, which uh, we feel give us um, the flexibility to conclude genuine commercial deals with publishers. We were experiencing um, challenges in being able to do that um, prior uh, to from greater flexibility being introduced into the law. And so some of the changes relate to um, uh, you know, uh, looking at the level of investment that we make into the news ecosystem, which you know is a strong uh, incentive for us to invest and for us to make sure that we're um, concluding genuine commercial deals with publishers, um, as well as ensuring that we're provided with notice if we're designated under the law uh, and and um, and related changes. Are there any other matters you want to draw attention to? 
Um, no, not at this stage, but I'm happy to answer your questions. All right. Well, let me try to um, see what I can do in that regard. The, uh, let's just deal, first of all, you say that the government uh, ignored the indications that Facebook had put to the government some six months earlier. What were those indications that Facebook had put to the government? Um, Senator, uh, these were the public comments that we had made um, both in August um, 2020, um, after we saw the first draft of the law in July, we issued a public um, uh, newsroom post that outlined our concerns with the law and indicated what um, what we would reluctantly feel that we would have to do if the law proceeded in its current form. And then um, my colleague, Mr Milner, and uh, my other colleague, um, Josh Machen, appeared before a Senate committee in January 2021 and again um, advised the parliament and um, and also the public about our concerns. So, and, um, and I see. So you, you, you were concerned to make sure the government understood that you weren't bluffing in when it came to those threats? Senator, I think the, the more important aspect of our communications was to ensure um, that you know all members of this conversation and particularly publishers understood so that they could prepare in the event that we would have to remove news. That's what I mean. You weren't bluffing. That's the whole point of that, isn't it? Those, those, that media advice was that you were, try, you were trying to demonstrate to the government that you weren't bluffing? Well, I think, Senator, that's your characterisation. Mm. We were certainly trying to make clear um, the steps that we would reluctantly have to take. Well, if I look at the subsection 52E3B of the Treasury Laws Amendment, the News Media and Digital Platform Mandatory Bargaining Code, uh, it provides that in determining whether a designated digital platform for the purpose of news media bargaining code, the minister must consider, quote, whether the group has made a significant contribution to the sustainability of Australian news media through agreements relating to news content of Australian news businesses, including agreements to remunerate those businesses for their news content. So what's your understanding of what that contribution needs to demonstrate in the Australian market in order to avoid being a designate, well, being designated under the code? Well, I think we certainly understand that, um, you know, it's a clear signal from the government and the parliament that there um, is a strong desire for um, digital platforms such as ourselves to um, invest in the, in the market. And so that's what we're, um, you know, we have been doing that for a number of years and that's what we're very much focused on right now. So we have two goals at present. One is to conclude deals that will allow us to bring Facebook news um, yeah. to Australia in the latter half of this year. And the second is to make sure that we are launching initiatives that can support smaller regional All right. and well, public interest. For the Hansard so, record, can you indicate to the committee what sort of number of or the quantum of deals in, in what time frames are necessary to avoid designation? Um, so at present on the record, um, uh, I think it's been disclosed that we've um, concluded um, either letters of intent or long form agreements with at least six publishers. So that's um, Channel 7, News Limited, um, Schwartz Media, Private Media, Solstice and Sky News. And we're in active conversations with um, a number of other publishers and also looking at what more we can do to support smaller regional and public interest publishers. So can you tell me what, uh, what's the sort of scope of the payments made under those agreements? Um, I don't think we're able to disclose those. Uh, those are commercial in confidence. Yes. Um, not even the broad scope of them? Uh, no, I mean, historically we've paid tens of millions of dollars um, to, to publishers and, and, you know, these deals that we're concluding at present are three-year deals um, so that we can be um, committed to our investment, you know, for, for a sort of short to medium term um, uh, to make sure that we are contributing to the Australian news ecosystem. So that's aggregate of tens of millions for across all the six publishers, is it? Uh, yes, Senator. Thank you. And when uh, we talk about designation, what would be the consequence if Facebook was designated? Would Facebook immediately block news in Australia or would Facebook actually proceed to arbitration under the code? Well, Senator, it's hard to talk in hypotheticals. Our, you know, our focus and our goal and our reason for trying to ensure that there was flexibility um, within the legislation was to ensure that we can prioritise commercial deals and investment in Australia, and that's our current focus. Yes, but so then is it more of a big stick or is it a threat of regulation that 
actually concerns you here? Um, I think the, the concerns that we've um, had about the, the legislation is that it wasn't fairly describing or reflecting the value exchange between ourselves and publishers. And so certainly, um, you know, what we're trying to do is make sure that we're working uh, with partners to conclude deals that make sense for their business and for the product suite that we offer. Um, and so, you know, that's the sort of primary focus. I'm not sure, um, Simon, if you've got anything more you want to add here. I'm happy to, if you'd like me to send it. I mean, I, I guess the key the key thing to emphasize is we're now in the active process of agreeing commercial deals that we were keen to uh, get get to last year. Um, because of the legislative process, we had to essentially pause or pause that, and we were not able to conclude. And we kept on talking, but we were unable to conclude those commercial deals. And we think a commercially arrived at set of arrangements that uh, enables us to work with and support um, uh, publishers is preferable to legislated or regulated uh, arrangements. Uh, and we are therefore hopeful that we will not get to a place where um, uh, the government decides that it wants instead to move from a commercial arrangements to regulated ones. Um, and uh, but if, if that happens, then obviously, uh, like others, we'll have to review the situation, decide what to do. Well, I mean, I think it'd be fair to say that a significant proportion of Australians access online news over social media. What can you tell the committee about what Facebook has learnt about its role in supporting media diversity in Australia as a result of the news block that you initiated in February of this year? I mean, just to talk in broad and actually, it is not the case that a significant number of Australians, uh, or indeed people on Facebook, use our service to yeah. uh, to look for news or to consume news. Only around four percent of the content in people's news feed, and maybe it's just the yeah. fact it's called news feed suggests it's full of news. It's not. Um, uh, it's predominantly content that comes from friends, family, causes, organisations, small businesses, all kinds of other places of that, that news, uh, that, the, that the, the stories in your news feed come from. Actually, a, a very small proportion is news. If that was the case, members. why are you paying tens of millions of dollars? Because we're not paying money for content in news feed. What we're seeking to do is to launch a new product, uh, a product that was first launched in the US, uh, recently launched in the UK, and we were keen actually for Australia to get it second, but we couldn't we couldn't do that, and that's called Facebook News. I see. So we're not paying for news in Newsfeed. What we are looking mm. to do is to create a new product which will aggregate news, and we well, hope that, that will be attractive second, for a significant so number of it, Australians. Am I clear? I'll just be clear about this. So you're, you're trying to suggest to this committee that you don't acknowledge that restricting the sharing of news in Australia would undermine media diversity in this country. Is that the proposition you're trying to advance in this committee? Uh, just, just to be clear, we, uh, I think these are different, different issues, uh, Senator. Um, the actions we took in response to the legislation which passed the House um, was in order to uh, limit what we saw as uncapped, uh, unknowable uh, liabilities for our company uh, because of the way that legislation was framed at the time. Uh, and that's why we acted on it, not because we were trying to influence media diversity in Australia. Oh, that it, wasn't the purpose of the actions we it, took. It was an action designed to bully legislators, wasn't it? It's to intimidate the it was, government. It was Absolutely to not. Uh, well, just to be sorry, Senator, go ahead. Well, hang on. The legislation passed the House of Representatives. You didn't like it. And then so you pulled out of sharing uh, news and other services in Australia, which you've already acknowledged was unprecedented anywhere else in the world. And you're saying you did that uh, just to give people uh, knowledge of, of what your power is? It sounds like bullying to me. Actually, I didn't say that that's the reason we did it. Uh, I, well, as well, I explained well, well, what is the reason? Because you're not being clear. I, I beg to differ. I think we've been extremely clear. We were clear in August of 2020 when we explained the consequences of this legislation, which fundamentally misunderstood how news works on Facebook, was to create an uncapped and unknowable liability for the company. And as with any company faced with that situation, 
is the right thing to do uh, is to determine what actions can we take to try and reduce why, this risk why did you this risk of uncapped what? and unknowable but, liabilities but mr miller is it not the impact of what you did was to try to intimidate the parliament absolutely not <laughs> our understanding was at the time that this legislation which had passed the house was not going to be changed uh, and therefore we did not expect uh, the, the what happened in the following few days when the government said to us oh um, well let's look at this and see if there's some things we can do uh, look, for this legislation to address your concerns it, we did not expect it, that it doesn't really pass because the pub test to suggest that uh, you didn't wait then for the legislation to pass the parliament in totality <laughs> It doesn't make any well, sense. Chair, if I could just, well, Chair, if I could just add to that, part of the reason, you know, when it resoundingly passed the House um, with bipartisan support, and it was clear from all parties that there would be no amendments made, um, at the time, uh, consistent throughout the entire process that we've been engaged in the legislative process, we all, were also engaged in active commercial conversations with Australian publishers because we remained optimistic that we could have a workable version of the code land and continue to bring investment to Australia. Wow. And we felt it was completely disingenuous for us to continue those conversations um, through, you know, throughout the week when it was um, all indications were that there would be no amendments made. Uh, and so that's the reason for having done it when it passed the House. OK, well, Ms Scarlett, it might be completely disingenuous for you to suggest that this wasn't an attempt to intimidate certainly the Senate. Uh, and that's why you actually undertook the actions that you took. Because I just go through the impact of what you did. Was it not the case? that your actions actually had a major impact on small and independent pu publishers and, in fact, a disproportionate impact on those publishers? Um, Senator, so first of all, I, I mean, we're going to have to very much disagree on your characterisation of our actions, but with respect that's to... That's fair enough. You can do that, publishers. but that's, that's the whole point of these conversations. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's, I'm not... But just to get to your point about yeah. the smaller publishers, yes. that is an unfortunate... Um, feature of the law and again something that we did try to raise during our consultations yes. on the law and um, the impact on smaller publishers because of the non differentiate first of all there's a very broad definition of what is news and, content under the legislation okay. and, and secondly there's a non differentiation clause that essentially says one out all out and, and that's the and it also had a was significant impact on younger consumers of news uh, in fact, disproportionate impact for younger consumers of news. Would that be also a fair characterisation of your actions? I don't have any data points to suggest I that. So. And it certainly had an impact on those people using emergency services, which were automatically blanketed by your actions. There were certainly errors in our enforcement for which we're truly sorry and we worked really swiftly um, particularly with a lot of the emergency service um, stakeholders that we I have long-standing relationships with to restore their pages uh, as soon as we could okay so what is the value does facebook ascribe to its platform when it comes to demonstrating like in terms of the act significant contribution to sustainability of australian news industry for the purposes of section 52e3 subclause b What's the value you subscribe, you subscribe to? Perhaps I could come in on that, Neil, is that OK? Look, yeah. I, I think the answer is we don't know. Um, it's, not, it's not prescribed in the legislation. Um, uh, and, therefore, but, uh, and therefore, but nonetheless, we're continuing to act in good faith in our negotiations with uh, a number of news organisations, some of which have already uh, our deals have been announced that we've reached agreement uh, and we will proceed uh, to launch our Facebook news product later this year. And we are hopeful, and we can't be certain, but we're hopeful that the government will recognise that that's a, a significant investment in the sustainability of Australian journalism. So you're relying on the government to acknowledge your view. Is that what's happening? Well, that's how the legislation is framed. I see. Well, it's fair enough. Okay, that's how you see it. Right. Now, you've mentioned there have been six publishers. They're all large publishers. Uh, how many... Uh, is there a sort of standard deal that's offered to smaller publishers? How does that work with regard to smaller publishers? Um, well, the, the types of deal structures that we have or the support that we provide that differs depending on the publisher and their business model and the audience that they're trying to seek. Um, you know, some of the publishers we're currently talking to either don't use Facebook or only use it to share PDFs, which is not practice. And so in those instances, some of our programmatic support may be more helpful to assist them in sort of, you know, um, 
digitizing and, and strategizing for other ways to connect with audiences. So is it your intention to try to negotiate deals with all publishers, uh, all those, for instance, registered by the ACMA? I think, I mean, this has been one of the challenges um, with the um, legislation. You know, it's, it's sort of been unclear um, how many publishers uh, are potentially under the law. So, you know, the, the explanatory memorandum mentioned anywhere between 100 to 200. Um, you know, we've typically been engaging with about 20 to, to 30 in the market, possibly more. Um, and so what we try to do is, you know, work with publishers um, where there's opportunities that where some of our product sets or mm. some of our program work, um, work for their business models and their audiences and we can have so I'll, um, come, value I'll come back to my previous question. Is it your intention to offer a standard agreement to smaller publishers or you're seeking to have separate individually negotiated agreements with uh, individual publishers, given there's so many of them, as you've indicated here? Yeah, we're certainly looking at an initiative where we could offer support for smaller regional and public interest publishers um, that you know can be worked in in partnership with independent experts who can sort of determine what the appropriate um, support is for those smaller publishers. But certainly, uh, it's harder to to think of sort of a standard offer process, and it's easier, or I mean, it's more time consuming, but it's more effective um, if we are sharing the goal of sustainable journalism for us to make sure that. Um, the support that we offer to the individualised needs of a publisher. So, so does that mean you are offering up uh, a standard agreement or not? Um, at this stage, we're not looking at a standard offer. We're looking more at an initiative that will provide support for individual publishers, um, consistent with um, specific projects that, or, um, or sort of. Thank you very they much. Might have. So you've said consistently, and you've said it here today, that you are more than happy to pay for news publishers for content. That's I've understood you correctly. That's that's the assertion you make. Facebook has. Just to be clear, what, what, what we're doing is uh, commercial deals associated with a new product called Facebook News. Yeah, that's right. Facebook new product has been launched, and and these are the commercial deals which publishers have announced, both in the United States and the United Kingdom. I'm wondering what is, is it necessary for the Australian, why is it necessary for the Australian government to pass the news media buying code or would Facebook have done these commercial deals without that legislation? Yes, and we made clear that uh, we were keen to move forward with Facebook news in Australia last year. And in fact, to be ahead there for the UK. Um, and, uh, and so this is not, we're not doing it because of the news bargaining legislation. I see. All right. Now, is it your assertion that the government's process uh, and the delay in passing the news media bargaining code, in fact, stifle innovation and investment in news media? Well, we certainly think it put a pause uh, on developments. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but you know, the, it, it could well be in the long run that those that year, six months, eight months, ten months didn't make a huge difference, but uh, you know, in terms of being able to move forward with these deals, and also if you think about the focus of our respective organisations, if we've been able to focus on doing commercial deals, which work for all parties uh, during the course of the last year, rather than seeking on both, both ourselves and the new publishers and, and other tech platforms yeah. seeking to influence legislation, yeah. then we could have got there more quickly. Okay, well, look, can you just clarify for me, because I know your submission was presented uh, earlier, it's in January 2021, 20, the um, page five, you say the Facebook had intended to bring Facebook news to Australia. Australia would have been the first jurisdiction outside the US to receive the product and its launch would have been bought millions of dollars of investment to Australian news industry. However, the uncertainty and the unworkability of the bill to date has meant that the Facebook news has been reprioritised for other countries, including the United Kingdom. So exactly where do we stand in regard to the Facebook news in Australia? And how many publishers do you expect will be, uh, that you intend to reach agreement with, um, say for instance, by the end of this year? I don't, let me give you a number in terms of uh, number of publishers, but you know, we're, we're making good progress. Um, as as uh, Ms. Garlick has explained in terms of some deals which have already been announced and others that are in the works. 
It's certainly our intention, Senator, to bring Facebook news to Australia by the end of 2021. Um, so that's the, the time frame that we're working toward. Thank you. And do you, what's, can you be, uh, give us any more detail as to what the impact has been in terms of the delay in the introduction of Facebook 21, given your statements that you put to this committee in your submission in January of this year? I suppose the, the thing we can say is, well, Facebook news is not yet available in Australia. That's the big difference. That's right. In terms of what, I mean, and therefore those commercial deals that we were hoping to have in place last year were not in place, and therefore no money was uh, going across to Australian publishers under those deals. And uh, as it happens, we still had some arrangements, as uh, Mia has explained, uh, other things we, we were doing, and we were still also providing an enormous numbers of uh, referral, uh, enormous amounts of referral traffic that was going across to those news publishers. So uh, news publishers were still very much benefiting uh, during the course of 2020 um, from their from putting their content onto Facebook and, and people linking across to their content, uh, but we were not able to secure the commercial deals that we're now, uh, that we're now doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, You've uh, mentioned many times today, also in your submission and in previous uh, uh, representations to different Senate committees, that news is not an important part of your service and has a nominal value to your business. But isn't it the f a fact that your whole model is designed to keep people on your platform? to be able to share news, uh, share information, purchase, uh, learn what's going on either inside in their local community or elsewhere. And you don't want people leaving your platform. You want people to spend as much time as they possibly can within Facebook. So are you arguing no, I then- I wouldn't characterise, sorry, Senator. I wouldn't characterise our, so our, that being our business model. Isn't that your model. business model? Uh, we won't. No, we want people. We want to create services which people value, and that they value spending uh, their time uh, with us. Uh, and we know in doing so, we're competing with lots of other things that they could be doing uh, at that time. But and, and particularly, we want it to be a place where people value their connection with other people that they know, with causes that they care about, with politicians that they they support. Uh, and, it, and it's a valuable use of people's time. So and in fact, people... we've taken several steps to actually uh, to address concerns around some people who might be spending too much time very passively. So one of the things we want is for people to be active uh, on Facebook because we know that when people are active, when they're posting comment, uh, content themselves, when they're commenting on others, when they're connecting with friends and family, those meaningful social interactions actually support people's well-being. So we've taken a number of steps over the last few years to specifically address any concern there might be about people, as it were, uh, I think the term is doom scrolling, just looking through and not really engaging mm. actively with content. Uh, that's not that's something we're seeking to address very directly. So if it is a uh, objective that you want people to value their time on Facebook, then therefore uh, doesn't having uh, public interest journalism and real news add to that value? Otherwise, it's just a platform for fake news and hatred, isn't it? Absolutely not. Actually, the thing that most people value is hearing about what's happening with their friends and family. And actually, particularly at a time when most of us can't travel uh, internationally and indeed within Australia, people can't see their friends and family as we've, we've known over the last year. Just being able to connect with people, understand what's going on in their lives is what people value most from Facebook. Now, some people also value news and the sharing of news, uh, but that's a, actually a, quite a small proportion of people. Actually, probably typically all the people who are on this call now, but, we are high consumers of news. Okay, much Mr. Than the Mr. Milner, Facebook user. Facebook has a reputation of being a platform where fake news is shared, promoted. And uh, if, 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 you, if you want to spread misinformation, you get on Facebook and you do it. Doesn't having real news and public interest journalism on your platform give your platform at least some credibility? There must be value in that. 
There is certainly value in, as we address the issue of misinformation, directing people to uh, credible news sources. Uh, when our third party fact checking partners have identified and labeled content as likely false, then we will direct people to uh, credible uh, news sources. And that can be from the fact checking organization themselves or from other organizations. But I, I really do, uh, you may say we have a reputation for being full of fake news. That's actually not borne out by the facts. And um, we can very much provide information to the committee on notice uh, with with uh, credible, independent third party academics. We Which demonstrate that actually there is not a lot of fake news on Facebook. Um, could I ask you uh, in relation to, you talk about misinformation, how you're dealing with uh, misinformation. Um, I want to ask you a specific um, question in relation to uh, pages that are set up. Now, we know uh, currently the AEC is investigating uh, Andrew Lamming's uh, use on Facebook. Now, I understand that he has operated uh, over 30 pages by logging on through his own account. Um, why isn't this captured by your transparency measures? Or is that a loophole that uh, people have been able to get around and you know you get to say you still have transparency but users who want to promote rubbish can do so without accountability? Um, I'm happy to share more information about how um, page pages work and, and how people can administer pages. I mean, certainly um, any person can administer a large number of pages if they wish to, um, but all of those pages do have to comply with our policies. So if they're administered by fake accounts, for example, when we remove the page accounts, then the pages will come down. Um, if the pages are uh, sharing other content that violates our policy, then we will also uh, remove those posts that violate our policies. And then, um, you know, if there are enough posts that are removed from a particular page, then the overarching page may come down. And then we also have teams that investigate um, whether our pages are being operated uh, in, a, in a coordinated way. And then we can do removals and takedowns based on um, the coordinated um, inauthentic uh, behaviour. So, so our policy still operates. So, so 30 pages being operated by one member of parliament. Does that raise any flags for Facebook? Why was that allowed to happen? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we apply our policies and um, try to make sure that we are, you know, em enforcing them um, to the extent of those policies. And then we also respond to requests from different regulators uh, when they have questions or concerns. Um, but I don't think that, you know, we necessarily look into, um, you know, whether a particular, uh, you know, person's profession is relevant to how they're administering a page. Certainly uh, one person can administer a number of pages. The question is whether the accounts are used to do that and the content that's being shared on that comply with our policies and applicable law. So there's no way that uh, Facebook's accountability, uh, uh, transparency measures have been able to capture the misuse of Facebook and the fake promotion of groups by members of parliament. Um, I mean, I feel like that's a very, um, uh, you know, um, sort of conclusory statement that, I mean, it's not clear to us, um, you know, we've been enforcing our policies consistently. Um, we're responding to requests from regulators. And so um, I'm not sure that we can sort of make a sort of a declaratory statement like that. Um, certainly um, from our uh, perspective, we've been um, actively enforcing our policies and providing transparency in that regard. Uh the AEC has asked for information about uh, Mr. Lamming's activities on your platform. Are you cooperating? Yes. Fully? Yes. And how many pages did Mr. Lamming uh, operate unbeknown to the public? Chair, um, the number of pages that any particular person administers is a question best directed to them. That's not something that we can disclose. Do you think there's a responsibility for Facebook if you, ha if you have transparency measures for politicians that this type of information in and of itself is part of those transparency measures? 
Well, to date, the transparency that people have sought in relation to um, politicians, I mean, obviously we've got general page transparency measures so that you can see when a page was created, you can see any page name changes, you can see um, how many admins there are and the countries in which they're located. So we have um, listened to feedback that there can be greater transparency around pages and provided that. With respect to political um, issues, uh, we tend to get um, feedback and there tends to be regulatory measures around political advertising. And so we've been rolling out a number of measures, including here in Australia, to ensure that there's tr transparency around political advertising. And that includes the ad library where you can go in and see political ads and, and see you know, that and other information of that nature. Mm. Uh but you know that uh, Andrew Lamming is a member of parliament, that he, had a, that he is a politician. Yes. Right? Uh, you know Facebook is, has all of the data and is aware of how many other pages he has established. You have all of that information, don't you? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I assume, yes. I mean, it's not something that we look at, no. Do you think that the public have a right to know? Um, well, in terms of um, transparency around page administrators, that hasn't been something that people have typically um, been requesting of us or that there has been public debate about. To date, that transparency around page administrators has been around um, the date it was created, any page name changes and where it's being administered from. And then in response to um, political issues, it's been um, a strong focus on political advertising. So that those have been the areas of mm -hmm. most concern from regulators and um, you know, community groups and academics to date, and that those have been the areas that we've focused on. Do you think that it, uh, not this information not being uh, transparent uh, is in good faith with the transparency measures that the public understands uh, who a politician is, what money they're spending on advertising, uh, uh, to, to be able to keep secret uh, the establishment of fake community pages, surely that's not in line with your transparency goals. So our transparency measures to date have been, you know, focused on both removals under our community standards enforcement report, on giving people more information about pages so that people can um, understand, uh, you know, the the nature of a particular page, and then um, more broadly around um, political advertising campaigns. I understand that, but I'm asking if you if if you want uh, the community uh, to believe that Facebook is actually invested in transparency, then surely these types of this type of information should be available. Um, well, Chair, if that is something that the Australian Parliament wants to, to make a recommendation on, you know, we're happy to, to work with the government to make sure that we are responding to what the community expectations are around um, further transparency measures. Uh, Senator Faruqi, I understand you've got some questions. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Ms. Garlic and Mr. Milner. In an international investigation published in December 2019, the Guardian newspaper revealed what it characterized as a covert plot to control some of Facebook's largest far-right pages, including one linked to a right-wing terror group, and create a commercial enterprise that harvests Islamophobic hate for profit. Um, now, prominent Muslim politicians were targeted with thousands of Islamophobic and racist comments, uh, including me. I'm assuming that you remember that investigation. Uh, and could you briefly outline what steps Facebook has taken to ensure that this sort of profit-driven hate cannot proliferate since that investigation took place? Well, perhaps I can take that. Hello, Senator. It's nice to nice to meet you. I'm I'm sorry about your personal experience of uh, being attacked uh, in this way. Um, I, actually, because we wasn't um, kind of notified to us before the hearing, we'd not prepared for detailed questions about this. Uh, but certainly, we can uh, write to you and the committee on notice uh, to explain uh, the actions that we've taken with respect to that particular report. What we can talk perhaps though today is about our broader approach towards addressing uh, hate speech, 
and, and, and incitement to violence on, on Facebook, if you'd find that helpful. Yeah, I was particularly interested after this particular report because it was huge. I mean, there were a number of politicians who really faced the fear of hatred and abuse. And I remember in that report, I think it was about 500,000 followers of one particular page who unleashed their attack on me. So I'm particularly interested in what steps you took maybe after 2019 in particular to make sure that this doesn't happen again. I mean, I, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Mia and maybe see if she's got anything specifically on, on this. I know that we've taken a number of steps uh, since then to address particular groups uh, mm -hmm. organizing in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so if you can mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. Uh, but as you can imagine, there's a range of different things that we seek to do. So actually, rather than as you can imagine, there is a range of things that we do to address the problem of, of hate speech. And it combines both uh, human expertise and technology. And some of that human expertise is about dangerous organizations. So we have a specific team which just focuses on dangerous organizations uh, around the world and conducts research and engages with uh, academics, uh, with uh, different institutes, with the community organizations to really understand what's going on here, how are these organizations changing and how are they manifesting online so that we can uh, find them, ban them, remove all, all their content, remove their, uh, their supporters. Um, uh, and then also we use technology to find hate speech. And that technology has got much, much better. It's called machine learning. So essentially you feed into the machine enormous amounts of content such that it then knows what to look for. Uh, and we're now at a stage where our, our most recent uh, enforcement report, where, where, which, um, where we provide information on this, we, we, we managed to now get to 97% of hate speech before anybody reports it to us and take it down using this technology. Now, just three years ago, that was less than 30%. So this technology has got a lot better uh, with our investment in people, including people from many different countries and communities with lots of different languages uh, experience also enables us to get to this content. But it's not perfect. Uh, and we have, you know, frankly, bad um, you know, bad people, hateful people who want to try and use platforms like ours and Twitter and TikTok and others to try and spread their 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 manifestos of hate. So we've got to keep on, uh, got to keep working at this in order to get better at it. And um, uh, and Mia, perhaps you can explain some of the actions we've taken around particular. Before we go to Alec, I guess I'll just explain very quickly. Sure. I'm asking about this because my office has looked at the Australian pages identified in that particular Guardian investigation, and it appears that at least four of the six identified pages are still public, uh, with some of them still posting Islamophobic content from websites identified in that investigation. And the type of content which the Guardian has characterized is ranging from misleading and outright fabrications. So I'm just wondering, that's why my question in particular, like, does that surprise you? I would need to look into it, uh, Senator, in order to understand the specifics there. Please do um, send, if your office can send the details that you're that they dug up to, to my team uh, in Australia, we'll look at it immediately. But isn't that the problem? Like there was this huge investigation. Um, so like you haven't even taken down those pages. The largest of um, the Australian pages identified in that investigation, which is no Sharia law, never ever give up Australia, has over 100,000 followers. And in the last 24 hours, that page has linked to articles posted by the third party websites identified in that investigation, which are the politics online and free speech front and you know these are two of the near identical websites masquerading as new sites with generic titles and this was identified in the guardian for posting reams of islamophobic content so at that time i might remind you at that time facebook said that it would deal with these problems of hate speech and what it called coordinated inauthentic behavior so I'm really shocked and very surprised. Like, why on earth are these pages still up and linking to the same websites that created that mass factory of hate? I'll ask Mia to come in and just talk a little bit more about what we've done in Australia. But uh, one thing that's very, um, a, a really tricky area for us is how 
you know, how, how to enable people to debate issues, including about religions. And we think it's absolutely right that people should be able to debate the rights and wrongs of different religions without attacking individuals who are members of those faiths. And, they're debating uh, and that's a very difficult very area. Sorry. No, no, sorry. Uh, I'm just saying debating issues is very different to spouting hate and I, attacking I, I, people. I agree, and 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 drawing, figuring out how to draw the line is one of the one of the hardest challenges. But perhaps Mia could just talk about some of the actions we've taken specifically in Australia on this issue. Well, I mean, Senator, I think it'd be really helpful um, if you could share um, some links to some of the pages that you have concerns about, because to build on um, you know Simon's um, remarks, it, it's often quite granular in terms of our assessments, in terms of what content gets removed, and then when that actually results in a page getting removed. And it sounds as though it would be helpful for us to um, to sort of work that through with your office. And, and please sure. always feel free to let us know the moment that you have concerns about things. We've certainly established a hate speech advisory council um, to make sure that we're continuing to listen to Australian community groups about issues and concerns that they have um, as we continue our work both in enforcing our policies and, and in rolling out um, programs um, to address um, issues of this nature. Um, uh, yeah, sure, we can um, talk to you directly about that, but they, ha they have been available for more than two years now and with that investigation. Um, just coming back to the Christchurch attack um, on the mosque. I'm assuming you've read the relevant parts of the Christchurch Royal Commission report that relate to Facebook, because there is quite a chunk in that um, report about Facebook. And the Royal Commission report makes reference to, again, to several Facebook pages and groups that the terrorists interacted with, including the United Patriots Front, the Lab Society, and the True Blue Crew. And I understand from media reports that the United Patriots front page was taken down in 2017. Um, are there Facebook pages or groups that currently exist at this point for those groups named in the Christchurch report? Uh, Senator, so those ones that you've just um, uh, mentioned, they've all been removed uh, from our services. Um, uh, so we do have this process that I think Simon mentioned where we try to mm -hmm. review, um, you know, different types of groups that could potentially be considered um, organised hate and, and, and dangerous organisations. And so a number of the groups that have been mentioned there have already been uh, removed from our services uh, following those assessments. And do the administrators of those groups still have Facebook accounts? Um, and are they administering any pages currently? Do you have that sort of information? I'm not sure that we um, necessarily have that information. I mean, the way that it works is that we do look at both groups and individuals. And so um, there have been certain specific individuals um, that we have um, designated um, to, to not um, be allowed to have a presence on our service. And then there are particular groups. And so we it's sort of a um, it's a, an assessment both at the, the page and the group level. Sorry, the profile and group level. Yep. Um Mr. Milner, I think you did explain a little bit about how you take down these groups, but I'm interested in what, like, is there a threshold? What kind of decision making process you go through in deciding which pages to remove and which not to remove, if there's a very quick answer to that. Otherwise, you can take that on notice. I'd like to take that on notice. We'd very much like to meet with you and take you through that and perhaps introduce you to some of our expert team who can explain to you and your uh, team. And any other colleagues in the Senate who'd like, who are interested, how we go about doing this? Mm -hmm. What happens to the profits that you've made on ads placed alongside extreme right-wing content that is later removed? So that's not our, how our advertising works. Um, mm -hmm. People don't play ads against content, so it's not like YouTube. Uh, in that sense, um, uh, so the, the, it's just it, it's, it's kind of meaningless, really, to think about it like that on on Facebook. Okay, but you do so the pages that you've taken down, um, ads that were placed alongside those, for instance. What have you done uh, with the profit for those? Again, that's not how it works. You can't advertise oh, okay. on Facebook okay. pages. Um, okay. So uh, pe adverts are directed at people, not content. Um, and and so it, it's simply not the case that ads are placed on pages like that. Yeah, but people groups. would be coming to those pages to see those ads? No, there are no ads on pages or in groups. Um, I understand that your automated tools 
um, automatically remove some comments. I think you explained that um, the machine learning kind of stuff, remove comments and posts from Facebook, including death threats without the admin of a page necessarily seeing them. Is that correct? I'm not sure. I'd have to get back quickly in terms of quality um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in respect of when we remove content from their page. I'm pretty, I'm pretty yeah, certain they would be notified, okay. but I want to be absolutely certain for you. We can come, come sure. back to you. So you maybe you could take the next question on notice as well, because I understand um, your interest, like I guess, you, if they are taken off, the admin doesn't see it. Um, but I guess my concern is that as public figures who receive um, these sorts of terrible messages, we are advised to report all threats because they're the best predictors of actual violence. This is what we've been told. Um, so I, I, I would like to know that how we meant to do that if they're automatically removed and the administrators don't know about it and can't keep a record of it. So I, I, I will confirm this, but I, I expect given that we also then will take action when a page has uh, accumulated a significant number of strikes, if you like, to page entirely, that they will be notified, but I'll take a verse and share it with you on notice. Okay, thank you very much both. Okay, um, there's some questions that uh, you've been given on notice. Senator Carr, do you have anything final? No. Okay, well, thank you, thank you both for appearing today and uh, look forward to hearing uh, some of those responses in due course. Thanks Thank very much. much. Okay. Uh, we're now going to suspend for um, our lunch break and we will be back at 1.40. Thank you very much. Now welcome representatives from uh, Win TV, Prime Media Group and Imparja. Could I please have you all to uh, give us your full uh, names and the capacity in which you appear today? Ian Hawtsley, Chief Executive Officer, Prime Media Group. Uh, Andrew Lancaster, Chief Executive Officer, Win Network. Thank you. Sorry, Imparja Television. Could you just repeat that, please, for us? We just missed the beginning. So it's Alastair Fian. I'm the CEO of Imparja Television. Great, thank you. Great. Now I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses has been provided to you. I now invite you each to give a short opening statement. We've got uh, your um, uh, submission uh, and then we'll uh, go to some questions. Uh, I'm happy to go straight to questions. I don't have an opening position. Okay. And Mr. So Lancaster, got anything you want to add? Uh, no, we're more than happy to uh, to stick by our submission and go straight to questions, if that's okay. That's fine, Mr. Freeham. Uh, equally, we're happy to just go straight to questions. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, well, of course, our inquiry is into the issue of media diversity in Australia. Um, we've focused a lot, um, even just today, on uh, print media, but I think uh, it's important that we have a, um, a good understanding of what is happening uh, in particularly the free-to-air free space and in those uh, regional areas as well. So um, perhaps if I could just ask, and I don't, I don't mind who answers this or whether you want to share it, um, just, has there been a... Uh, uh, a reduction uh, in uh, both uh, reach or indeed uh, newsrooms. Um, what are the changes that you've seen uh, in, in terms of the media landscape in the areas that you work in over the last, say, five to ten years? Okay, over the last five or ten years, uh, there has been a reduction across, well, I'd say across all uh, free to air regional broadcasters. In our regional markets, Wind's markets uh, include uh, regional Queensland, uh, northern and southern New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, regional South Australia and regional Western Australia. Uh, over the last five years, I think Wind has reduced the amount of news services it produces and airs um, by five bulletins in the markets of uh, Wagga, Dubbo, Wide Bay, Albury and Orange. And what's been the main reason for that reduction? 
The main reasons are the same main reasons we've probably spoken about a number, a number of inquiries so far or committee hearings. There is an increased level of competition for, for eyeballs, as, as we call it, in regional Australia, um, an increased opportunity for consumers to consume content that may not just be the traditional media, may not be uh, television, radio or newspaper, the digital content, so streaming services, other metro broadcasters, um, other news services that have come across the, the top of our markets. The impact of this is that we've had a, a reduction, a gradual reduction of our audience. Well, gradual is probably not the right word. We've had, a, over the last five years, a 25% reduction of audience. Uh, and similarly, we've had a, a reduction in revenue that uh, of about a, a similar amount. At the same time, our infrastructure costs have increased, our affiliate partner costs have increased, and our human costs have increased across the across regional Australia. We don't have a lot of levers to pull when we run regional businesses, if we're going to try and run economically efficient businesses. Uh, and one that we have had, and it's, it's probably the wrong word to call it a luxury, um, but it's one of the parts of our business that we know if we don't broadcast the local news, that we will actually have content supplied to us by the metropolitan broadcasters uh, from which we receive the bulk of our broadcast um, content. One of the things that's been put to us uh, in submissions is that submissions. this last 12 months in particular uh, with um, the COVID pandemic, a couple of things have happened. One, obviously a huge reduction in um, our local advert the, the desire and the, the need for local advertising because certain businesses just haven't been able to either a <laughs> keep paying for the, that while uh, they're struggling to keep paying wages, particularly in some of these regional areas. Um, but the flip side has been that audience members and the everyday citizens have wanted to know really what is going on in their local communities. Uh, how does that link to what's happening nationally and then globally? There has been a thirst for real news, factual information, um, and, and you know, uh, whether we, uh, you, you know, we can argue the toss over the, the, the amount of fake news online um, it's quite clear that there is a sense that if you want real news, you go to a, a traditional uh, news outlet versus Facebook. Um, so while you've seen a reduction overall to your audience members, uh, are you getting a sense that actually local communities want local news? Do you have an answer? Yeah. Uh, the reality is that uh, the general audience has declined. And for in our instance, uh, news numbers have grown, but uh, that's not uh, a result of the pandemic. It's actually a result of newsroom, other newsrooms closing. And, current, and as Andrew pointed to, um, he's closed Orange, uh, Wagga Wagga, uh, Albury newsrooms. That audience all came across to us. So we've, we've gone from 60, 65 share of the audience in some markets up to 90% of the audience. The reality is that the market can only have what the market can afford and the economics of regional markets don't have the capacity to sustain more than one regional television news service. And as a consequence, you're starting to see them close. Now, Southern Cross is a very good example. It's just changed, about to change from a nine affiliation to a 10 affiliation. In their previous iteration as a nine affiliation, they opened up newsrooms almost right across the Eastern Seaboard and put half our local news bulletins to air. Over a period of time, they found that the economics of the market couldn't support those news services. And so they closed them and they went to a statewide bulletin. Now, they're probably in a position where they're thinking as a 10 affiliate, they can't sustain that either. So the fundamental issue for media diversity in regional Australia is the economy. And that that business model that's underpinned it, i.e. advertising, is the bottom's fallen out. Uh, advertising, um, in, and I'm, I'm speaking on everyone's behalf here because we've had these conversations. 
none of us makes money out of local news. We lose money on local news and we lose a substantial amount of money on local news. We do it as a public service. We don't make money from it. Mm. And we've not made money for it, from it, uh, certainly in Prime's case, in two decades. Mm. Um, how important is it to have a uh, an independent, uh, albeit commercial, uh, alternative in regional areas so that you're saying you, you can only have one, but of course then there's the ABC. Um, Media diversity is important regardless of where you live. Um, are you arguing that ensuring that there is at least one commercial outfit is, is essential? We think so. When you talk about having an alternate to the local news that are provided by Prime or, or Wynn or Southern Cross in regional Australia, these are very specific local community news that's dealing with the issues that might, you know, in Wagga Wagga, as in Ian's case, or in Wollongong, in, in Wynn's case. These issues aren't covered by, by and large, by the national broadcasters. Mm. Uh, they aren't necessarily the alternate. Quite often, we are the only news service in those markets. And as Ian said, we don't profit from commercial uh, local news. Uh, far from it. We actually pay twice for the the time in which that bulletin goes to it, once to the Metropolitan Broadcaster from which we receive our content and once for our own infrastructure costs and staff costs. So it's an expensive exercise, but those stories are very important to people in regional Australia. Um, and as Ian said, it's a community service that's provided. It's not an alternate voice. It is the voice that's mm. being provided. Mm. Uh, how, you've mentioned some of the newsrooms you've had to close. Overall, how many jobs are we talking? Over the last five years, mm. 35, probably, close, no, my apologies, closer to 55. Mm. And that's journalists, camera people, the admin staff? Local people who produce mm. local content. Mm. Um, that, you know, that would be a big hit in some of those areas. I think less of a commercial hit. Those people hopefully will go on to find other roles and they'll, they'll find jobs elsewhere and quite often with, with the people who are sitting around this table. I think the issue is that the voice disappears. The risk is that there isn't a single local voice in some markets mm. uh, and down the track it's pretty easy to see that that might be the case. Mm. Did uh, any of you get access to the government's PING funding uh, over the last three years? Yep. Two and financial years. Two financial years. And was that helpful? It, it was. It's the first time, uh, speaking as a group, I think it's the first time any of us have received funding from a government to produce local news. I'm not entirely sure the manner in which it was distributed was, <laughs> uh, was the right fashion, but we did receive funding and it did enable us to uh, continue to provide news at a time of great uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is we probably would have preferred to have received it at the time it was needed rather than the delayed fashion in which it came. Can we, can we just, uh, dig down into that a little bit deeper? Sure. Uh, so what quantum of money are we talking? I think we're on the public record. Yeah, certainly we are, yeah. Uh, from Wynn's perspective, it was about $4.2 million. Okay. And, uh, and you're saying that came too late? I think the point is that the funding was introduced or, or announced in April and... April 2020? April 2020. And by the time it was received, it was closer to August mm. on the basis that we committed to that level of news, mm. staff, resources and bulletins for a further 12 months. Mm. So that's now coming up to the end of this financial year. Uh, what, what happens next? Well, I think it's fair to say, certainly in Prime's case, uh, we, don't, we didn't have any issues with um, the timeline or the manner in which PING came out. But the reality was that if we'd not had that PING money, we would have been making very, very, diff very, very different and difficult decisions about what we're going to do with local news. Um, the truth is that um, even though 
most of Australia is back and spending, we are still behind where we were two years ago. Um, and we still bear the increase in costs in operating our business, as Andrew pointed to, in, in programming, um, running local newsrooms that, that are loss-making. At a point in time, all that comes to a head. And you might be aware that we've been arguing for a change to regulations to find a, a way in which that regional media companies can sustain themselves into the future. If we continue on the path that we're on, um, it, is no, it will be no surprise to anyone that the one lever that all regional broadcasters will have to um, uh, remain um, profitable will be to close their local news. It is just a fact. Now, we're avoiding it and we don't want that to happen. But if there's no change to the regulations, and if we continue to see falls in revenue as we do currently, Prime five years ago was a $400 million revenue company, a $360 million revenue company. Today it's a $160 million revenue company. So, you know, something has to give. And the only way we can see that we can sustain local news services is under a completely different regulatory model. And could you step us through what you're asking for? Well, we think that the um, one licence or market rule should be removed and we believe that a consolidated entity will be able to sustain itself financially and increase the number of services that it brings to regional Australians. But currently all those services are under threat. Mm. And can I make the point that we're talking about in regional Australia? So the one licence to a market rule in regional Australia um, being removed and the voices tests and the concept being that 99 per cent of our content that we air on Ian stations, on Alastair stations, on, on, on wind stations, uh, is that that's created by the Metropolitan Broadcasters 7, 9, 10. Uh, the bit that we create is by and large our local news. Uh, regional broadcasters are, are more akin to distributors. So who owns a distributor? becomes a little bit irrelevant as long as that content, that 99% of content that's created in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth and distributed into regional Australia is still distributed into regional Australia. And how do you protect the creation of uh, local content for local news then? How, would that, how do you guarantee that? Well, I think to Ian's point, local news is a byproduct of sustainable businesses. And as businesses, as regional broadcasters, regional media companies become le less economically sustainable, the option they have is yep. to remove local news. What we're talking about is proposing a model in which there is no legislative constraint to enable to, uh, regional organisations to better organise their business to be able to better afford uh, regional news. We're supporters of local news. There's nothing that, there's nothing in the legislation right now that says that Ian has to produce the amount of bulletins he's producing or that Wynn has to produce the amount of bulletins we're producing. There's a content, a local, a content of local significance quota, mm. which we could all meet without producing bulletins. We choose to run local news. So you're talking to people so who are doing it in an uncommercial fashion already, who are trying to continue to produce local news. My idea, might, might I just add that we've already had to shut our local news services. So, so we stopped a number of years ago on the basis that uh, when we went to Vast and went to Digital, we were contracted to provide certain services um, and we got to a point where economically we could not afford to run news. So, so we, we, we ended up moving our news away. We moved all of our player away from the station. So we lost all our Aboriginal staff. Um, so we, we've actually we've actually halved the number of staff members we we have. We're down. We've lost thirty five people through news and and player. Um, did you have something you wanted to say about the ping funding? Um, look, ping came too late for us. So I mean, we'd already shut. Um, and, and one of the issues we have is that in terms of a broadcast area, we're a satellite. So so we we don't even see ourselves as being regional. We call ourselves remote. 
so we do the remote parts of Australia. So we, we've got, a, a, we cover a landmass area of 3.6 million square kilometres. We're through six states and territories. We run uh, a north stream and a south stream. Um, our reality is, if you have a look at that area, how do you actually produce a new service? You don't. I mean, you don't make it relevant. So, so we, what we would do is we'd take a nine, a nine's new service, we'd pull it to pieces and insert some local content. Um, but we've got to a stage now where we, we experimented two years ago. We, what we thought we would do would actually go down a, a, a user-generated news service base where, where we would use local local people in local communities to generate the stories and run run a couple of journals basically to check the, the validity of what we, what we had and, and produce a news service that way. And we tried that with King, but we couldn't get funding for it. So the, the, the model didn't fit. Mm. Okay. Um, Senator Carr. I could. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me just go back to the policy framework here. And the uh, last well, year, the, the government actually produced, um, well, actually, the, the, uh, the, the Broadcasting Services Amendment Regional Commercial Radio and Other Measures Bill. Uh, now, the explanatory memorandum actually spoke about the early warning signs of market failure in regional commercial television broadcasting. This is clearly the, the pattern that you're referring to, isn't it? When, mm -hmm. when do you think that early warning was first uh, observed by each of you? 2015. 15. Okay. Well, we pointed to oh. it in the... In the uh, Joint Select Committee hearings in, two, in March, May 2013. Yes. Mr Lancaster, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. And I think we've been making the point, uh, there was some legislative change in 2017. Yes. The move the reach rule and the... I'm going to come to that in a moment. But uh, which was probably a good start. Yes, it prob we probably should have had a, a better look at the one to a market and the voices test at the time. Mm. Uh, well, but the question then arises of why three years later you require further action if 2017 was a good start. Why wasn't it actually taken then? You're asking the wrong people. I was going to say, I don't think we were in control of what action was being taken. No, no, I I'm not suggesting that you are. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is the nature of these types of processes, we've got to try and establish what the parliament can actually do about these things. Mm. Uh, ultimately, governments have to take responsibility for introduction of legislation, but parliaments take responsibility for the passage of the legislation. We've got to know where things have gone wrong, what we can do to improve. Part of this inquiry surely is to come up with practical suggestions as to what we can do to deal with what is a serious problem you've identified as market failure. The government identifies as market failure. Um, so what can we do to address that? And, and you've mentioned some regulatory reform issues in terms of the... So, uh, so we, yeah, so if we go back to 2017, um, the 75% reach rule was repealed. There was a view at that time that if that uh, occurred, that the metropolitan broadcasters would acquire their regional affiliates, um, and uh, that didn't occur. Mm. Um, and that piece of that, that piece of legislation, the reform to that piece of legislation on its own, didn't take into account um, a new a new opportunity for regional broadcasters if they were to continue to be solo solace businesses. So everything was banked on if the repeal of the 75% reach rule uh, got through, that each of our respective businesses would be acquired by our affiliate partner. Well, that, that, that premise happen. was proved to be wrong. Yeah. Um, and there's been, uh, there's been nothing, I see. nothing since. Mr. Fan, you uh, didn't get a chance to comment on <laughs> when do you think this market failure first uh, was identified? We, we, we identified I'll take it right back. So, so when Helen Coonan was the then minister before we went to digital, she came out here with, and, and, and we sat and we chatted. And, and, and at that point in time, the conversion to digital in terms of equalisation for remote Australia was going to be us carrying one digital channel. 
So just one street. Um, when when government came changed and, and Senator Conroy was in, he came up here and he said, no, I want equalisation. So I want you to carry every channel that, uh, that Nine's carrying, I want you to put up in satellite. Now, we sat with them and went through the costs and we said, there is no possible way that there's any economic model that will, will sustain what you're asking us to do. Um, we were we were pushed aside and sort of we, we were pushed into a situation where uh, we ended up having to, to provide the services as legislated. And the reality has been ever since is, is that we've just been decimated year after year. We, we, we've been, been smashed. We economically, there's not an economic model for the business we're actually running. I see. So your service, you provide a satellite service which covers a range of channels, does it not? Uh... So, so, yeah, so uh, for us, we, we own half of the Channel 10 signal CDT. So we're 50, 50, 50 venture with Southern Cross. And, and we're a nine affiliate. So we take we take the three original streams from nine, which was the main channel, Gem and Go. So we don't take any more because there, there's just, there's, there's no opportunity for us to, to create any form of economic model around those channels. But you take advertising. I mean, I might, I'm a subscriber to your service. So I, I notice okay. uh, you have extensive advertising from distant parts. And I mean, you provide services for a hundred kilometers from this city. Yep. And we do, and for people in your city. But, and, and the reality is, though, if you sit down and said to me, so in, in 2010, what was your market worth? And I, I, I would have said, it's about a $20 million advertising market that we were sharing with one other channel. Now I've got nine channels. I've probably got a market that's maybe worth 12 million. Yeah. And I've got competitive, I've got competitive opportunity from SBS. So I've got online, I've got streamers, I've got, I've, we just infiltrated at, no. at every level, no. so, so the economics don't work. I see. Um, and you, you cover that you carry the ABC as well on your satellite, don't you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not our satellite, but yeah, the ABC and SBS are up there, so they're all up there. Everyone's off. Everyone's running off that satellite. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's look, it's old technology. There's new technology coming that, that would would allow us to do other things, but we've um, uh, which we which we're currently working with through green papers and the, and the like, but. Right now, as it currently sits, there is not an economic, a sustainable economic for our business. I see. And when you provide a service for people in remote areas where there are no other services, isn't that the case? Well, we cover off really the, the, the last 5%, the last the last couple of percent of people in the nation. So so within our, our licence area, which was which called Remote Central and Eastern Zone, we have about 500,000 people. Mm -hmm. And then we do digital infill. So for everybody who's east of the Western Australian border who cannot get a terrestrial signal, we're given the opportunity to take it off satellite. So if they're off satellite, they get us. And, and that gives us about another 400,000 people mm -hmm. that we access. Um, so look, uh, from, a, from a delivery point, we've got more people, but we can't actually claim those as part of audience. So it makes no difference to us. It's just a cost for us in terms of advertising. So why was it necessary then to establish the uh, Save Our Voices campaign? Why have you felt it necessary to do that? Well, I From my perspective... Oh, sorry. Well, Carol's... Mr Fan has probably had less opportunity, so why don't you start it off and we'll right. hear from the others well, as well. I, look, the, the Save Our Voices is, was really for, for us... As I say, we've had to shut our news services. We've had to do those things. The reality is, is, is that my... my Board, this company is owned by Aboriginal people. We're the only. We're, we're very unique. We're in, in in terms of broadcasting around the world. We're a commercial broadcaster. We're not government funded. We're Aboriginal owned. Um, we we provide huge social platforms. We're a not for profit at the same time. So you sit and you look and say, for us, I'm going like my board respects what the the, the other three guys are trying to do. That the, the Wind Prime and, and, and Southern Croft. But they also sit there and they say, we are different, we're Aboriginal, so, so we want to retain their voice and their share of voice as, as an independent group. And you see that from an industry point of view, though, we're, we're looking to say something needs to change. And the Save Our Voices campaign that Ian, Ian uh, or, or Prime and uh, the re our regional partners put together was something that we felt really needed to support. Anyone else like to comment? Save Our Voices... Um, in, its, in, in its current iteration is the same as the first iteration and that was to bring the uh, message to 
Australian audiences, that services that they received in regional Australia are at risk. And uh, that has been demonstrated by the closure of local television newsrooms. Regional television covers 37 per cent of the Australian population. The local news services are discreetly local, 22 minutes 30 of local news, Monday through Friday, uh, of potholes not being fixed in the road, of mm, why you mm. can't get a hospital bed yep. in Ballarat Hospital, etc, etc. Et it is very parish pump news, but it's highly valued in regional yeah, Australia. It's very important. Yeah. Sorry? It's important. Absolutely. Yeah. So we needed to um, demonstrate uh, to people living in regional Australia that um, we were doing something about it and that we were talking to government about reforms that would enable us to sustain ourselves into the future and, and in that uh, bring additional services to regional Australians. And I think the key point in establishing Save Our Voices is reminding ourselves as much as our viewers and our communities is that we're strong believers in providing a local voice for local communities. The issue is the economic model isn't what it was. And the reason it's not what it was is because there's a whole bunch of unlegislated, unconstrained competitors that have, to use Alastair's words, infiltrated our market over the last six, seven years. And infiltrating at a greater pace, every time you turn around, there's a different opportunity to look at your TV screen. There's a different opportunity to, to watch somebody else's content, which clearly which means that there's a reduction of people watching regional television. Now, it's our job to make sure that we do our best to make that content relevant, the content we produce, and, and working with our affiliate partners or, or hopefully having the right affiliate partner to ensure that that content is still mm. relevant to some degree. Mm -hmm. But you can't get past the fact that the, the internet and a, um, you know, faster speeds across the, the country have led to more people streaming, watching content that isn't ours. It's a long way from 1992 when the Broadcast Services Act uh, looked at the issues of regional television. That makes sense. So can I talk to you about the why, the green paper that the government, uh, Minister Fletcher, issued last November? Now, I understand there's a consultation period that's uh, opened through to May of uh, this year. Can I ask uh, you, uh, each of you, uh, whether or not you could comment on its timeliness, its adequacy? Um, does it... Uh, address the needs that you feel that uh, are required to be attended to? Uh, just can you give me some indication of uh, the question of whether or not it is able to meet, meet the criteria that you've actually discussed? I think that, uh, well, Prime's positive about the Green Paper because we'd like to see uh, reform and change and it's necessary if uh, our business is to grow. But if we have one concern with it, um, it's the timelines, and we, we doubt that the timelines are achievable, and that causes us some concern. But um, I guess uh, that, that might well change once uh, everybody has submitted their, their positions. But certainly our technical people uh, are of the view that um, the Green Paper plan uh, couldn't be implemented before 2030. 2030. Mr. Lankers? I think it's a bit like our view on the ping funding. It's um, it, welcome the fact that somebody is looking on how they looking at how we can assist uh, regional broadcasters to to do to get their content to the consumers in a more efficient fashion. So that from that perspective, there's there's positives. Uh, like Prime, we have concerns about the ability to do that. The broadcast infrastructure in regional Australia is not the broadcast infrastructure in metropolitan area, uh, Australia. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about how vast our land is uh, to then carry signals across that land. In our case, you know, from Cairns in the north to Hobart in the south and across to mm. um, Bunbury. There's a lot of geography, a lot of transmission infrastructure to deal with. So 
Our biggest concern is how we manage that infrastructure going forward and then whether that works for us within the same time frame as the Green Paper. So we'll be responding accordingly um, and, and giving some thought, but if there's an opportunity to do things more efficiently, we're all ears. Mm -hmm. And in Parja, what do, you, what do you say to those questions I've put to you? <laughs> um, look, we also welcome the opportunity to, to I suppose, voice, have a voice and, and, and offer opinion our reality is that, that if you sit down and the way that we, because of the way we work and, and we work off satellite, our retransmission points are, are such that we can only see cost associated with this, with, uh, with any spectrum shift. However, having said that, it also provides opportunity to maybe rework the way that we deliver services to remote Australia. And not just, we're, we're looking at this, as I said before, with new product in, in included. So, can we, for example, offer a new satellite platform, which we, which we know is coming, so we can deliver IT services, we can deliver telephony. And, and, and those areas that I'm talking about are really the last 5%. They're, they're, they're never going to get onto the NBN. They're never quite going to, you know, they're never going to be cable, they're never going to be wired. Yeah. So we're, look, we're looking for other, play, other ways to deliver additional services through a platform that we understand. Mm -hmm. So yeah. hence, you know, we look at it as being quite positive. So the government's also issued a number of tenders for contracts, in fact, $1.3 million worth of so-called uh, independent research uh, in recent times, specifically dealing with regional media. There's the Megan Brownlow's uh, proposition, Australian Regional Television Broadcasting Industry, the Regional Broadcasting Advice from the Court of Mentha, Assessment of Media Business Models and Supports, uh, QUT, there's a regional television analysis from the Boston Consulting Group, and it's a $1.1 million consultancy. Um, there are. I'm just wondering, have you got any advice to the committee as to why it's necessary to keep issuing these reports, these consultancies on regional media via, via external consultants? What do, you, what do you think that you're learning from these consultants? Well, we've not seen any of those reports. We're not privy to them. I see. Um, but uh, each of us has uh, individually uh, under a non-disclosure agreement provided the department with all uh, financial information about our companies um, and, um, and where we sit financially uh, into the future. So I guess in part we've informed those papers but we've not seen them. Mr Lankers? Yeah, as, as Ian mentioned, we entered into a an NDA with Megan Brownlow. That's the only report we've contributed to. We haven't actually seen uh, the product of those reports or, or those reports themselves. And if they've got some great ideas on how we can run our business more efficiently or uh, have a more sustainable outlook, we'd welcome the opportunity to see so, those reports. Um, Mr Van, are you aware of any reason why they shouldn't be published? Oh. <laughs> Look, we, I've, I've seen one of them, um, and, and it was the Derby quest. We were talking to the department about something, and they couldn't quite believe what we were telling them. So, so we had one of those groups come through and, and work here for three weeks to, to qualify what we were saying. Uh, so we saw the report when it came out, which, which affirmed everything that we'd been saying, and, and uh, that report made certain recommendations to government, uh, none of which were actioned. Uh, but now we're going through another report process, another report process, and another report process. So, so, mm. so we, we keep providing the same information, and uh, we're probably going to keep getting the same results, and we we'll probably yeah. probably yeah. keep not getting any action. So, so would it be helpful so, to have them published? Uh, some of the, some of the, no, some of it's highly confidential in terms of I, I suppose. From a, so there's genuine the commercial and confidence issues, is it? Yeah, so there's certain elements to it, but look, there's a reality to it all, and, and, and probably we're the best case in Australia because we're, we're, we're small, we're independent, we only work in one market, we don't have the same resources as, as the other guys. Um, so if you want to look what's going to happen to industry somewhere down the line, we're probably a good place to start. If things don't change, they're all going to end up feeling, or will be in a spot somewhat similar to us, somewhere down, down, down the track. Uh, Mr Lancaster, Mr Orsley, what do you say about them making them public? I see more benefit in making them available to the broadcasters who, 
whose businesses they're designed to help in terms of the information that was provided. And we're a private company and are loathe to, well, probably the wrong word, uh, we haven't got a history of providing information outside of our shareholder requirements uh, and would prefer they're not published mm -hmm. unless they're heavily redacted. Right. Well, I mean, and so you're saying they're genuine commercial and confidence issues? I'm saying we provided information yeah, under no, a non-disclosure agreement, yeah. which we wouldn't provide if we that's thought right. they were no, being no. published. If you thought they were, yeah, that's fair enough. But I, I would appreciate the learnings from them. Yeah, it would be helpful. Yep. I don't think they'll tell me anything I don't already know, that I run a very efficient business. All right. So in terms of the, uh, the digital platforms, um, the final report of the digital platforms of inquiry and the recommendation in terms of the grants for local journalism, that was the 50 million per three years, which of course proposed that they be reviewed after the, that uh, time period. Um, are you satisfied that the grants have been well targeted and, and they've reached the right uh, people? Are we satisfied that the mm. people who produced the most amount of news received the most amount of funding? Fund, the funding grants. Do you think they've been well targeted? When you say well targeted, my apologies, are you talking well, about well targeted yeah, to yeah. us? Yes, yes. Well, they've gone to the right people. I think it's good that someone's provided a grant for public interest news gathering. It's a first. It's so a it's hard to be critical. It is less difficult to be critical of the manner in which they were distributed. And what's the, can you enlarge on that last comment? I believe the uh, recipients of funding were derived based on the size of their revenue, not the output of their news content. What, what, Mr. Orsley, what do you say? Well, Andrew's right, it was based on revenue and not news output, but I can't make a comment on other recipients because I don't know their financial standing. And Parcher, have you got a view on this matter? Because you were... Um, uh, we, we missed it, so, so we'll sit back. Right. Thank you. So, um, I mean, there is this issue about what we do in the future. And there's been a range of questions that have been raised about the use of the taxation system, other philanthropic uh, opportunities and direct grants in terms of supporting public interest journalism. Now, if this is one particular model that applies uh, already within the Australian context, should there be a broader application of this uh, type of program to support public interest journalism? I think there's an opportunity to, to continue with a ping, a public interest news gathering um, grant scheme. I think the issue from our perspective is those who produce the content and air the content, those who produce more regional bulletins than any other broadcaster in Australia, should probably be at the higher end of the ratio for the funding, not at the lower end of the ratio for the funding. But that said, I think I'll go back to uh, the presentation that we've supplied the, the committee. Our view collectively yep. is that government funding is not the solution. No. Our view is they're removing outdated 29-year-old legislation that doesn't apply in this day and age is more of the solution. There is no magic pill that's going to turn around viewership. There is no magic pill that's going to turn around revenue in regional Australia. What there is is an opportunity to allow uh, the businesses who run the local content in regional Australia to become economically more sustainable. At the moment, that's not there. And this, uh, this whole committee hearing is about diversity and media diversity. Yeah, from our perspective, the diversity comes from the local news content sure. we produce, not the 99% of content okay. that so comes. I'm just getting to the point that diversity in regional Australia for that news content is not linked to ownership. It is linked to the it's content that we provide. Well, I mean, there's a range of points that you made there. I'm, I'm specifically interested in what action can be taken by this parliament and to facilitate diversity in the media in this country. Yes. Right now, uh, I've mentioned several things in that question to you. I mean, philanthropic assistance, uh, the use of the taxation system. I've mentioned 
That is, and I, I think you understand what I'm talking about there, do you? I mean, if I, I can enlarge on that, the use of, for instance, models such as the R&D tax concession at the moment, where additional taxational benefits are provided under with, you know, within, within the guidelines, a, a set of guidelines for public interest journalism for additional investment. Now, uh, uh, and of course, direct grants is the third area that people have discussed. Uh, so I'd be interested in your views about whether any of those measures in addition to the regulatory changes that you want to see, would be of assistance uh, to regional broadcasters? They would be of assistance, but I, um, I agree with Andrew. There's a reluctance to grapple with the realities of the market. And the reality is that if any one of us wasn't here, diversity is dead in regional Australia. If all of a sudden the three of us can't afford to produce local news anymore, there's no television news, only the ABC. So that needs to be fixed. And the only way that can be fixed is to enable us to rearrange ourselves in a more economically sustainable way. And we've been arguing for that for near on seven years and we've made no, no ground to date. Can I um, jump in here, Senator Carr? I'll finish. Um, you've mentioned the regulatory changes that you'd like, specifically the one licence to market rule and the voices test. Could you give us an example of what in practical terms that would mean? Yep. What is it? What would it look like in Gippsland, for example? So it wouldn't look any different. You would still get all the channels. It's just the operating entity behind it that changes. So the audience loses nothing. So there'd still be a guarantee that local news would be collected? Do you uh, need a guarantee when we're putting local news to wear and losing millions of dollars of money on it a year? Well, I think, you know, there's always, um, uh, there was, there's always pros and cons to less or more regulation. And you're arguing for less regulation with a trust us approach. No, we're asking for total deregulation, just like the internet companies have. I was going to say, with the, the trust us approach, which is the approach that by and large has led to us continuing with our 12 bulletins across regional Australia. We can satisfy the content quotas by producing you know, bulletins and doing updates during the day. We choose to produce local news. Uh, we're not saying we don't want to produce local news. I would have preferred not to have closed bulletins in the past and those before then. We would have preferred that we had a strong regional broadcast model that would enable us to sustain those news services. So this is not, we're never going to ask for more regulation. No. The same question that Senator Carr asked before, why didn't we have that, uh, these last two pieces of legislation addressed a few years ago? We didn't get there, but we don't want to ask for more regulation, but you do need to understand that these are regional businesses who are looking after regional employees, regional consumers and telling regional stories right now by choice, not because of the quota legislation. If we stuck by the quota, um, there would be free bulletins in every market. There isn't. wouldn't that. They'd just yeah. be news updates. Yeah. Right. So to, to your point, in Gippsland right now, there is one dedicated half-hour bulletin in Gippsland five nights a week. That's wind's signal. Mm -hmm. At the moment, there is a statewide Southern Cross uh, half-hour news bulletin. I'm not sure what happens to that past 1 July when you feel it changes, and Prime doesn't run a, a bulletin in Gippsland. So the assumption would be, if we had a sustainable model, we would try to continue with that, with that level of news service. Mm. Um, so how... Un unpack for me, and this will have to be the last question, and perhaps you, you can take some of this on notice, yes. but unpack for me how the changes to those rules um, allow for the financial stability to keep things, as you're saying, status quo. Do you want to address that? Yeah. So if you look at the three businesses, this is uh, you have an enormous amount of uh, infrastructure separately. You have an enormous amount of plant and equipment separately. You have an enormous amount of um, 
buildings and offices across the country separately and merging all of those operations releases substantial amount of capital for reinvestment. Now, currently, most of us don't have the ability to reinvest in our businesses. And the only way that we can grow and deliver new services is if we can liberate capital. Um, that is preferable, I think, uh, than living on a handout from the government. And I believe that the framework should be set to market conditions. They are currently set to a time when people watch TV, listen to the radio and read the newspaper. It doesn't take into account that they're on wagering sites, they're on social media, they're on streaming platforms, they're on YouTube and 500 other entertainment platforms. That, that to me, uh, needs rectification. And then it's up to us to make the most of the market under that framework. I don't think any of us um, would consider that uh, living on the public purse is good for commercial entity, and particularly a publicly listed one. You said before that the we have to be not afraid to tackle the big question or the, the, the big problem, which is audience numbers, advertising, so therefore the business model is declined. Um, where does platform come into this? Where does the tough conversation about uh, traditional free-to-air versus people getting local news through a streaming service uh, or an online platform that would still be produced locally? Yeah, someone would have to fund it because they're not com if we're not commercially viable and I have a 95 share of the audience in Albury and an 82 share in Western Australia and 65 share in the Central West and I can't make money out of local news, I don't know how anyone can. Hmm. Um, but are we just, uh, are, are, uh, is what you're asking for simply changing the rules to keep propping up an, uh, a model that just is on its way out anyway? It's old technology. Uh, I think there are a sizable audience in regional Australia mm -hmm. that rely... I'm just asking the yes, devil's advocate yeah, question, by no, the way. No, it's, it's a good question. Mm. That rely heavily on regional television. Mm. The penetration of cable TV in regional Australia isn't what it is in metropolitan Australia. Mm. Um, so I think free-to-air television will have a place in the mix, and there's no doubt that its trajectory overall around the world is not you know, what, what we'd all like it to be. But I think there is a place for it, but it has to fit the local economic conditions. Mm -hmm. And it, that, that is a fundamental um, for the future, that the regulatory framework enables the business to sustain itself in that market. And we certainly can't do that uh, the way that we're tethered at the moment. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to that, Mr Fairman? No, I was just saying look, that the reality is, is, is this is just another challenge. We, we will end up having to reinvent ourselves in some way, shape or form, as has media. You, know, you have a look at cinema. Cinemas would generally be dead with the introduction of DVDs and the like. Businesses reintroduce and, 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 and you know, I, don't, I, I can't think of a media platform that's, uh, that's, that's ever not come back. You know, go back to even looking at the it's funny someone said to me the other day, we, last year we, we they, they produced more vinyl records than they did CDs. Vinyl was the thing that died 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and now it's, now it's back. And, and, and we'll come back. It's just, just the rules need to change. We need to evolve, um, but we need the opportunity to evolve. And right now we just don't have it. We, we, we live under a one-size-fits-all bit of legislation and it doesn't work for us. Uh, final question, uh, I guess, is just coming back to this point about uh, the, the argument for uh, regulatory change, uh, and particularly these rules that you've identified, but wanting that without uh, an acceptance that there would, surely the, the, the public interest test would require then uh, a guarantee that local news would be covered. Why, why just local news? Or why local news? as opposed to sport or, ch or a local children's program. 
why news specifically? Mm. Because of the public, because of the public good. Mm. And, and, and because that is the topic that we're considering in this inquiry. Yeah. And that's um, why it's relevant. Well, all I can say without saying too much without having spoken right. to my contemporaries. In the discussions that we've had to date, um, we have um, put on the table that we would um, continue to provide programming of local significance into the future, even if that had to be a licence condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? I think the question is whether local news is more sustainable with the legislation still in place mm. or less sustainable. Mm. So if the idea or the, the intent is to protect as much local voice as possible in regional Australia and you know, the, the intent of the, the broadcaster, broadcasters is to do that, I think you need to ask yourself whether this, these two pieces of outdated legislation uh, is helpful is it? for the continuation of lo local news or not helpful? The view of those who are economically responsible for the businesses is that it's not helpful. Okay. It's more, there is more likelihood of local news if the legislation is not there and businesses are better able to organise their businesses and are more economically sustainable. Uh, if the legislation changes, the, the, there's only one trajectory for local news. It doesn't change, sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Uh, thank you all three of you for appearing today and for your submission. Obviously, we've still got some way to go on this inquiry. And if we've got other questions, we will put them on notice or get you back um, uh, if need be. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. See you, Thank you. See you, mate. I now welcome uh, Bruce Guthrie to the table. And I understand that uh, Mr. Frey and Mr. Jaspin are joining us via video conference. Wonderful. I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and protection of witnesses has been provided to you. Could you please uh, each state your full name and the capacity in which you appear today? And we might start with you, Mr Guthrie, and then on to Mr Frey and then Mr Jasper. Uh, Bruce Guthrie, uh, journalist, editor, appearing as a private individual with uh, experience, broad experience in the print industry. Wonderful. Thank you. Mr Frey. Uh, Peter Frey. Sorry, uh, Peter Frey, journalist, editor, appearing in the same manner as Bruce. Um, as someone who, uh, like Bruce and Andrew, worked in Main Street, in Fairfax, and then did a startup, and now is back in independent media. Great, thank you. Mr. Jaspin? Yes, hello. I don't know if you can see me because uh, the video is not operating at my end. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but I can't, no, I can't see you, but. Yeah, anyway, um, I'll spare you uh, that indignity. Um, Andrew Jasper, I'm a journalist that came to Australia to edit The Age uh, in 2004. I then launched The Conversation, and I'm currently a professor at Monash University, looking at uh, strategic um, developments and, and, and media and tech issues. Okay. Wonderful. Now, uh, there's an opportunity to give an opening statement and then we can go to questions. So, Mr Guthrie. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to appear here today. I've been a professional journalist for almost 50 years. In that time, I've worked as a reporter and foreign correspondent for the major metropolitan dailies and been fortunate enough to edit some of the biggest 
mastheads in Australia. I'm also the author of Man Bites Murdoch, a 2010 book that warned of a toxic culture within News Corp, then News Limited, and of the dangers of giving them too much journalistic power. I, it ended with my sacking as editor of the Herald Sun after I reported too vigorously on a friend of a Murdoch. Within six months of my book's publication, the world watched horrified as the British phone hacking scandal unfolded in all its appalling detail throughout 2011 and beyond. Despite all this, a decade on, News Corp is bigger and more influential in Australia than it has ever been, and it has moved even further away from objective journalism. Increasingly, their reporting looks and reads like political boosterism. Thanks to 2017's ill-advised media law changes, News and Nine Entertainment now constitute a cosy duopoly that uh, dominates news publishing in this country. Uh, that is now a fact of Australian life. And as my colleagues and I note in our joint submission to this inquiry, there's probably no realistic chance of going back. Better then to focus on how to create a media landscape that actually encourages rather than deters more local entrants. There's little incentive to enter the arena now. You'll struggle to make it pay. You'll be attacked relentlessly by the bigger players and there will be little or no assistance on offer. That's certainly our experience at the New Daily, which has succeeded in becoming a top 20 digital news site in spite of all these obstacles. Our relative success was cited by the ACCC when it uh, gave a go-ahead to the Fairfax 9 merger, but then we were expressly excluded from a government support fund because we are owned by a financial institution, uh, industry super funds, or one of their offshoots at least. That exclusion demonstrated another very important fact that some seem unwilling or unable to grasp. Yes, journalism's business model has changed, but so has the ownership model. It must. Any investor wishing to support journalism with money, jobs and an editorial charter should be celebrated, not vilified. It is ludicrous that an American billionaire and his family can own almost 60% of the Australian print media, but average Australians apparently can't. We launched the New Daily in 2013, and I was its editorial director until last year, and I still advise on the project. It's actually a great media success story. Audience, subscribers and revenue are all growing. We have a full-time staff of 35. We have as many again working freelance or part-time. We've won Walkley Awards and we're regularly placed in the Nielsen Top 20 digital news sites. But you wouldn't know any of that by reading news or nine reports about us. They prefer to snipe, returning again and again to the same critics. It borders on vendetta. Some of these critics are within government and seem bent on further reducing diversity. Just weeks after an attack by a government senator on the commercial relationship between the New Daily and the national broadcaster, the ABC summarily ended our seven-year deal where we paid them to run their content on our site. The ABC denied a link between the senator's attack and their decision, telling us in a phone hookup it was simply because, quote, you guys have done too well, unquote. So much for competition law, so much for media diversity. This is not how the 21st century landscape was supposed to be. In the 25 years since digital news sites started appearing in Australia, I launched the Ages site in 1996. We were supposed to see a great flowering of the industry. But a quarter century on, the top 20 websites in Australia are dominated by legacy media with a few entrants from overseas who've also been around a very long time. Indeed, the only 21st century site in the Nielsen Top 20 in Australia is the New Daily. No amount of empathy training will change the rapacious behaviour of the dominant players, so we have to find ways to make it easier for startups, large and small, to survive the early years where revenue and audience are in short supply. Some brief suggestions. Established a match dollar funding program for employing journalists, the biggest single cost of establishing a new media business. The framework of the small and regional publishers fund, which already exists, could be used to enable this. Media organisations meeting the public interest journalism criteria to be set by ACMA 
and under an agreed turnover of, say, $5 million, could apply in their first three years of operation, annual grants could be capped. Second, make ABC journalism available to small and medium-sized publishers through a Creative Commons arrangement, similar to the conversation. Third, increase and extend support for Australian Associated Press. It would be a disaster if News Corp's Newswire displaced AAP, which have, I have no doubt is News's goal. Finally, governments, both state and federal, should mandate that a percentage of their large annual advertising spend go directly to small and medium-sized publishers, including startups. In closing, a decade ago, I wrote in the preface of my book that if you regard newspapers as a protection racket, if you mess with us, we'll mess with you, then Murdoch's empire is an intimidating force. I added, quote, the digital age provides the best chance of new voices emerging on the media landscape to challenge such market dominance. In that sense, change can't come soon enough. End quote. We've already wasted 10 years and we can't afford to waste any more time. I wish the committee well in its very important deliberations. Thank you, uh, Mr Guthrie. Uh, Mr Frey, have you got something you'd like to add? Yes, thank you, Senator. Just a few things. I, um, much like Bruce, I was former editor-in-chief of, of the City Morning Herald, and in his case, The Age. I brought, I, when I left uh, the City Morning Herald, I started PolitiFact, the country's first standalone fact-checking site. And as may be pertinent to the deliberations of the Senate Committee, I was uh, uh, on the advisory panel of the first round of the innovation grants, uh, which I think now are known as PING. And I have a few things to talk about in relation to innovation, if you'd like to ask me. Um, but I'd just like to support what Bruce has said and make a couple of, as I say, extra points. We're not advocating for a mandated reduction in media concentration, as appealing as that may seem. Uh, but we do support a government-assisted expansion to create a, a broader, more healthy ecosystem. Um, with the caveat, of course, that journalism um, has and will always have an uneasy relationship with government, uh, and because the nature of journalism, public interest journalism, is to seek to hold governments to account. Um, I fully endorse the idea that we establish a fund, a fund to support independent publishers and startups. Um, it's not difficult, I should think, to agree on what criteria should be made to uh, access that fund, but I think it's, it should stress um, that it, it should privilege diversity and all its forms, and I'm, I'll get back to that in a second, um, and it should encourage startups because we're not going to have uh, a, a broader, more vital system unless we can find ways to encourage startups in journalism. There are a few other ideas that I know the committee has already thought about. These include giving Australians a tax credit for money spent on subscriptions, or making donations to new sites tax, de tax deductible, and giving uh, businesses a tax credit for money spent on designated new sites. Some of those mechanisms could be used to fund the fund that we've just uh, that I've talked about. To the above, I'd like to uh, bring the, the committee to the attention of uh, developments in the United Kingdom, where the BBC has entered into uh, what it's called local news partnerships with local external news producers. And I do believe this has some application maybe here for the ABC. The specifics of this uh, is that the BBC does three things in partnership with local regional news producers. Primarily, it creates a news hub, which gives access to BBC video and audio material for use online, something that I think uh, Bruce has just flagged. Um, it has a shared data unit. Data journalism is very much a, a, a growing area, in the way that a lot of people receive information, and it creates this data unit, which enables uh, pieces of data journalism to be shared with uh, regional news. And finally, there is a, a, a pool of about 150 or so local news reporters that are part funded by the BBC and the local providers to report on very important things like uh, councils and other uh, institutions of a local nature. I mean, I'm sure you're all very affair, aware of the, um, of the reports by ACMA and reports by the ACCC that show that they're really, uh, we are really at a risk of having news deserts, deserts in this country. Um, I do think uh, I'd like to make one more uh, 
point. And that is when we talk about diversity, um, we often talk about media ownership, obviously, and that's obviously apparent and why we should. I mean, uh, a new report in today's Crikey by academics Benedetta Bravini and Michael Ward again reinforced the um, the influence, uh, the over influence of the News Corp uh, monolith in this country. But, but when we talk about diversity, I think we should also talk about diversity of voice. So as in who stories are told and who gets to tell them, uh, I think we should talk about diversity of form and delivery. Um, for instance, uh, I have a couple of teenage kids, and if I wanted to give them news, I would find a way of using TikTok uh, rather than, say, a printed newspaper. Uh, they wouldn't know what a printed newspaper was. Uh, we need to talk about diversity of business models. We need diversity of demographics and diversity of literacies, of course, in all forms of diversity of gender and sexual identity. You have before you three white middle-aged men. My submission was penned by such penned largely by such men with two middle-aged white women. Um, people like us dominate the newsmaking in this country and many others. And I would argue, uh, I would say this, but I would argue that we are very much alive to the issues that flow from that observation. And that we have tried in our various ways to be editors for everyone, for all our readers. But nonetheless, it would be great that the next time we talk about diversity in this country, the next time I perform before a Senate committee, that you have before you a host of very different people who are running independent media in this country. And I, I would hope uh, that your committee could do something about that too. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Mr. Jasmine. Yes, hello there. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, thanks for this opportunity. And uh, I wanted to reiterate what uh, both Bruce and Peter have said, which is we're all signatories to submission to you. Um, I wanted to make a couple of personal points, if I may. Um, I arrived in uh, Australia in 2004 to edit The Age newspaper, which uh, back then was owned by a company which no longer exists called Fairfax. Um, I was shocked when I arrived in Australia about the lack of media um, uh, diversity and the concentration of ownership. Um, but 17 years later, it's just really got a whole lot worse. Um, my question, I guess, is, uh, is if, if given the trajectory we've seen over the last uh, 10 years or so, where do you think we're going to be in five years' time? I dread that. Um, when I arrived in Australia, we had two distinct voices uh, under Fairfax. One was the Sydney Morning Herald, the other one was the Melbourne Age. Sadly, those two independent papers, which, which were fully controlled by their editors, both in Melbourne and Sydney, have become merged, and they are no longer uh, what I would call true independent newspapers serving their own audiences with a unique standpoint. Everything is controlled by an editorial director sitting in Sydney. However, uh, Fairfax messed up the future and as a result had to sell out to Nine Entertainment, uh, which is where the, where the papers are now owned. Which means that we've not only reduced two voices to one, in other words, sitting on the other age into what's commonly called the smage, but uh, we, those voices now are sitting within the walls of Channel 9. The next point I wanted to make is that um, I wanted to briefly comment, if I may, on AAP. Um, AAP uh, is terribly important to the news ecosystem in Australia. Um, it was well-funded. It had a large body of journalists. Um, however, um, two of its major shareholders, News Corp, uh, or News Limited previously, and Channel 9 felt that what they were doing was subsidizing their competitors by giving their competitors access to a good quality news service. So they pulled the plug on AAP, and uh, the new AAP has a fraction of the resources of the old AAP, um, and of course has lost the income of two of its biggest uh, uh, members, which is Fairfax, uh, sorry, Channel 9 and uh, News Corp. There was uh, a six-month non-compete, um, which News Corp uh, uh, were, were, um, were told uh, that applied to them. That non-compete is over. And my understanding uh, from, from people who are subscribers to AAP 
and News Corp's own Newswire service is that news, the News Corp service will be competing with uh, AAP. And that will be disastrous because I would foresee AAP, the new AAP, folding. And again, we will reinforce the media concentration of the two major players. And there'll be a further constant, uh, stranglehold on new voices. I do hope the hearing will take this into account. Next point I'd like to mention is the conversation. After I left the age, I, uh, I, I founded the conversation. One of the key reasons I wanted to bring the conversation to life was I wanted to find a way to bring new specialist voices into the public arena. And I did so through um, working uh, for a while as a consultant to Melbourne University. Uh, and uh, out of that was born the idea of the conversation, which was primarily this marry uh, expert, uh, subject matter expert with a professional journalist and the journalist could help the, uh, that person uh, write in a way which is intelligible to a wider audience, set deadlines, word lengths and so on and so forth. That's been extremely successful. However, what I was perplexed by right from the outset was the hostility of the Australian in particular uh, to uh, the conversation, with the exception, I should say, of Mark Day, who wrote uh, a couple of very good pieces about the conversation. Um, and I didn't really understand what this was about until um, I met somebody from Universities Australia um, who told me that they had been lobbied um, by uh, the Australian higher education section um, to find a way uh, to, stop, uh, to stop the funding of the conversation. And the reason that they gave was that the conversation was a threat to the readership and the advertising revenue of the higher education section of the Australian. Um, furthermore, um, I was in talks with the uh, Department of Education, which was then headed up by Minister Christopher Pine, about continuing with some funding support that the Australian government was providing the conversation. I should have said, by the way, that other funders included five major universities, CSIRO, um, the Victorian State Government and CBA Bank. Uh, but we received at that time uh, a million a year funding from the Australian Government. And um, I was in discussions with the Department of Education and the night before the budget, because they hadn't indicated to me whether they would continue funding or not, I received a call from a senior uh, reporter at The Australian to gleefully tell me that we would no longer be getting any funding from the Australian government. So this didn't come through the department, but through a reporter uh, at The Australian and wanted my reaction, uh, which I didn't give. The next point I wanted to make, if I may, is that um, the news code legislation, um, which is, uh, now being applied was largely scripted uh, and, and driven by News Corp. And that's why the biggest beneficiaries are News Corp and Nine Entertainment. The smaller players have been bought off with smallish sums of around 200 to 250,000 uh, a year. But the deal simply reinforces media concentration. By the way, um, as you're probably aware, Google and Facebook offshore their billing around five to six billion a year um, is, is offshore through Singapore and through Ireland. And in, in this way, uh, they, they can get around the Australian tax laws. One question I'm not sure if the committee has also established is how much company tax News Corp actually pays on its Australian activities and revenues. I also am not sure if the committee has managed to establish where News Corp's ultimate ownership is registered. Is it in Australia or Delaware or, or in a tax haven? My understanding is that Foxtel has shifted uh, its ultimate ownership to Delaware in the US. So the key question now is what can be done to support media diversity? And again, I echo the points made by Peter Trey and Bruce Guthrie. What we need is a different approach as outlined in our submission. In particular, we need to find a way to address areas of market failure through the establishment of uh, a new funding mechanism. Grants could be provided to high journalists to, to provide watchdog, watchdog coverage of town halls, courts and police towns, of regional and community Australia, specialist reporting 
in the areas of science, environment, health, etc. All areas now sadly neglected. I've also sent to you, um, uh, and I hope you've received it, my submission, which was made at the invitation of Rod Sim, the ACCC, about a 10% levy to be imposed on Google and Facebook revenues, um, which could support new public interest journalism. Um, I pass these links to the committee. I hope you have them. We, we do. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. So my... My real issue here is something must be done about this spiraling concentration or we need to face a media landscape without diversity. Thank you. What is, the, what, is the real, what is the real issue we face here with media concentration? It entrenches uh, excessive political and ideological power in the hands of a few, giving them the ability to set the public agenda, determine political decision-making, public policy and media policy. If we want to have a proper functioning liberal democracy in Australia, we need to understand that we now face an unprecedented and real threat to that democracy. We urge you to do something before it's too late. Uh, thank you. And thank you to all three of you for your opening statements. I might just kick off briefly and then I'll um, hand over to Senator Carr. Um, all of you have spoken about uh, the um, influence of the Murdoch press uh, in terms of um, the lack of media diversity in Australia, but you've all spoken about um, the uh, intimidating nature that they treat competitors with. I find this interesting because we've heard uh, from several witnesses um, just this morning, uh, the former Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, we heard from uh, Kevin Rudd uh, previously, we've heard from others, that this type of intimidating behaviour is not just directed at uh, news competitors, uh, but at anyone who doesn't fit their agenda, whether that is politicians or indeed, as we heard today, very disturbingly, uh, scientists, the people actually doing the work. Um, um, shooting the messenger, shall we say. Um, I, I'd like to know from, and perhaps Mr Guthrie, you're well positioned uh, to answer this thing as you used to work for a News Corp uh, newspaper. Um, is this new, this attitude, uh, this approach that the Murdoch press take uh, to, uh, or that perhaps, is, is, is it coming from Mr Murdoch himself? Uh, or is it his executives? Uh, is this new or has this always been thus uh, and they've, we've just got to a point where it is now so problematic uh, because uh, there's less and less competitors? It's always been thus. Um, when I worked there, when I was editing the Weekend Australian, this was on a lower level than science, but mm. I remember the Weekend Australian magazine uh, was going to press and I had a small story on Andrew Denton innocuous story, um, probably 300 words. And I was warned as the magazine went to press that he was perceived as an enemy of News Corp. And I said, why on earth would Andrew Denton be a... And they said, well, Super League. He challenged them on Super League. Anyway, I let the magazine go. I thought, ridiculous. And three weeks later, I got an angry call from the editor saying, why did you put Andrew Denton in the magazine? And I said, well, that was three weeks ago. And he said, Lachlan's just read it in New York and he's hit the roof. What do I tell him? And I said, I don't know, what do I tell him? And he said, well, you know, Andrew's on an enemies list. And I said, well, who else is on this list? And he said, oh, you'll find out. So there's this sort of known group within News Corp that expands all the time of people who are regarded as, if they're not friends, they're enemies of News Corp, just as there are friends of News Corp. And friends are rewarded and enemies are punished. And, in, and my observation is in the decades since I left News Corp, that's just gotten worse because they've gotten bigger. And, um, and until we, I don't know what we can do, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. But yes, there, when I sued News Corp, um, I would come out of court and I won a uh, breach of contract action, which went on for six days in the Supreme Court. I would come out of court each day and I would open up the paper in the morning. And what I said in the, what happened in the court bore no resemblance to what was reported. 
And I realise there's two kinds of truth. There's the truth and there's what News Limited says is the truth. And sometimes that's more important and more powerful and gets more traction. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, does anybody, uh, Mr Frey, do you have anything uh, to add in terms of uh, uh, whether things have gotten worse? Yeah, I, I, just a couple of things, really. I think we should, just for context, look, all news organisations get it in their head that they're, you know, they have enemies and friends and what have you, or they believe so-and-so needs to be brought down a peg or what have you. I mean, this, this power has been abused uh, for decades. I think what we see, though, in news is a particular brand of it, and it's brand, the, the key characteristics are frequency and intensity. Um, it's the frequency of the attacks. So once you are um, a News Corp enemy, you will be attacked frequently, every day, every other day, and, uh, and you will be, and it will be intensive. So, you know, as I say, um, if you were Eddie Obeed, you probably think that the Sydney Morning Herald has been out to get you forever. But the Sydney Morning Herald has done incredible journalism to uh, bring Eddie Obeid under control and, and to expose his uh, corrupt ways. It's a different kettle of fish if it's frequent and intense and really bears not very little at times uh, resemblance to proper reporting. Or truth. Or truth, of course. <laughs> Senator Carr. Well, if I could um, come to your submission, the First of all, you're suggesting there's a, a loss of um, 5,000 jobs uh, the last 10 years. Uh, is that uh, based on the MEAA's figures or do you have some other uh, evidence? It's, it's the accepted figure within the industry and I noticed the GetUp report has also quoted that figure today, Senator. And is that a result of the concentration of media ownership, tech change, or what, what, what do you think has caused that loss of that size? All of those things. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the demise of the print business model, which was enormously successful for a long time, very profitable. I think when I edited The Age, 40 cents of every dollar fell to the bottom line. Now it's probably two to three cents. Um, so that's a huge change in the business model. Um, it's been particularly harsh in regional areas. And the level of reporting in regional Australia must be threadbare now. Um, so it's a, com it's a combination of things and also companies just looking for, mm. for savings. Mm. You talk about the under-reporting uh, in this country, the local mastheads in regional Australia being closed is the obvious example, but it could also apply, I would have thought, in metropolitan Australia, we think about the situation in the courts, we think about local councils, police rounds. I mean, there was a time when I remember my time in politics when you talk to journalists that were actually trained at the round level, you know, yep. so they have some grasp of how society worked, some grasp about people, some understanding of institutional structures. That's all gone. I mean, what do you think are the consequences for democracy of the decline on that type of reporting? Um, can I answer this question? And others may wish to chip in if they feel... Um, I'll, I'll just make the point that all of what you say is true, as numbers have shrunk within newsrooms, uh, younger reporters particularly are being asked to do more earlier, and the training has fallen away. The other thing that's at work here, though, is the, what I call the digital race to the bottom, because the way to pay the bills these days is programmatic advertising, which is essentially... Uh, uh, it's, it's like the share market, buyers and sellers. Uh, predominantly owned by Google, they make a fortune out of it, take the biggest cut of all. I know the ACCC is looking at that. Um, but in order to get numbers, you're not going to get that by publishing um, three-week-long three, three week investigations into issues that matter. But you might get a big, big number if you publish Kim Kardashian splits with Kanye. And so increasingly what happens is that um, websites are now going for that clickbait. And so journalism is a race to the bottom. And young journalists particularly are being asked to do that stuff and they can frank frankly write it off someone else's screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
we've got a lack of training, we've got a race to the bottom, and a recognition that perhaps the best journalism doesn't get rewarded with clicks. Mm -hmm. And so, Mr. Frey, would you like to say anything on that matter? Yes, yes, I would. Um, I, I would like to say that we live in the age of the audience and um, the digital revolution, which is, you know, with us and will be with us for a very, very long time, uh, has created capacity, and I'm, I'm being a positive statement here, uh, has created capacity for news journalism to have highly skilled specialist journalists who um, can react to and work with their audiences. I mean, the, the, the website I spend most of my time running, Frikey, is a subscription-based model. Uh, and we have, a, hopefully, an ever-deepening relationship with our audience. So we don't have, my point is, and this is bouncing off what Bruce just said, we do not race to the bottom. It's not the only business model. Um, just to the uh, observation you made, Senator, I agree with you that we have seen um, a terrible loss of skills from the industry. But I would say, and I say this as a former teacher of journalism, that uh, the new crop coming through uh, are fantastic. They are imbued with a very, very strong sense of public interest journalism. Yes. And they are looking to uh, institutions like the Senate to assist them on their way. Well, we'll come to that. Um, don't okay. worry, you'll get the opportunity to come to that. But I'm, I'm particularly concerned uh, about this decline in standards in journalism. Um, you know, Mr Guthrie's mentioned the training um, and uh, yeah. Mr Jaspin, you know, your experience, I mean, in your term, I recall the age in your time, actually trained people to work in the courts. And I give that as a specific example, um, to work in the, in the police round um, and you would rotate people through a range of rounds so they got a, a broader grasp of how society actually functioned. Now, can it be said that independent publications are able to address those declines, for instance, in court reporting? Where do I find that? Um, I could say the same about science reporting. How many science reporters are there really now in the country in terms of specialists compared to what there were when you were all editing the major mastheads in this country? Um, industrial relations reporting. <clears throat> How many serious industrial relations reporters are there, experts, who actually know how the labour movement functions, how individual unions function, understand how companies function, have that grasp of how the economy functions at that level? Could you comment on that? Andrew? Um, well, it's a good point. I had four years covering industrial relations two of them at Trades Hall and two at the Arbitration Commission, which was mm -hmm. character building to say the least. But um, you're right. I mean, in, in, when I started in the 70s, you did the health round, you mm. did police round, you mm. did courts. And now um, newsrooms are, are threadbare compared mm. to those mm. days. Mm. And so journalists, the upside, to go to Peter's point, is they're getting exposed to kind of the pointy end of journalism much faster. Mm. But many of them are learning on the run. Um, that said, Senator, uh, certainly when I was at the Herald Sun, uh, certainly when I was at The Age, um, they were still taking on interns, yeah. and often, you know, a dozen a year, mm. and they were still trying to maintain But they rotated that system. them through. My, you know, I mean, yep. you, I worked in the industry, you know, from another yep. end of it. I mean, at your time when those publications, and I say to you, um, most of the senior journalists from that time have now been made redundant. That's right. Um, when you talk to a modern um, trained journalist, their grasp of history, their understanding of the breadth of the uh, topic is so much more limited. Yep. But simply in many cases, they're being expected to fill the shoes yeah. of the redundant journalists who had 25, 30 years experience with five years experience under their belt. Yeah. And we're asking a lot of them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there are gaps. Uh, I think massive gaps. And the, the reason I come to this point, and, and I'm, 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 I know, Mr. Jasper, I, I did ask you the question. I don't, I don't think of. Yeah. But I want. I'm here. We've I'm just here. done a Senate report here on the question of populism and democracy in this country, and the effects, particularly around the issue of trust 
in public institutions. Do you, and I ask all of you perhaps to comment on this, has the level of trust in journalism in this country declined in your judgment? Um, Senator Carr, I'm, I might uh, kick this off. The, f the first thing is all your points, in a sense, are an intrusion into private grief that we all share. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I joined the age, uh, I had uh, 350 journalists uh, working for the age. The figure is now down to well, well below half that number. Mm -hmm. And what you said a moment ago, uh, what you've done is lost the expertise, lost the specialist reporters, brought in general reporters, and the general reporters are under the command of bean counters or people who check uh, productivity, and they expect three or four stories a day, not one a week or, or whatever else. So this is a real problem we face, but it is a product of the changed uh, or broken business model, which is why I have put forward with my colleagues uh, a, a way of addressing this problem. Mm -hmm. In terms of your question on trust, and um, trust is part of that story as well. If you aren't able to leave the office because you have to write two or three stories a day and you do it on the basis of desktop research and occasionally getting somebody to answer your phone call, um, the, the level of expertise, the depth and understanding of the story is limited. And the readers can see through this. And I think the, the, the bonds that the readers have with, with the media outlet are loosened as they begin to see this is no much better, no, not much better than what I can get elsewhere or should I bother reading this at all? I'm not just talking about the print product here, uh, also online. No, I think that's right. Um, but there, there have also been, as you're aware, and, I, and I, I don't want to drift into the Australian context here, but you're well aware of highly publicized bad behavior by newspapers, particularly in Fleet Street, uh, which have done a lot, I think, to undermine the reputation of journalism. Um, this is only, uh, this was only been reported in certain uh, uh, outlets, but I actually worked for the Times and the Sunday Times in London as well, and I was well aware of uh, phone tapping going on, of paying, paying police informers, and so on and so forth. So some of this uh, reputational damage has actually, um, you know, in a sense, in, uh, been brought as well. Mm -hmm. I might pause and pass to my colleagues. I, I would just make a, one quick point here, which is that the trust is in part, in my view, a function of the atomized nature of contemporary journalism. We are going back to this question of audience. Audience, men, of course, can have much more power than they ever did uh, to pick and choose to support and read and, and listen and watch the media that supports their worldview. Obviously, Fox News is a, is a sterling example of that in the United States. And as, as we often discuss in Proki, so is uh, Sky News After Dark in this country. So people have an inbuilt bias towards a uh, media that reinforces their worldview. And uh, it seemed to me to be less likely to wish to be challenged, uh, which was, a, let's face it, a traditional function of uh, news journalism. So both the audience and the journalism has changed. And again, I think this is, therein lies a positive thing insofar as we can have better, we should have better relationships with our audiences. Mm. If we don't, it's, our, it's partly it's our fault. Uh, I agree, you know, we do have a problem with trust in journalism. It pains me, as Andrew very well put it, you know, it's a private grief in many ways. Um, it pains me that we're, the trust is uh, diminishing, but we, we do have capacity to do something about that. And perhaps this, again, is where a better funding models, better business models can come to play. And, and I'm, I, want, I don't want to leave that, but I just, because it, that to me is the linchpin here. If we are to talk about the issue of public support for public interest journalism, and I'll, I'll come to the definition of all of that, then there seems to me a critical issue around the, the matter of media standards. Yes. There's a critical yeah. issue about how we get complaints mechanism in place, given that the press council is so grossly inadequate, and given the range of evidence that we've had before us, and the question of regulation, and the fact that we don't want to see government uh, providing uh, 
advice on what is good journalism, what is bad journalism. I think we'd all agree with that proposition. I mean, certainly in this committee, that's the impression that I'm left with. So I'd ask you, what role do we, or what, what mechanism do we have to ensure proper media standards, journalistic ethics and journalistic quality if we are to talk about the issue of public uh, investment, public support for public interest journalism? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think the first issue is that um, reputable news organisations should have an editorial charter mm -hmm. uh, that's signed off by owners and uh, editors. Uh, that should reflect probably the code of ethics as outlined by uh, the MEAA and also the Press Council. Um, I think they're kind of um, prerequisites. Mm -hmm. There's an argument that, you know, I, I was reading a piece today that in America, the demise of the ombudsman and woman within organisations, that that used to be quite an integral part of newsrooms in America, uh, and they've disappeared. And perhaps there's an argument to bring them back mm -hmm. so that readers have a representative within organisations mm -hmm. to go to and you go, hey, you know what, this wasn't good or this wasn't right. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's an expectation that government could have. If they're going to be doling out dollars, mm -hmm. then the quid pro quo is that there needs to be someone within your organisation who will listen and act on reader feedback and, re and requests and complaints. Because at the moment, so many organisations are just sort of islands that refuse to interact with their readers, apart from unidentified comments that are usually more intemperate than yeah. what you hear at a football match. Yeah. <laughs> well, can I come to this issue? I mean, I've, I mean, I'm a big consumer of media, like all politicians, you know, professional politicians, so we read everything we can get our hands on. And frankly, many independent publications are just as biased, just as ignorant, and the peddlers of untruth as you know, you're, you're alleging occurs in, in other mm -hmm. uh, mainstream mastheads. Um, and I'd say that applies to crikey. That applies, uh, you know, in, in many, many of these so-called bodies that just peddle out uh, neoliberal rubbish about the nature of the economy, for instance. Um, so how do we actually get some sort of definitions here that will provide some real protections in terms of what is public interest journalism and allow for that, nonetheless, diversity of opinion? Well, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Senator, and I'll maybe over a, a cup of tea sometime we can talk at length about crikey, but... Um, yeah, I bet uh, we will. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Enjoy that. Uh, <laughs> Especially on the auto industry. Yeah, have a great time. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I could say that was before my time, but I'll, I yeah, won't say yeah, that. Yeah. Um, That's what we had I, one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. What auto industry? Um, I think it's important to make a distinction between what we call reporting and what we call opinion. Mm. And and uh, again, uh, this the world we live in, social media world we live in, rewards opinion because opinion outrages people and people share mm. things that they are outraged, outraged by. Mm. Um, uh, that is a fact of the world we live in. I think it's very important though that we have the capacity to have a vibrant uh, opinion based you know, with the injunctions. Yep. I, I, absolutely. I'm sure you'd agree. Absolutely. Um, I think then, then I think therefore, uh, just to Bruce's point, I'm, well, we we do need to uh, have, we need to adhere to standards and those standards need to be clear and clean. And we have a very strange situation in this country where, as we all know, we live in a, a multi-platform universe where you know, previous print publishers are now running TV stations and streaming and all the things that go with it. That we living in a sort of wherever you can find audience, put your content. And yet we still regulate the industry with different bodies, the Press Council and ACMA, various things like that. It seems to me that we should have one uh, standard to, to fit them all, that that should be tied to, if we're going to get funding from the, uh, from the taxpayer, that should be uh, tied to standards. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I certainly wouldn't say, well, just I... To, I must confess, just to say that, uh, yes, I agree. One of the things that journalism has never been good at is admitting it's wrong. Mm. And there needs to be uh, somehow, I think there's a, there is a moment for the industry to look at itself and say, we actually stand to benefit if we are more upfront when we are wrong. Mm -hmm. Can I, may I just add, uh, Carl, if you don't mind, um, 
There's, there's two quick points I want to make. The first is that um, I, I again support what Bruce said about uh, uh, an editorial charter, which needs to be clearly there. But um, in the 21st century, there's some new uh, developments which I think we should look at. One of them is called the Trust Project, run by Santa Clara University, which has actually uh, documented 10 key points which need to be demonstrated before a website or a service is determined to have a tick as a, as a trusted outlet. Uh, I think that deserves looking at. Um, and on the flip side, I also encourage uh, investment or support for media literacy uh, uh, education, both for the general public, but also particularly in schools. Now, this media literacy needs to include an understanding of the importance of provenance of information which means where does this information comes from, come from, who pays for it, um, how, it how it's funded, if there are any uh, conflict of interest, and also if it does have a corrections policy, uh, for example, and an editorial charter. Yeah. So uh, I think these are terribly important on the supply side, on the demand side, as, a, as opposed to just the supply side. Well, can I turn then to the issue of public uh, funding? Now, Mr. Jasper, you have proposed, and you have this the supplementary submission which we've just received, Independent Future Fund for Journalism. Uh, for the Hansard record, uh, it would probably benefit if we could get some explanation of what you're proposing. But specifically, are you proposing a broad based digital services or digital advertising tax along the lines that's supported uh, by Malcolm Turnbull? Um, Broadly, yes. My, my issue is this, that uh, in much the same way as my two colleagues have said previously, we do not think that an intervention into the market in terms of breaking up media, media uh, conglomerates is necessarily the best way forward. What we're really interested in is how do we find a mechanism which will allow new voices to enter into the market, but particularly to address areas of market failure. And you again have picked up on the Senator Carr, uh, the police rounds, the courts, the, the regional coverage, and, and so on and so forth. The areas that the market can't support. Also, to Bruce's earlier point, these are areas which are not clickbait per se, and they don't attract large audiences. So what we're talking about is serving the public interest, making sure that the lights stay on in certain town halls, or at the very least, that, the, that, the, that those charged with a watchdog role can do their role. In terms of how we do it, um, what I have put forward in that proposal, which, as I say, was at the invitation of the ACCC, was to, um, to utilise something like a levy of 10% on the overall revenues of Google and Facebook. And when I wrote that, it was in the order of $6 billion. So what we're saying is we're not going to intervene in the uh, ability for Google and Facebook to operate in Australia. What we are saying is you are taking super profits out of Australia, which are being billed through low tax havens in Singapore and Ireland. What we're saying is you're still making a lot of money. We're going to clip 10%. You can retain the night you still have. But that 10% is equivalent to around 600 million a year, which goes into a fund. And that fund will be properly conceived to have editorial charters and, and, and other controls to ensure that it's used adequately to address areas of market failure. I see. So this is in addition to the agreements struck with individual publishers or to replace them? In addition. I see. Actually, that'll go down well. Uh, Mr Guthrie and... and Mr. Frey, if you could um, perhaps assist the committee in terms of providing us with some advice as to uh, other propositions that are about in terms of providing funding. I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the use of the taxation system. Mm -hmm. The public interest journalism initiative has been proposed, which is an adaption of the existing R&D tax incentive. Uh, I, I, I presume you're familiar with that uh, proposal. Um, and, and, and it can be it can have provide uh, administrative structures through the ATO, same as the R&D tax concession. It can set down specific criteria in terms of what's justified as or what's defined as public interest journalism, and of course can be regulated to stop rorting. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any view about that operation. Is that a useful tool 
uh, to actually facilitate additional investment? Well, I think um, on the R&D, I think the New Daily has actually benefited from that in the past. I think we, when we did a big tech upgrade, we were given a grant, yeah. and that was very helpful. I think it was about $100,000. Yeah. So any extension, that would be welcome. The, the, the point here is there's one set of initiatives you could take for the whole market, and I, can, I know that News Corp, I think, is uh, suggesting that um, subscriptions be tax deductible. Uh, which is great if you've got a paywall, uh, but startups don't have paywalls. Yeah. Startups don't have subscribers. So I'm not sure the benefit there. I'm concentrating particularly on initiatives that might assist new entrants rather than existing entrants. Yeah. And there are things like, um, you know, the New Daily is now seven years old, uh, and our, we're probably over the worst now, you know. We're, and we, but we could have definitely used some government advertising, say. Yes. I mean, the government advertises tens of millions mm -hmm. of dollars a year. Federal's probably 100 million and state's probably that again. And we see none of it. And a government could even just mandate more, that... Even, even more in the 12 months before an election, I'd suggest. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, but Good point. See, that's an additional measure on top of to support through the taxation system. So you're saying grants? Yes. You're saying um, advertising procurement? Yes. Uh, government procurement. Mm -hmm. You're saying uh, the taxation system, and you're also saying direct subsidies, as I understood your initial comment, for journalism employment. Yeah, I mean, the fund is one idea that could be, it could be based on R&D, the principles that now exist. The idea I put up was uh, specifically for a startup. So let's say in the first three years, if they want to put on 10 journalists and that costs, let's say $750,000, they would be able to go to the fund and they would get half of that from the fund. Mm -hmm. And that would allow them to put on the 10 journalists. Mm -hmm. um, they might, there would be probably guidelines on what sort of journalism they might be required to do. So you couldn't put them on, you know, um, repackaging um, social media stories. No, no, but, no. But yeah, you, yeah. That's right. you set the criteria. Yep. Uh, yes, but is there anything necessarily wrong with providing industry-wide measures, even if they are for established companies? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, I would prefer, for instance, the media bargaining code is somewhat of a lost opportunity. I mean, there's probably $150 million that will now come out of that fund, and probably all but $10 million will go to News Corp, Nine, Seven West, you yeah. know. Um, it's the same people all the time. Yeah. And I guess what I'm labouring with is how do you, by all means, do that? Great, get them to the bargaining table, get some dough out of them. But what about startups and small size mm -hmm. publishers who are just being left behind all the time? Mm -hmm. And if we're going to get new voices, mm -hmm. we've got to give them more of a leg up. Mm -hmm. And so, and the tax system is complicated, isn't it? I mean, oh yeah. You know, you take you, you tweak it. My, my accountant says any tweak is going to drive him crazy. So I've tried he gets to zero. Paid for that, though. I'll pay for that. Yeah. Uh, when I rang him and yeah. said, "I'm doing this. Can yeah. you help me?" Yeah. I'm sure I'll get a bill. Yeah. But um, you know, I, I think I'm trying to find ways that don't necessarily involve the tax system. Uh, AAP must be supported because News Limited will knock them off. Um, is there a fund? Yes, hopefully. ABC, make their content available. Why, why is the ABC content not available to startups and medium-sized publishers? Because if you have ABC content, you then have news content and people will come back to your site every day. Can and I, that builds traffic. Can I ask you to expand on that? Um, this is where you, you talked about a kind of a, yes, a, a, a commons uh, yes. content platform or yes. something from ABC. Could you... Could you unpack that a little bit? For yeah, us? I mean, Andrew will speak very well on this because one of his initiatives at the conversation was to embrace Creative Commons. Mm. So, um, where you can republish material on the conversation, providing you abide by their editorial standards. So, you can't change the copy, you can't change headlines, which is exactly the arrangement we had with the ABC, but we had to pay them $70,000 a year. Mm. And they've now cut that off. I don't understand why that shouldn't be available to all Australian publishers. Why not? Mm. Uh, and certainly medium-sized publishers and small publishers would kill for it. 
Perhaps Andrew could expand on the Creative Commons. And Mr. Fry, I want to hear from you on innovation as well, given your invitation earlier in the yeah. year today. Yeah. I don't know where we might have lost Andrew. I don't know. Um, well, well, no, I am here. Sorry, I am here. Um, yes, just very quickly, uh, Creative Commons is uh, a, a wonderful way of uh, sharing your content at no cost to uh, the end user. The key point here is that the ABC produces content and, of course, the ABC is funded by the taxpayer. Um, that content should be available to all, and it is. You can go to any ABC website and, and, and view it or read it uh, online. I think what um, Bruce is uh, much like a, a newswire service from AAP, becomes fully available to all outlets across Australia as a newswire, as it were, uh, which would be a tremendous resource. Uh, in the case of the conversation, um, one of the reasons we ensured that the content was free was that the conversation is authored by academics who are paid for by universities and therefore re the universities receive a public subsidy, as it were, through support from the Department of Education. And that knowledge and that research should be made widely available, which is why we chose to publish everything under a license called Creative Commons, which allows anybody to use it for free and to access it for free as well. On the basis that, you know, we, we believe that information should flow Okay. We've just lost you. I, I think he's done for now. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, just on this innovation point, I just wanted to make, uh, so I was invited or appointed by uh, Minister Fletcher to be part of the advisory on the first round of those in rural innovation grants, rural innovation and, uh, sorry, rural and uh, small publishers, I think was the title. I think the issue uh, at, that uh, bamboozled the committee a little bit, the advisory, was the understanding in the news media industry, especially in regional areas, but not only in regional areas, of what actually is innovation. And so I would bring this point up because if we are really going to support the news media industry, and in particular in the bush, but not only, I think there's lots of places that need it, um, we do probably not wish to restrict it to a word like innovation, or we need to be very, very clear uh, about what innovation actually is. For a lot of these smaller regional publishers in particular, but smaller in, in, in our cities as well, it really is about keeping the lights on, keep doing public interest journalism. It's got nothing much to do with innovation. Uh, I, I want nothing more that have an innovative news media sector but I want, have, I want actually having a news media sector before I want that. So I just think we need to be careful if we're going to link any form of tax incentive or any form of government assistance solely to innovation. Okay. Have you got That's any other questions, Senator Khan? Oh, no, I think David's looked at a question, hasn't he? David, I mean, Senator Fawcett. Yeah, thank you. Chair, gentlemen, thank you for your submission and your evidence. Sorry I wasn't here for your opening statements. Um, in your submission, the last stop point on your ideas, uh, you talk about fostering small micro-media startups, particularly in regional markets. Um, we've had other evidence, particularly from broadcasters, uh, arguing that concentration is actually the only way you'll get the scale required to remain viable in regional markets. Mm -hmm. Are you predominantly looking there at print media, whether that be paper or online, or are you yeah. suggesting that micro is also an option in broadcast, whether that be radio or television? Yeah, well, can I just take that first? Um, I, I, they would say that, wouldn't they? And I, you know, I respect their right to say it. What I think, well, just to the point of the audience, audiences are pretty savvy these days. Audience uh, understand they can get their news media content from all sorts of places. We shouldn't be hamstrung by what form that content is in because people are totally au fait and willing to accept news in all sorts of forms, audio, video, whatever, graphics, what have you. So I think we have outdated ideas if we think we should only support one sector over another. Um, in relation to microsites, there are great examples around the country uh, I would refer to, say, um, the Terrier in Warrnambool, for instance, 
uh, where the journalists there, a one person, one woman show, has created an audience that support her, her style of great investigative journalism, it, it, you know, which essentially is distributed through Facebook um, and on a website. So yes, I think it's quite possible to have these micro audiences, micro sites, and they do add to the local ecosystem, uh, much, you know, as well as, and I'm not suggesting we knock off win or prime or anything, but I'm just saying we can have it all if we're smart about it. Any other comments on, on that question? Well, Senator, um, I would just say that we've had the days where two or three publishers each employ two, three hundred journalists. And those days are gone. And uh, in many ways, rather than have a couple of employees employing 500 journalists, I think we should be striving to have 50 organisations employing 10 journalists. I think maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe we still have the the major publishers, but we've got to do more to have smaller publishers employing small groups of journalists and perhaps all being good at one or two things. Uh, we've got to get more voices into the landscape. With the other dot points, some of which Senator Carr covered off in his questioning, have you done any modelling uh, to look at you know, particular states, regional sectors, etc., to to understand what kind of, of tax relief or you know, incentivisation for philanthropic investment. You know, you've got a number of options there. Are they thought bubbles at this point in time or have you actually done some serious modelling that would demonstrate uh, the ability to, to sustain given sectors or diversity in given regions, for example? I would refer to the work of PIGI, the Public Interest Journalism Initiative. They've done some good work in, in particularly around tax tax systems. Uh, there's been some academic work done by uh, a mob I used to be associated with, the Centre for Media Transition, and others. Um, I think you're. I think there's could be more more specific modelling. It would be a, a great project, for instance, for the Parliamentary Library. Mm -hmm. Right <laughs> Mr. Guthrie, do you have anything to add and to that? My, oh. my final. Sorry, my final Senator Fawcett, continue. My, my final question, perhaps uh, you've suggested the idea of the ABC making its product available for free for publishers around the country to use. Uh, is the inverse also something that would be attractive to uh, regional or small publishers and journalists that? if you like, the quid quo pro is that a journalist who might be operating in a small country town gets his or her content published via the ABC. Look, I, I think that's not a bad idea, actually. I think that it would come down to individual publishers, but certainly if a regional publisher suddenly had a national audience, that would do fantastic things for their traffic. But I think it would come down to individual publishers, Senator. And Senator, uh, you, you missed it, but in our opening remarks, I've made the a reference to the BBC's local news partnerships, uh, uh, which is a, potentially a model by which uh, the BBC reporters and a local external news provider work together on projects, uh, say, for instance, covering courts and what have you. So, yes, I do think there's great potential for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Jens. Okay. Well, thank, thank you to all three of you for appearing today and your submission and the uh, various other bits and pieces that you've um, given us uh, supplementary wires. Um, thank you. If there's any questions that you were asked to take on notice, just be in touch with the Secretariat. We've still got a way to go with this inquiry. So if there are things that, um, based on this conversation or others that we've had with other witnesses that you think is worth feeding into us uh, follow up please don't hesitate um, we do intend on having um, this isn't we do want to put solutions uh, forward and that's that's the main focus of uh, of what I want to see out of this so thank you, thank you. Thank you. all right thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes today's proceedings. I would like to thank all of the witnesses who have given evidence today, as well as the Hansard Broadcast and the Secretariat. Um, we will be uh, continuing, as I said, uh, this inquiry and uh, we'll let you know in due course of the next hearing. Thank you.